to the students of Lamarck School. We're very glad to have you here today. Today is Tuesday, November 14th, 2023. It is 10 a.m. We are in city chambers, and I call the city commission regular meeting to order. Commissioners present are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner Stokes, myself, Mayor Langdon, Vice Mayor White, and Commissioner Emmerich. There is a quorum present for this meeting. I'm going to call on our birthday girl, a city attorney, to lead us in the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> I'm looking for a motion to approve today's agenda. So moved. We have a motion on the floor to approve today's agenda. Our motion maker is Commissioner Stokes, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote, please. And that motion passes 5 to 0. City Clerk, do we have any general online public comment for this meeting? Yes, we do. Sid Scott, I support resolution 2020. 2023-R-52. Ryan Campbell. What is that? Someone online? Okay, let's just proceed and hope for the best. Oops. Sherry Kremen, I support the Pocatello property special exception for the multifamily apartments. I have been a resident of Northport since 1998 and work as a realtor for Codwell Banker Sunstar Realty. This is a new proposal that will allow luxury apartments along the Sumter Boulevard corridor to better fill the needs of our growing community. I feel there is a need for better housing for professionals within the city. With the pending hospital site at Sumter Boulevard and I-75, the downtown area needs temporary homes for doctors, techs, and nurses, as well as business owners in the area. Many newcomers look for a rental property for the first year or so to get acclimated to the area and their jobs before buying a home. However, I hesitate to recommend any of the existing rental housings that exist today in Northport, as most are geared towards middle or low-income tenants. Without projects like the Pocatello property, we will not be able to attract the type of tenants needed for these professional positions. They more likely will live in better areas of Sarasota, Lakewood Ranch, or Venice and commute to Northport. I work, live, and play in Northport and would like to see it grow in a positive direction. Ernest Campbell, I support Resolution 2023-R-52. Armine Miranda, before you today is a public hearing item on rezoning and two general business items regarding the Camoin Market Feasibility Study and the moratorium on the Live Local Act. If the Economic Development Market Feasibility Study 23-1540 were to be discussed first, I think it would provide insight and direction in growing the commercial tax base and bringing skilled jobs. It would help all of us understand the cons of the public hearing item 2023-R-52 to rezone OPI to high density multifamily and the negative effects of the Live Local Act on our city, its ability to increase the commercial non-residential tax base. I applaud city leadership for coming together to have the tough discussions to figure out what actions can be taken to place a moratorium on the Live Local Act to prevent a land grab of precious non-residential land in our city. I also want to stress my displeasure with developers who come forward with projects that only serve their interests and not the interests of the residents of Northport. We need commercial, light industrial, and business that brings skilled jobs. We have limited land designated for non-residential development. Stop coming forward with special <coughs> exemptions to rezone non-residential to high-density residential. When I read about Innovation Corridor and the vision for a business park containing light industrial and a potential to bring 2,000 jobs to the area, it gives the appearance we are on the right track. Then you realize that there are over 6,000 residential units included. Having 6,000 new residential units adds to the tax burden for all Northport residents. We have to pick up the delta between the cost of the city services and the property taxes that do not cover the full cost. 
between the rise in insurance rate, the FPL tax, and overall inflation, the residents are asking for some relief. Let's focus on protecting non-residential land when the public hearing items come up later in the agenda. Thank you. And that's all for online. Thank you. In-house? Yes. Emma Lasker, followed by DJ Perez, Ethan Silva, Evelina Didia. If you could come up and get ready to um, speak. While we're waiting for the speakers to come up, we have a lot of folks here today. Um, and I'd just like to remind everyone that public speakers have up to three minutes each to speak. We request that you be polite and refrain from any obscenities or, or personal attacks on anyone here at the meeting today. As a practice, commissioners do not answer questions when they come from a public commenter. Um, what I may do as mayor is if the question or the issue is something that I think staff <coughs> might be able to address with that person, I'll ask city manager to have the appropriate staff member meet with that person. Um, for those of you who are in the audience today just to watch the proceedings, um, I, I want to ask that you refrain from clapping or jeering or making any noises. Many residents watch this meeting from their homes. We broadcast live. We also record the meeting and put it up on YouTube for people who might want to watch the meeting at a time that is more convenient for them. When there's noise um, in chambers, they cannot hear the proceedings. So um, I ask everyone to be respectful, keeping that in mind. So without further ado, let's go. Oh. A little huddle happening before our first speaker. Okay. Okay, we'll start with our first public commenter. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, I'm Emma Lasker, a fifth grader from Lamarck Elementary. I would like to help solve the problem of not having enough playgrounds for people with disabilities. One way we can solve this problem is by adding equipment for people with special needs to existing playgrounds. For example, we can add ramps, wheelchair platform swing sets, sensory toys, and rubber pathways to the equipment. Two good reasons to do this are, it would be much easier to play with others without having to struggle, and it would only cost about $65,000. According to Zeeker.com, with a unique design and equipment that strays from the typical, your playground may attract more children and be far more enjoyable for everyone. One last equally important reason is, if you decide to build a playground that reaches the needs of all people, they would be happy and feel like they fit in. This means kids would play with others without being bullied by another person. According to StopBullying.gov, bullying can affect everyone. Bullying is linked to many negative outcomes, including impacts on mental health, substance use, and suicide. One good reason to do this, one good reason to do this is kids won't feel like they need to stress or be concerned about going places without a person by their side, for example, at school or at playgrounds. To sum it up, by adding to and building playgrounds that fit the needs of all people will help make a better and safer way to play. I hope this speech will tug at your heartstrings and make you feel it, make you feel the need to make this happen. I love living in Northport, but I thought this would make Northport even better. Thank you. DJ Perez, Ethan Silva, and Evelina Didick. Greetings. We're students from Lamarck, and we would like to solve the problem of littering. Our names are DJ, Ethan, and Evelina. We do not want our community to look, to look trashy. Lots of garbage causes way too much pollution, and it harms thousands of living things. Another reason on why littering should stop is we could be the first jurisdiction ever to be truly litter-free. Without litter, there would be less health issues for humans. Another reason is why they're going to stop is we'd save millions of dollars. Secondly, is we could be the we could clean up and disposal cost. To solve the problem of littering, our community shall pay one dollar per pound of litter you pick up. Our community can make it a one five hundred dollar fine if you get caught littering twice. It shall be five hundred five hundred hours of community service. Another reason is if our communities is clean, crime is lower in areas. That, that are cleaned and well-maintained. If we could get littering to stop, our environment would not be endangered. 
but it also harms the environment and wildlife. Trash can end up in our rivers and forests, polluting the water and endangering animals. Plus, it takes a long time for litter to decompose, so it sticks around for a while. We can play our part by help keeping our community clean and beautiful. Lastly, littering can have a negative impact on human health. When trash is left lying around, it can spread diseases. Additionally, littered areas can become harmful substances, posing a risk to our well-being. By keeping our environment clean, we can create safer and, every and healthier communities for everyone. In conclusion, our community has many problems and we, should, and we would like to help solve because we believe our community should get better. That's why we chose to stop littering. Jackson Watkins, Nolan Smith, and Jaden Thomas. Hello, I am Nolan, and these are my partners, Jackson and Jaden. We would like to, we are students from Ms. Schaefer's fifth grade class. We would like to state the problem that bike lanes are not reinforced at all, and many people die each year from careless drivers. If we fix this problem, it will save many people's lives and help Northport be a better place. Reinforcing bike lanes means putting barriers around the bike lane, which keeps the bikers safe from any careless drivers. Also, we would put something on the barriers to protect the cars so they do not hurt the people inside the car. If we do this, fewer people get hurt. Bike lanes can help a lot in Florida because people wouldn't get hurt and reinforcement could be a big pro for less accidents. In Northport, many streets do not have bike lanes. Because of this, many people die. More reinforced bike lanes leads to a better community. That means North Pole will be a better place for everyone. In addition, peoplepoweredmovement.org states that Florida had 5,952 bicycle collisions in 2021. These crashes caused 5,574 injuries and 169 deaths. Most bike lane deaths happen because of cars. If we have more reinforcement on bike lanes, the 5,574 injuries and 169 deaths will decrease. Then many people will come to Northport and Northport will make more money. With all that extra money, we can keep going on making Northport a better community. In conclusion, this shows how reinforcing the bike lanes will be safer for everyone. If this happens, more people will want to move to Northport. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Vera Cardinal. Hello, my name is Vera Celestine Cardinali, and I am from Lamarck Elementary, and I am proposing the idea of a children's museum to better the city of Northport. We should have this museum because it will not only help our city, but also the young visitors. A location like a children's museum will lead to kids performing critical thinking skills, exploring and interacting with plants and animals, learning history, and so much more. Other children's museums and interactive museums have interesting gadgets, electricity, Annual interactions, interactive gardens, reading, and play areas. These museums also have separate sections for different subjects, such as minerals, plants, space animals, extinct animals, and reading and math areas. Furthermore, a museum will, would help our out schools like Lamarck Elementary. A museum would help science teachers because kids would also be able to learn science outside of school. A museum would also create a fun location for learning field trips. As you have heard, a museum would benefit schools, teachers, and most of all children. So to make a profit, we must charge entry. A fair price might be $15 for an adult and $8 for a child over the age of one. Infants being free. Of course, a little detail that might be obtained is a cafeteria and a gift shop. So a lot of profit will come from people stopping in for lunch and getting a souvenir while they are on their engaging journey through the Northport Children's Museum. The cafeteria would fuel the visitors to keep on learning and the souvenirs would remind them of their learning experience and make them want to return. If we continue with the idea of a children's museum, children will be able to get out of the house, engage in playfulness, interact, learn, and meet fellow youngsters. In summary, I think a children's museum will help children in our time. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Jeffrey Kamar, Jasmine Leonard, and Orlando Torres. <coughs> Uh, 
Hello, I'm Jasmine, and I'm in a group with Jeffrey, Orlando, and Nicholas. Are you ready to make Norfolk an even better place to live? We all know that having more small businesses in our city would be amazing. Right now, we do not have enough job opportunities, and that is why we are here today. Building more, building more small businesses is an excellent idea, and here are the reasons more should be built. We can make Norfolk better by creating more room for new small businesses. This will give us more... This will give us more places to shop, eat, and more, and create new job opportunities. There are a few things we will need to think about still. First, expanding our city will cost money. We will need to buy land and build new places for small businesses, meaning if we decide if it's worth the investment. Second, we will need to find skilled workers for these new small businesses. It might take some time, but with planning, we can make it happen. Another way to solve the problem of not enough small businesses is by doing fundraisers. These events help us raise money to build new small businesses. Fundraisers are joyous because they, because they help the community come together to support a great cause. The best part of fundraisers is that they bring our community together. More small businesses mean more jobs and money for our city. Not everyone will want to participate in the fundraisers. Some people might not be interested or have other plans going on, meaning we need to find ways to encourage everyone to get involved. Ending off these two great ideas to make Northport a better place are guaranteed to make more people come to Northport's new small businesses. By creating more room for small businesses or organizing fundraisers, we can have more places to shop, eat, and more, and bring more money to our city. It is important to think about the costs and challenges that come with each idea, but with teamwork and planning, we can overcome them. Let's make Northport small businesses even better and enjoy a more exciting experience. Thank you, guys. Some good ideas there, Vinny. Erin Jardez, Jalen Biggers, Madison Loudy, and Emma Cleveland. We have a super exciting idea that would make Northport an even more enjoyable place to live. We believe it's time we brought a bowling alley to our community. Bowling is a popular and fun activity bringing smiles to people of all ages. By having a bowling alley in Northport, we create a fantastic venue with laughter everywhere, friendly competitions, and quality time with family and friends. Currently, there's no bowling alleys here. We can fill this empty space by building one, providing a new and exciting activity for everyone to enjoy. To make this happen, we have two ideas. First, we can team up with a company called Bowler Corporation. They know a ton about bowling alleys and can be our guides on this incredible journey. They've built amazing bowling alleys in many other places, so they have the right knowledge to help us. With their help, we can make sure we can get the right advice and make sure everything is as perfect as a strike. They can also help us find sponsors, meaning we can get some financial support for a bowling alley. Planning everything carefully before we start is another key. We can explore various locations in Northport searching for the best spot for a bowling alley, like a hidden gem waiting to be discovered. It must stay under pressure so we can stay organized and take the right steps. So we would have a budget, you can still have things such as AC. Having AC will attract customers. Once you get customers, people will have their birthdays there and you can have other things like an arcade. There are so many amazing benefits to building a bowling alley in Northport. First, it will give people a fun and safe place to go and have a blast. Families and friends can come together and enjoy a game of bowling, building bonds and strong relationships. It will also boost our city's economy because people from other areas might come to visit our bowling alley, bringing more money for local businesses, also creating jobs for people in our community, like a magical opportunity for growth. To make this happen, we need to follow a schedule. First, we should reach out to Bowler Corporation and see if they can be our partners in this grand adventure. Then, we can spend a reasonable amount of time exploring and finding the absolute best location. After that, we need to make a budget. Once we have everything ready, we can start building our bowling alley. Before you know it, in about a year or two, we'll be able to open it and celebrate our new place for fun and entertainment. Several people must travel up to two hours just to get to a bowling alley. I know it's not just us who want to wait hours just to get to a bowling alley. That's why building a bowling alley here is superior. We truly hope you will consider our reasoning for building a bowling alley in Northport. It would be an excellent addition to our community, providing a fun activity for everyone to enjoy and would bring happiness to our local economy. 
We have a firm belief that by working together, we can make this dream come true and create something extraordinary for our city. Thank you for your time and consideration. Adeline French and Alexandra Vowell. Good morning. My name is Addie, and this is my loyal companion, Allie. We are here today to share our opinion on Northport's customer service. We believe that the employees are not respecting the customers and are not taking enough time to fully solve their problems. We believe that there are many solutions to this problem. We also have done research to prove that this is a problem in our community. Our proof is in the following information. One solution to this could be to train your employees to respect the customers of residents more. The, pro the pros of this outcome are that the customers will be respectful back to the employees as a result of being respectful to them and that the customers will come back. The cons of this solution are that training could be costly and time consuming. Another solution to this problem is to take more time for the customers and help attend to them before they get upset. The pros to the solution are residents will feel respected and people will come back to Northport and customers will respect you. The cons of the solution are other customers may become impatient and things will go slower. As you may see, the pros outweigh the cons, which show that this may be a successful solution. For the penultimate paragraph of our proposal, I will share my research. First, a paraprofessional at Omarco Elementary said that City Hall gave her mother a tough time for fence repairs after Hurricane Ian, even though the rest of the street they lived on were getting repairs. Next, Ellie's stepmother had a tough time when trying to get the city to build them a shed. They would not do it because they own the land, but they did not. Now, this may sound like an adverse possession, but the land they planned to build on was part of their backyard. Finally, my mom, Nikki Tilton, had some problems with getting a refund when she pulled me from summer camp. She issued it to the city, and they simply said exactly what the summer camp's owner said. It's too late for a refund. In conclusion, there are many ways to solve the dilemma of people getting bad customer service. You can train your employees and take more time on the customers. Northport could be a united place if these things are insured. Thank, thank you, you for, for your time. time. Thank you. I, I want to thank the <coughs> teachers at Lamarck School for getting your kids involved in the process and really creative ideas. I'm, I'm really impressed. They came up with their own ideas. It's great. Their own. That's thank great. You thank us. you. Mark Franson, followed by Jody Vaughn. First off, I have to say this isn't fair. <laughs> having this fat old man following all them kids. But I have one thing I would like to bring up, and I take it very serious. Recently, there was a ruling by Judge Brewer in regard, Brewer, excuse me, in regards to Welland Park. Uh, I don't know if they have filed an appeal as of yet. I think they have. Okay. Uh, that appeal process should probably go through relatively quickly uh, through the court system. And I'm asking our city commission our city uh, attorney, to sit down and really look at suing the group for our legal uh, costs. I have no idea what we have spent totally. I'm sure it's in, well in excess of $100,000 in legal fees. And I think that we, as the people of Northport, are deservant of, re of having that money returned to us. That's all. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners and Mayor Langdon, Vice Mayor, and our city staff. I appreciate you guys letting us come and talk again. I, I still um, have some concerns. I'm Jody Vaughn. I'm a resident here in Northport. I live here, I work here, I shop here. Pretty much if I don't need it here in Northport, I'm not driving to Sarasota, it's probably Port Charlotte. So I understand um, the growth that we need in our community. However, I have a small uh, request for consideration. So um, I was here on, on September 26th talking about uh, this area here that we were doing some rezoning, and I know that some considerations have been made. So the purple mixed-use section has been 
um, not what I was speaking about, but I know that there has been some concessions with making changes. So the area that was kind of rezoned for mixed use, residential high, residential medium, um, it has now been proposed to be activity center 10, which is kind of like a blanket of options for those areas, which could be, could be good for the community. However, I'm still concerned, as you guys have the little printout here, the area that I have here circled in the red is this section. There are many homes that are built here. I have land. I'm a small business owner. I have a cottage business. I would love to be able to have my house that I've I purchased the property in 2020 with my husband. We did our due diligence. We made sure and looked for three years. We looked in other properties, and we decided this is the area we want to buy in. We have an acre and a half. I'm from the Midwest. I enjoy having a little bit of elbow room. I don't plan on taking all the trees down. I want to build my forever home there. I would like to have an option to put a small commercial business on that acre and a half if it ever comes down the pike for that. That would be awesome. I have a bakery business. I want to do that. I work for the school system. Mm -hmm. I know that we um, talked not too long ago and through my text through the radio station. I, I'm trying to help my students. I understand we need some commercial property. However, this section here has many homes, and then there's a lot of homes that are already been allowed in activity centers. So here's my plea. It concerns me as a landowner that we did our due diligence and we bought our property and now that property is being taken away from me and my option to build my home on that property. I look at other areas and I've, I think I've mentioned this to another um, commissioner at one time. I enjoy having Mullen Park, but that's a large section and I don't understand why Welland Park isn't also being considered in part of this rezone kind of is a little offensive to me as a property and a citizen here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, city Mayor. clerk. Um, moving on to, uh, go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank the teachers and the students. I know this is kind of abnormal, but it's not very often we get students to come in and make public comment. I want to acknowledge their courage to stand up in front of everybody, especially a packed house, and make your public comment, give your ideas and your suggestions and your solutions and how this could be beneficial in our city. Um, you are to be applauded. Um, you are our future. And thank you very much for coming today. And thank you to the teachers and to the city clerk for getting this organized. Look forward to seeing you again. Moving on to announcements, item number 23-0448. Uh, City Clerk, would you read our announcements, please? The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Selection Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Environmental Advisory Board, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Veterans Park Advisory Committee, and Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees, Joint Management Advisory Board, Sarasota County Advisory Council vacancies, one Northport resident to serve on the Citizen Advisory Committee, Citizen Oversight Committee for School Facility Planning. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Moving on to the consent agenda. City Manager, have any items been pulled for discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor, two items. Item 4D, which is 23-1473. And 4M and then Mary, 23-1559. Okay. And that was M23-1559. Yes, okay, thank you for that. Do we have any public comments on the consent agenda, City Clerk? Then yeah. I'm looking for a motion. Um, Go ahead, Commissioner Emmerich. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. We have a motion on the floor to approve 
The items in the consent agenda with items D and M being pulled for discussion. Our motion maker is Commissioner Emmerich, seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Um, City Manager Who, oh, let's vote. Yes, thank you. And that motion passes five to zero. A city manager, who pulled item D? Commissioner McDowell. Commissioner, would you like to speak to that item? Yes, Mayor. Um, I sent a list of questions. Um, I believe you all received a copy of the answers, but one question was um, overlooked for some reason. Um, in the past, we were told that these AMRs were failing prematurely. Um, and I appreciate learning what their useful life is. But the question that was omitted was how many were required to be replaced prior to their end of useful life because they failed prematurely? <clears throat> what do we have a ratio or something? <clears throat> Mike Vullo, Assistant Utilities Director. Um, currently, there's a 10 year lifespan for a full replacement warranty. Roughly about 40% of those meters fail prior to the tenure. So we do get the registers and we get the warranty on it, but it is creating more work, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we have in the budget for an AMI system, for an upgraded system. And the biggest part of the AMI system that we're looking for is the customer portal. So the customers can uh, track their usage. They can get notifications on their usage to where we can become more proactive instead of reactive, because right now we're only reason, reading once a month. Um, so we have been working on that with finance. We're putting the scope together. That was part of our budget discussions going forward for this year was an AMI system. Excellent. Do you know, um, thank you for that answer. Do you have an idea? So we have to go through procurement. How long would it take until that AMI system is fully implemented? Fully implemented could take up to five years. Okay. And in the meantime, we have to continue to replace the AMRs? Correct. Correct. We still have to, with the new construction and even with some of the meters that are failing, we have to keep up with that because that's, you know, that's how we capture the consumption and the usage of the system. And if we don't keep up with that. So since 40% fail, and I appreciate these, this, these answers and conversations since 40% fail that that's a very high failure rate in my opinion it, it is and it's been a um, an ongoing um, process we've been working with the vendor we've actually tried three different meters uh, three different styles so this is where we were gearing up to move to the AMI better technology um, you know kind of get with the times mm -hmm. uh, FPL you can get all your information right there and uh, we should be on that same boat and Excellent. we should have the accuracy that is required as far as the the warranty period of the meter so the warranty covers the meter but the warranty does not cover the labor correct how and much time does it take to replace a meter how much how much manpower is required an hour two hours five uh, hours i would say probably an hour if you include the drive time uh, on average is there a way to recoup that from the vendor in some way has that been explored? No, we haven't explored that. I really actually, hope so. you guys would explore it. That's a lot of labor. It's very intensive. And 40%, right. that's, that's, I'm glad you're looking we're, for AMIs. We're, we're, yes. Appreciate the conversation. Would anyone care to make a motion on this item? I'll make a motion there. Go ahead, Commissioner. Make a motion to approve the um, AMR um, software and repair <laughs> maintenance as presented in the agenda. Item number 231473. Second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes to approve the sole source purchase of Neptune automatic meter read, water meters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if there's nothing more to that, let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. On to item M, 23-1559. Um, city manager, who pulled this item? Commissioner McDowell. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yes, um, the reason why I pulled this, um, 
In the past, we have sent letters of support, but they were sent from the entire commission body. And in these letters of support, it's only the mayor's signature. And since we work as a body, um, I would really like to see if my fellow commissioners would add to the signature line on behalf of the Northport City Commission, along with the mayor's signature, because we as the commission are supporting this not just the mayor supporting it. Anyone else care to weigh in on that item? I guess I would, I mean. I mean go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. Typically is, I mean, in, in a case like this, I mean, they, to me it would be implied that the mayor is speaking on behalf of the commission. I mean, I, you know. Just my personal opinion. Um, yeah, I tend to feel the same way. That is one of the roles of the mayor is to represent the entire commission. Um, I certainly have no philosophical reason for not wanting everyone to sign. Um, yeah. but, I, but I do know it's sometimes the cycle of getting us all to sign a letter can really add to the process. And I tend to be about efficiency. Um, so those are my thoughts. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I'm not asking for each of us to sign the letter. Please don't misunderstand uh -huh. my intent. I'm not asking for each of us to sign the letter. I am asking for a line to be added that says, on behalf of the Northport Commission, and then the mayor's signature. That way then it is not implied that it's only coming from the mayor. It is coming from the city of Northport commissioners with the mayor's signature because she is, or he is the mayor at the time. Thank the, you for that clarification. Um, at this point, motion? I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to approve the statements of support for the state legislative funding for the Peace River Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority um, for their water projects, adding to the signature line on behalf of the Northport City Commission, then the mayor's signature line. Do I hear a second? I'll second we have a motion on the floor to approve the statements of support for state legislative funding for Peace River, Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority projects, adding um, a signature line that states roughly um, on behalf of the Northport City Commission and list the names of the other commissioners in addition to the city manager. So if there's nothing May more, I clarify? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We don't need to list our names. If you say on behalf of the Northport City Commission with the mayor's signature line, it is showing the commission is approving these letters. I get you, I get you. So don't list the names. Exactly. Uh, would you like to repeat that back? Statements in supporting and adding to the signature line on behalf of the Northport City Commission in addition to the mayor's signature line. Great. Go right ahead. Thank you for that support. Okay, so I, again, I don't know if I repeated. The motion maker is Commissioner McDowell. The seconder was Commissioner Emmerich. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote. I'm last to the trough. And that motion passes 5 to 0. Okay, we are on to public hearings. Resolution number 2023-R-52. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. Uh, City Clerk, would you read this item by title only, please? Resolution number 2023-R-52, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, granting a special exception to allow a multifamily residential use located generally at the southeast corner of Sumter Boulevard and Pocatello Avenue, north of McKibben Drive in the Office Professional Institutional OPI Zoning District pursuant to the City of Northport Unified Land Development Code Section 53-92 and 53-259, providing for findings, providing for granting the special exception, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? 
You swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God. Thank you. Do we have any ex parte communications, Commissioner Emmerich? Yes, I did have a meeting with Dr. Buck and Mr. Dunda, which lasted about 10 minutes. Your audio, sir. Oh. Commissioner, do you mind please restating to make sure that we captured you on the record? Oh, can you hear me? No. Here we go. Mic's on. We're having a mic problem down here. Could someone from IT come and take a look? We need just need to make sure it's being recorded. Yeah. In the audience here, Tim? It doesn't sound like it. Can you all hear me out there? No. We have several down here we may want to swap out on the table on the floor. Okay, we have a hand mic. I got a hand mic. I can't even hear this. I know, but I can't hear it. Is that better in the audience? Can you hear Commissioner Emmert still no? Eat the mic. Can you hear me now? There we go. All right, for my ex parte, I did have a meeting with Dr. Butts and Mr. Dunda, which lasted about 10 minutes. They just showed me their revised plans. Um, and I did watch the PZAB meeting. So that's what I have for my ex parte. Okay, Vice Mayor. Yes, I also had a meeting with. Um, yep. I also had a meeting with uh, Mr. Dunda and uh, Mr. Butt regarding their um, application to bring this forward again. Um, yes, I, I had a, a couple of items. I also had a meeting with Mr. Butt and a couple of his representatives. I also discussed this item briefly. Um, with staff during my one-on-one. -on -one. Commissioner Stokes? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo my fellow commissioners. I also had conversation with Mr. Dundon Butts um, and discussed this during my uh, my staff briefing. Commissioner McDowell? Um, I did not have a meeting with Mr. Butts. Um, I did receive emails um, from citizens, which I provided to the city clerk for the record. I did listen to the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board meeting that was held on September 21st. I'm sorry, on the 21st and on the 5th. Uh, City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor. I'd also like to point out for the record that in today's general public comment before this item began, there was public comment related to this item. And to point out to the board that that was not part of this public hearing and should not be considered as evidence in this public hearing today. Okay, thank you for that, City Attorney. Um, City Clerk, I understand we have some aggrieved parties for this matter. Yes, John Seep, James Murphy, and Gary Thalman. Okay, um, then we'll move on to presentations. Presentations are 20 minutes each, and we will take it in the following order, applicant first, then staff, and then the aggrieved parties can come up. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Peter Van Buster with Kimley Horn and Associates. I have been sworn. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a professional engineer licensed in the state of Florida. I'm also a certified planner. Uh, with me today, I have Philip DeMaria with Kimley Horn. He's also a certified planner. And we also have with us today, Mr. Zia Butt, who is the uh, owner of the property. If you can speak up just a little bit, I'll, sir. I'll get closer to the microphone. Okay, right. thank you. <clears throat> Um, we started this process in July of 2023. We made our initial submittal. We were in front of the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board on October 4th, and now we're here today in front of the City Commission on November 14th. Um, the subject parcel is located on Sumter Boulevard 
Uh, it's at Pocatella is on the north side of the property. McKibben Drive is on the south side of the property. Uh, the property is approximately 11.7 acres, currently vacant. Um, I'd like to point out that this property has been vacant for a number of years, zoned OPI. Currently, it um, brings in $2,331 in tax revenue to the city. If it were developed per the plan that we're bringing to you today for a special exception, the city would receive $150,000 plus per year in tax revenue. So if this property were to say go vacant for another 10 years, that'd be a $1.5 million worth of tax revenue that the city would not be receiving. Um, I would like to bring up Mr. Butt to give you some background on this property. Uh, he's owned it for quite a number of years. Uh, he can tell you all about that. But Mr. Butt, you, I think you all know him fairly well. He's CEO of Southwest Florida Retirement Centers. Uh, that was established in 1990. Um, he operates and owns six assisted living facilities in Southwest Florida, including two that are in the city of North Port. So right now, Mr. Butt, if you'd like to come up, please. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Zia Butt. I'm a Chief Executive Officer of Northport Retirement Center, and uh, I have been here for over 30 years, and we have completed a number of uh, projects and employed hundreds of people over the years. Uh, we work very closely uh, with the staff, which always been very professional, and the city leadership have worked hard to ensure these projects benefit the people of Northport. The city staff always work alongside the developer to ensure that residents of Northport are looked after and guide the developer as to what is allowable and inform them when the, when the courts are disallowed. This project we are proposing is essential to the growth and development of the rapidly evolving city of North, Northport. During my years of doing business, we have completed multiple projects here, commercial, medical, and all other kind of projects. It does not matter what kind of project we are bringing to the city, this project which we are proposing to undertake will deliver no less than our previous project. Since the establishment of our business in Northport, I have had the pleasure of working with six different city managers over the year. City officials and the staff, the staff have always been very professional and courteous and diligent in the execution of their duties, working long hours to ensure that these projects benefit the resident of Northport. They are always very straightforward with the developer to let them know upfront if the project will be disallowed if the courts are breached. Today, we are sitting in this beautiful chamber. This reminds me of the late 80s when we started our first project. The city staff used to work in a small building, Northport Boulevard, because of the hard work of the staff and the vision of the future project. We are all enjoying the benefit of the hard work, such as commercial, medical properties, recreational facilities are available to the resident of Northport. Now we are looking forward to having a teaching hospital. As you know, Sarasota Memorial Hospital is the teaching hospital that offer a number of residency programs to the future doctor and other medical staff. When this will open Northport Hospital. These medical residents will be rotating in all the different medical specialties, and residents of the Northport will be getting great benefit from their services, and they don't have to travel anywhere outside the city of Northport. During the last 10 years, I'm sure many of our neighbors and the commissioners have concern about how come we did not develop a medical urgent care or a surgical care. But I'd like to explain that during the last 10 years, 
We have worked with all of the big players, including Health Management Associate, which own Bayfront hospitals, Fawcett Hospital. We try our best to get the urgent care on that parcel. But each and every time when we went through the due diligence process and complete all the lengthy discussion with them, each institution, <clears throat> these medical institutions, they all indicated to us they want to be on US-41. They also have concern about the entrance to their building from Sumter Boulevard. If they decide to build the building, they want the entrance would have to be on Sumter Boulevard because the building will be facing towards Sumter Boulevard. After talking to the North Coast City staff, that was not feasible to get entrance from Sumter. As you know, they all end up on 41. As you can see, the new urgent, urgent care Fawcett Hospital just opened next to the Kia dealership. They are the one we spent a lot of time with them. Then another urgent care which we're working with that HMA, they end up also on that same 41. The city of Northwood growing at a rapid rate and it is anticipating more growth this inevitable as I said, as I said earlier in my statement, Sarasota Memorial Hospital, which we teaching hospital, will be opening its door in Northport alongside many other businesses. SMH will bring a lot of professional staff, including doctors, nurses, and resident program. The new doctors from all over the country to work in this city. With this anticipated expansion of the Sarasota hospital, there will be an increased demand of housing, which already exists. My own staff are finding it difficult to find an apartment for rent. The current housing shortage is severe. We are opposing, we are proposing a working solution to assist the eliminating this crisis. The, the parcel of land we are proposing for development will offer multifamily a multifamily rent, rental apartment and commercial space to meet the upcoming needs of the resident who will be working and residing in the city of Northport. As Peter said that this project will also bring a tax revenue approximately $150,000 per year, not what we are paying right now. Because of my strong vision of the future of the North Port, I would like to share some of our achievement. We are proud that we brought the first medical practice to the city of North Port, Dr. Barron and Dr. Islam. What we did, we offered free medical space for 18 months to these doctors so that, so, so that they could stay in North Port and develop their medical practice. There was no benefit to us. All the benefit was provided to the resident of this community. Since then, we have brought many medical practices and diagnostic center on US-41, working with the regional hospital. Today, we have <coughs> over 25 medical doctors available to the resident of Northport for different specialty, full-time or part-time. Okay, thank you. How are we doing on time, City Clerk? I don't see a clock to guide Mr. Butt. Ten minutes left. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Butt. Yes, I just wanted to let you know the history of this property and how Mr. Butt has owned it for many years. has been trying to get this developed as an office process project, but has not been able to do that. Um, not always when project properties are zoned a certain way are they going to develop that way today or in the near future. <clears throat> but there's always redevelopment beyond that. So um, let's move on and look at the site plan that uh, is proposed with the special exception. Um, I want to point out along the east side, which is adjacent to uh, the Country Club Bridge uh, neighborhood, now there's a 50-foot drainage easement, then there's a 20-foot drainage maintenance easement, and then we have a 10-foot uh, type C buffer. So we've got this 
50 foot, 20 foot, and 10 feet, 80 feet of land that is open space um, before you would even get to a building. But our buildings are actually set back at least 50 feet from the property line, and you have the 50 foot drainage easement. So there would be a bit of 100 feet from the properties of Country Club Ridge. Um, and one of the other things that we had heard uh, as we discussed this project in the past was that we need to have a commercial component. Mixed use has been discussed with the commission for quite a bit now as you're looking at your zoning code amendment. We've added 10,000 square foot of commercial building to the project. Uh, you know, that could be medical office, could be professional office, but that uh, building pad will be there for that development. Um, <clears throat> some of the other highlights here is we do have type C buffer around the whole entire property. Which I'll show you on the next site. Um, the the three-story buildings were moved closer to Sumter Boulevard, again, away from our residential neighborhood to the east. Um, as far as the landscape plan, again, I've talked about the type C buffer, which will be around the entire uh, perimeter of the, of the uh, property. Um, <clears throat> and the type C buffer will have uh, um, three trees per 100 feet and a continuous hedge that can be either spaced out uh, and grouped, as you see in the bottom detail, or kind of a linear um, type of a buffer you see above that. And here's the detailing of the buffers themselves. And again, you can see for greater detail how they would look. So I want to bring up uh, Philip DeMaria, and he's going to discuss some of the other components of the special exception. Thank you, Peter. Once again, for the record, my name is Philip DeMaria. I'm a certified planner with Kimley Horn. And uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, so my job here today is to discuss specifically the competent substantial evidence associated with the special exception. I mean, it's comp plan consistency, as well as uh, the required findings of fact located within your land development code. Um, so first, let's just start with the special exception. Uh, code section 5392 basically states that if a use is not specifically defined as a permitted use, but is also not specifically prohibited, you can apply for the special exception process. And that's what we're doing here with this mixed use development. Um, with comprehensive plan com uh, compliance, your professional staff performed a full analysis and did a really excellent job, as they always do, in analyzing uh, whether or not this proposal or any proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we performed our own independent analysis, and we're going to show a few of these future land use goals as well as other comprehensive plan chapter goals that show our consistency. The first is future land use goal one. Uh, which states that the, uh, we should ensure that the character and location of land uses maximize the potential for economic benefit and the enjoyment of natural and man-made resources by citizens while minimizing the threat to health, self, safety, and welfare posed by hazards, nuisances, incompatible land uses, and environmental degradation. Our justification is that the proposed use is consistent and compatible with the existing and proposed developments. Sumter Boulevard is a corridor that has some traffic to it, um, and those higher intensity corridors need to be buffered from single family uses. The proposal is a buffer or a transition to the lower density intensity single family uses to the east. Um, as it relates to housing, housing goal one and objective one state that we should promote the preservation and development of high quality, balanced and diverse housing options for all persons, all income levels throughout the city of Northport and specifically to provide a variety of housing types and affordability levels to accommodate the present and future housing needs. As Mr. Butt and as well as Mr. Van Buskirk stated, there are employers in the area um, that have uh, a substantiated need for this sort of housing in Northport. Um, there's a few economic development goals here, achieving an economically stable community with superior quality of life, expanding urban, suburban, and neighborhood infill development, and redevelopment housing options that support workforce by planning development near employment and transportation centers. The location of the site is certainly uh, an uh, employment and transportation center. Also, policy 5.1.2 states expand housing options that support the local workforce by planning for development near employment and transportation center centers. Once again, uh, this location is excellent for supporting those policies as well as uh, this is located within a Northport Breeze on demand area, um, which is, of course, the, the transit service. And we have high access to those multimodal forms of transportation that can reduce the amount of trips loaded onto the city's tra transportation network. 
Um, we are compliant with all uh, aspects of the land development code. We've lined up a few of these for you here in this chart. Uh, one item that I do want to call attention to is the stormwater design criteria, and Peter can speak to this more intelligently than I could, but we are over-designing. We are designing past the city's requirement for the 25-year uh, storm event, and we're designing for a 100-year storm event uh, with this project. Um, of course, there are requirements as it relates to the special exception. Uh, there are about 16 requirements that we've lined up here. We're compliant with each of these. Um, and this is once again substantiated by staff's evidence located within the staff report. Um, so finally, I'll end by saying uh, through these uh, submitted materials, along with the evidence provided to you today, uh, we've shown our compliance with the city's comprehensive plan. We've shown that the project will meet or exceed the requirements of the Unified Land Development Code. And we are in conformance with all aspects of the special exception findings of fact that are required by your code. We therefore respectfully request your approval of the special exception. Thank you very much. Thank you. Staff, you're next up. Good morning, Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of the Development Services Department. I'm presenting this case this morning on behalf of Sherry Willette Grondin, Planner 3, who prepared the staff report, who unfortunately is not able to be with us at the hearing today. I let the record show that I have been sworn. I am presenting uh, Pocatello Avenue Multifamily Special Exception Request SPX 23-139. The implementing resolution number would be 2023-R52. Uh, the applicant is Joseph Holt on behalf of the property owner Zia Butt, and they are represented by Kim Lee Horn. The request is a consideration of a special exception for a multifamily development as part of a mixed use project in the OPI zoning district. The development will include 175 <laughs> dwelling units, leasing office, fitness center, an office space, uh, amenities, and the construction of a two story, 10,000 square foot office building. The site is located on Sumter between Pocatello Avenue and McKibben, and it's about 11.7 acres of wooded vacant property. Multifamily is not specifically permitted nor prohibited in the OPI zoning district, and section 53-92 of the Unified Land Development Code provides for the special exception request for any use that's not specifically prohibited. <coughs> The city's SDR team reviewed this special exception application and all departments either had no objection or had conditions that would be required to be met at time of future submittals, including development master plan and major site and development plan should the project progress. Planning and zoning staff has reviewed this application for consistency with the city's comprehensive plan and the Unified Land Development Code. Your staff report includes a detailed analysis um, that will not be completely reiterated as part of this presentation, but we will touch on a few of the goals, objectives, and policies in the comp plan, as well as the findings for a special exception in the ULDC. Future land use goal one, maximizing the potential for economic benefit and enjoyment of natural and man-made resources while minimizing the threat to health, safety, and welfare. Um, this project is located on a major arterial roadway. Um, the use will provide for 
a transition between this high volume traffic generator and <clears throat> the residential to the east. The residential to the west is already separated by a 65 foot right of way and an eight foot wall. The project will have access to the existing multimodal path along Sumter Boulevard and is located within a half a mile of McKibben Park and a half a mile of commercial businesses along US 41. The project will be designed with over 50% of open space on the site to ensure enjoyment of those natural resources. Um, and the project would bring an additional $150,000 in ad valorem revenue to the city through taxes upon development. The um, project, if it should progress to the development master plan phase, will present a full fiscal analysis for the city's commission's consideration at the time the DMP is presented. Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Policy 1.1 describes the intent of the Professional Office Future Land Use Designation, which is intended for professional business office, institutional, cultural, residential, and associated uses. The Comprehensive Plan provides for up to 15 dwelling units per acre in the Professional Office Future Land Use Designation and a floor area ratio of 0.95. Now, the comprehensive plan does indicate that as a guideline, residential uses should not exceed 50% of the floor area, but a guideline is a recommendation for best practices. It's not a hard and fast regulation that um, we can impose upon a property owner in this district. In accordance with uh, chapter three of the comprehensive plan, the site provides adequate access and does not provide a connection to Sumter Boulevard, not a vehicular connection. And that's consistent with the access management controls in our comprehensive plan for our arterial and collector roadways. Um, the Public Works Department traffic engineer has reviewed this application and the associated traffic impact statement and found uh, no concerns with the presented TIS. Comprehensive Plan Chapter 8 addresses the housing elements, goals, objectives, and policies. This project would provide a housing option that would appeal to an additional segment of our population, a more professional um, type citizen or future resident that may be looking for employment in the area and avoiding a commute from outside. This project would provide alternatives to the single family detached dwelling unit options of our 40,000 vacant platted residential lots. Not everyone is interested in having a single family detached home and the associated maintenance um, that comes with that. Uh, policy 1.9 indicates housing should be in areas where supporting inf infrastructure is available. Um, again, this site does have access to the on-demand service of Breeze. It's located within a half a mile of US 41. Uh, pedestrian connectivity along the Sumter Boulevard multimodal path is available. Um, it also has access to McKibben Park, one and a half miles away, and uh, Heron Creek Elementary School and Northport High School within five miles. This project would increase those housing options available, um, and it is incorporated in a horizontal integrated mixed-use development. Uh, the economic development element uh, provides for the city offering housing options to support the workforce by planning for development near employment and transportation centers. Um, again, a half a mile from 41, uh, not too far from I-75 and Sumter, where the future Sarasota Memorial Hospital is proposed. And these housing options do have the potential to support our existing local workforce in addition to our future residents. 
Um, this type of housing option has the high likelihood of attracting young professionals who want a luxury model versus a high maintenance single family home. Staff reviewed the application according to Section 53259 of the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, the granting of a special exception must be found not to adversely affect the public interest, health, safety, and general <clears throat> welfare of the public. Uh, as indicated in the comprehensive plan section of the staff report and my presentation, the proposed use is consistent with the city comprehensive plan and the intent of the uh, OPI zoning district. The density of 15 units per acre is consistent with the future land use of professional office. And staff has found that the proposed use would not be a detriment to the health, safety, and welfare, <coughs> comfort, convenience, appearance, or prosperity of the neighborhood or the adjacent uses. The intensity of the use is harmonious with the character of the neighborhood. Um, as Mr. Van Buskirk stated, the site has been designed to incorporate a wide buffer between the existing single family to the east, um, including the drainage canal, the easement, and additional setback and landscape buffering. Um, the site provides approximately 126 feet between the two-story carriage homes and the existing residential to the east. Um, the three-story buildings are placed closer to Sumter Boulevard to uh, provide for additional compatibility to that neighborhood. And once again, the existing high traffic corridor of Sumter Boulevard, the 65-foot right-of-way, and the eight-foot wall along Country Greens will provide for additional buffering, as well as the Type C buffer that will be installed as part of this project. Uh, the proposed building heights are a maximum of 50 feet for this project. Uh, the OPI does allow for a maximum height of 70 feet, so these buildings will fall below the maximum. Um, finally, the subject parcel is adequately sized and shaped to accommodate both the multifamily use and a two-acre set-aside area for office professional use where the 10,000 square foot two-story office building is proposed. Uh, the property, the, the proposed project does provide for screening in accordance with the Unified Land Development Code. And these buffers will effectively separate traffic, light, and noise from adjacent property owners. Solid Waste has reviewed the location of the um, solid waste container and um, will require the wall and screening around the dumpster enclosure to help prevent any negative impacts. The applicant has not provided a signage package as part of this application, but they have indicated they are not requesting waivers and any signage that is placed will be compliant with Chapter 29 of the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, similarly, exterior lighting was not provided um, as part of this special exception package, but the applicant has indicated that it will be compliant with the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, Public Works and uh, Fire have reviewed the, the ingress and egress for the project and have found no concerns. Uh, this property has city water and wastewater available and the use shall not cause or intensify flooding. Um, as the commission is aware, the city and the Southwest Florida Water Management District has standards for uh, new construction and handling of stormwater, and sites are required to be designed such that the post-development runoff doesn't exceed the pre-development runoff. Uh, moreover, the applicant has agreed to over-design the site to the 100-year storm, whereas our regulations only require the 25-year storm event. Um, the accompanying resolution, 2023-R52, has been reviewed by the city attorney. And public noticing 
was provided per Section 53258 of the Unified Land Development Code. Um, at the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board meeting, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board did find to recommend denial of this project to the City Commission by a vote of four to two. Staff is recommending approval of this special exception, and we'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, staff. Um, it is time for our agree parties to come and present. So if the first party would like to come down. My name is James Murphy and I've been sworn. I've been a homeowner in Northport for 12 plus years. My family has owned homes in Northport for 30 plus years. Presently, there are 2,000 single family homes in a half mile radius of this proposed development. There are another 500 homes slated on the west side of Sumter Boulevard in the new Central Park development. The 11 plus acres, which is seeking its third zoning change, was originally slated as OPI not multifamily or now mixed youth. I guess the answer to all these solutions is to keep changing the area designations to fulfill the developer's requests. We as a community are being assaulted by a host of developers, but to have them entirely changed to fit their end objectives. Adjacent towns and communities are having the same issues and they too are not happy with the number of projects and the visions that the average taxpayer has to swallow and look at. By comparison to existing areas, this proposed apartment site, now repurposed mixed use, was never deemed for this type of development, but to the area for single story offices, rehab center as an adjacent property, which is owned by that individual. Right now, there are eight plus multifamily apartments being built on Sumter Boulevard next to the Walmart neighborhood market within a half mile of this proposed site. The de these designations for the land use were set up for that way for a specific reason not to be changed. Now with the resubmitted special now exception for this proposed property, it has now some OPI into the new mixed use development. Why was this not done in the original request? There was only one answer for that, and that's greed, hoping that it would be passed without issue. Planning and zoning pri tries to do their job, but I feel that they overstep in working too closely with the developers, funneling and thereby directing said developers and their agents to pigeonhole all the traps that lay in front of them. While planning and zo zoning theorize that they're doing their job, they seem to be an inside outside consulting agency. Whom do they really work for? Planning and zoning has a ramrod mentality, never addressing the main issues, which the North Board is jobs, jobs, jobs. The city still has not met the necessary infrastructure facilities necessary for future development. The city is still approving septic and well permits. We're just poisoning ourselves. All we have to do is listen to our algae problems on our beaches and our canals. Science doesn't seem to have a viable answer at this point to these questions, nor in the foreseeable future. One of the biggest economic drivers in, in this entire region will cease to exist, and that's tourism. Northport over the years has spent tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to consulting fees trying to find a stable way we should progress into the future, which the consulting firms <coughs> Verify is to find businesses to come to Northport to create or locate for jobs, jobs, jobs. The major problem with this is no required infrastructure for their needed development. <coughs> Northport is a major exporter of our workforce to travel to adjacent communities for their jobs. The proposed mixed use project might employ 15 to possibly 20. The extra OPI building space now proposed it might at best employ another 25 plus employees just to satisfy its current resubmittal. The original OPI designation that had been submitted would have created possibly 120 plus full-time jobs 
around the clock for personnel to meet its demands. Northport needs to have more work play game plan for the job growth inside the city limits. Many of the new multifamily units are affordable housing. The issue is where will they work within Northport or outside of Northport. In the first reading of this property, the apartments were said to be luxury, where it would mostly be inhabited by professionals that would work at the new Sarasota Memorial Hospital at Sumter Boulevard. That's a pipe dream. From conception to finalization, it will take five plus years and maybe longer to do its proposed location where it was drastically flooded during Hurricane Ian. We're now seeing evidence that what was washed out by Ian has now been returned by Adalia. The place where professionals will settle will be Welland Park that now has a Sarasota Memorial Hospital facility and other healthcare, retail, commercial, entertainment, and cultural arts within Welland Park. This is where the professionals will live. All they have to do is walk to work and enjoy the other amenities that this area has to offer with more to come in the future. Let me finish by showing the cover story. And I forgot to bring the paper. In the Herald Tribune of April 9th, 2023, showing that 40% of our state legislatures have direct ties to the real estate industry. With today's catchword of trickle-down theory, it is not hard to imagine flowing down from state to county to city and town levels. Through all of these various levels of government, it's not hard to fathom where it creates obvious conflicts of interest where developers and home, and home builders sponsor legislation to benefit their industries or to change land use designations to suit their objectives. I believe a lot of these projects are being rubber stamped to speed up the process when Venice's Welland Park secedes from Northport with over a 30% tax basis loss. There were to be additional development started to re we would need additional development started to resupply the lost tax basis for the city's future proposed budget. At the last meeting we had in front of the city's planning and zoning boards, a number of questions were asked by the planning and zoning board to a city planning and zoning staff member. The answers told to the city planning and zoning staff did not answer the questions posed by the planning and zoning board members who were looking for a definitive yes or no answers to questions asked. The answers given by city planning and zoning staff to these questions were recited several times referencing the UDLC or the comprehensive plan, not eliciting the answers to questions posed by the planning and zoning board. We're seeing more local citizens in our nearby communities mobilizing against development plans that threaten our quality of life and do not comply with our community plans and ordinances. It's just easier to fight to overturn whatever stands in the way of developers and their agents feel are necessary steps to justify all the objectives they want to attain at whatever means possible. We're going down a very precarious road. It could open up the floodgates to have everything conceivably changed to attain their goal. We need a new kind of development that provides manageable growth with more respect for citizens' expectations, hurricane safety, and nature. That will only happen if we further our involvement in comprehensive planning and hold state and local officials ac accountable with our votes. It is also imperative that we fund state and local land conservancies so that they may preserve wild places before they disappear under concrete and car tires. Northport's new catchphrase now appears to be unity. What's happened to the old decorated word that leaves room for truth to escape, which is transparency. Transparency, as in the context used here in Northport, is a calling for or promising of more transparency. I think that we would well, I think that what we would appreciate is just the simple truth. I'm imploring the board to allow the occupancy rate to stay what it originally was, OPI, and not now mixed use with special exemption and or exception. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Good morning to all. My name is Gary Bowman, and I have been sworn. I am a 20-year resident of Northport, and I've been a proud resident. I've worked with city commissioners, city planners, planning and zoning for over 20 years, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished as a city. Now I'm getting concerned because this building is out of control. And we have to stop some of that, or not stop it, but we have to moderate it and put it in its place so we do correct building, not just a lot of building. Anyway, I'm the current homeowner president of Sumter Green, a very beautiful community of 38 homes, which is located just west of where this apartment building is proposed. We would be aggrieved by this apartment building for possible loss of property value, noise pollution, light pollution, litter, possible crime, and just other factors. We already have an apartment on Greenwood Avenue below us that's been there for 15 years called the Grand Court Apartments. It's caused us a lot of issues, and we don't want another apartment, especially in a single-family neighborhood. I'm also, for full disclosure, treasurer of the Sable Trace Alliance, this alliance is composed of the eight homeowner associations around the Sable Trace Golf Course, which is now being developed as Central Park. In Central Park, probably within two to three years, there will be 800, 550 new homes, single family homes and paired villas at that location. If this apartment were to be built at Sumter and Pocatello, adding 175 units there, it would double the density of the area that goes down Greenwood Avenue, across Northport Boulevard, up Appomattox, and back to Greenwood. <clears throat> double, double the density in that area that's already crowded. In fact, Rita Hester, the uh, Planning and Zoning Chairwoman, uh, made a disclosure at the meeting on October 5th. She lives on Eastern Pocatello and was commenting about how bad the traffic really is to try to pull out onto Sumter Boulevard, particularly if you're crossing traffic. It's just ridiculous stuff. Anyway, we get started on the apartment. Planning, zoning, and the developer's attorney and representatives. What have you believed that this new proposal, which adds less than a quarter acre for an office professional building of 10,000 square feet, meets all of the city codes, the comprehensive plan, the, U the ULDC, and that all of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed? If that were true, the needed special exemption to build the multifamily apartments at Pocatello Sumter would not have been denied by the Planning and Zoning Board by a four to two vote on October 5th, just over a month ago. Before the Planning and Zoning Board on October 5th, before the four to two vote to deny the special exemption, six inspired speakers, including me as an agreed speaker, gave factual, logical, and convincing arguments as to why the Malta family apartments do not belong at the Pocatello Sumter location. These speakers were surrounding aggrieved neighbors who stood proud, strong, determined, and informed, and many of them you see here to my left. In addition to the speakers, we have previously submitted over 440 signed petitions to the city clerk's office showing universal and vehement opposition to this invasive apartment proposal, attempting to be built in the middle of a vast amount of single family homes. And four of the planning and zoning board members were wise enough to see on October 5th that A, a multi-family apartment does not belong in a large single family neighborhood. And also that the apartment proposal violates goal one of future land use by minimizing, not maximizing economic benefit of creating significant jobs when compared to an OPI alternative. More on that in a second. Also, that approving a special exemption for this project 
would set a very dangerous precedent for future North Fork zoning decisions. And D, that opposition to this invasive multifamily apartment in a vast single family neighborhood is both universal and overwhelming. In staff reports for the first proposal on January 10th, where the commissioners denied the special exemption, there are highlights of a benefit for OPI versus a land use in the multifamily for this special exemption in the documentation phase. Listen closely to what this says. And this is from our city staff, not from me. It states in future comparison, they're talking about the special exemption we're talking about today. 20 years after the project completion, the multifamily development would realize a net fiscal benefit to the city of $3.9 million and potentially create 15 jobs. The impact for the office professional use would provide a net benefit of $7.15 million. However, potential job creation is significantly higher and projected at 343 jobs. So that just shows you that the OPI is a much better alternative for this property rather than a model family apartment. Yes, as Mr. Butt said and so forth, they've tried to get some OPI there. We're going to have to try harder because we need OPI on that property. With all the contacts that the city has, with the planning and zoning and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the economic development people, we should be able to find an OPI for that particular property. We need OPI, prefer preferably medical at this location, not multi-family apartment. As Jim Murphy, my neighbor, said, we need jobs, jobs, jobs in order to achieve our goal of going from 8% commercial tax base to 16% commercial tax base. It took 14 and a half years, folks, to go from 5% commercial to the 8% commercial where we are now. I don't want to wait another 15 years. I don't have another 15 years to see this commercial development go to the 15 or 16% which we need for the commercial tax base. The apartment proposal for this location is an economic loser for the city of Northport and the citizens. This apartment should be moved to a location that is zoned for it and where it's compatible with the surrounding community. We've heard this spiel, like we heard today, five times about how this meets all the ULDC and the land codes, and dots all the I's and T's. And yet, it's been, it's been denied twice, once by the commission on uh, January 10th and by the Planning and Zoning Board on October 5th, just a month ago. Let's compare some statistics. To look for a comparison, you don't have to look very far. Next door, Mr. Butt owns, and he's done a wonderful job with that. He's been a great provider for the city of jobs is the Northport Pines Assisted Living. It's at 4950 Pocatello Avenue. That property is consumed, or 2.9 acres is the land area of that property. It employs approximately 135 people, which is great on 2.9 acres. This proposal for 4951 Pocatello Avenue is on 11.7 acres, and maybe will employ 10 to 15 people, as the staff report said. An office building of 10,000 square feet that they put in the second proposal, when divided by 509,652 feet, which is the land area of the property, comes out to 0 0.019 OPI on 11.7 acre lot. Back at the city commission in January, <coughs> commissioners, two commissioners, Commissioner McDowell and Mayor Langdon, it asked for an OPI component to be added to this project to make it more amenable for them to be receptive to it. So we've got it now, but what we've got is less than 2% of OPI on that property. And since the building is going to be a two-story building, you know, 5,000 square feet with another 5,000 square feet on top of that, if we divide that 5,000 square feet by the property area, it comes out to 0 0.0098, which is an infinitesimal amount of OPI on this 11-acre property. The potential job 
creation of this 11.75 acres could easily exceed 400 jobs. This property is almost four times larger than the Northport Pines assisted living next door, but already employs 135 people. It would be malfeasant of the commissioners to forgo this opportunity to accept a multi-family apartment with less than a quarter acre of OPI that at a maximum would employ 15 people and have to grant a special exemption in order to do so. It just doesn't make sense. Every day, I've lived here 21 years, between 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning, and all of us see that are long-term residents. The cars are streaming out of Northport on 41, on the interstate, trying to get out of town to go work, okay? It's been that way since I've been here, and it might be getting a little bit better, but as the population increases, it's a nightmare in the morning for two hours. If I schedule an appointment like in Pontic Ward or whatever, or dermatology in Inglewood, I'll wait till after 10 o'clock so hopefully that traffic clears. We need these jobs to come to our city. We don't want to drive out of town for work and then drive back. Northport needs to, to create these jobs. We implore the commission to recheck our quality of life and maximize the economic benefit for the city and for the residents by denying the special exemption for multifamily housing at the Sumter and Pocatello location. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do economically. And remember also that now, because the Planning and Zoning Board denied the special exemption on October 5th, there is no pressure here from the Planning and Zoning Board to recommend that, they, that the commissioners approve this. That's significant. Okay, I think that's very significant. Okay. If you look right now at the Northport construction viewer of everything that's going on in the city, and you just have to go to the city website to do that, uh, I counted up on Tuesday of last week a year ago, this wasn't true. We needed more multifamily housing. But in the 11 months since we've last met, on that viewer, as of yesterday, there were 6,942 multifamily units, either under construction or planned. And some of them aren't even on the viewer yet because they've just been proposed, and most of those are down on the Toledo Blade corridor. So as my buddy, Carmen Miranda from Northport Forward says, there's really no urgent need now for multifamily housing because we've got plenty of it under construction. What's going on here across from Walmart is unbelievable. It's actually scary. Okay? The trees are all gone, everything's gone. And we're going like, really? Okay. So maybe this thing and move to another location, this apartment. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Take it to Toledo Blade, take it to Welland Park, take it to North Sumter Boulevard, somewhere where it's zoned for and where it's compatible with every other thing that's surrounding the surrounding environment. When we listen to this economic thing, crosses the I's, dots the T's, it's consistent with this, it's consistent with that. I have a letter at home that says, that's just frankly not true. It's been denied by both the planning board and it's been denied by the commission. And we need it to be denied again so we can finally put this to rest because we've been fighting this now for over 15 and a half months. And it's not compatible there, it doesn't belong to be there, and it needs to be moved to another location. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Need some help? Okay. I'm going to try to not read too much. I want to talk to you. I think <clears throat> I think uh, different level of communication. Sir, can you state your name and that you were sworn? Absolutely. A uh, different level of communication is appropriate at this time. My name is John C. Um, I am a member of Sumter Green Homeowners Association, and I'm proud to say I am their secretary. Have you been um, 
I'm also close enough, obviously, to be an aggrieved party. Also, repeat, please, for the record. That I did take my sworn, oath. I've been sworn, and everything I'm about to say to you is not only true, it'll be irrefutable, and I will not waste anyone's time coming up here to repeat anything that I'm about to say. So um, I've got someplace else to go. It's not that I don't have interest, but I'm here to drop some facts, some truth, and maybe get you guys to think outside of this uh, stuffy realm at a personal level what we're talking about here. So in the last couple of weeks, there's been articles in the local newspaper. They've talked about uh, state legislation possibly impacting the desire uh, of the city to put in place a 12-month moratorium. Um, and how that proposed or potential state legislation could impact that desire. I, um, I respect you guys. The job that you have is not easy. Um, and it's important. It impacts lives. When you sit here and you listen to everything and you realize how much time has been set, spent by city staff on this, when they could have been spending it better maybe on the homes that got destroyed by Ian and the other hurricanes. This is a misuse and an injustice. And let me explain why. In one of the articles, <clears throat> it mentioned that um, a couple commissioners <laughs> feared that this uh, moratorium could hamper the rewrite of the Unified Land Development Code. The word they used was feared. Something offended me in January on the 10th, and I'll tell you about it in a bit. And it was driven by fear. We have our own fears as well, and it's not just um, that this will be uh, become reality and be across from us. Some of us have fears of how we're going to recover from the hurricane, financial matters, everything else. Very real. And we are residents. We're not a developer from outside the area. So I want to refer to something that came out after the January 10th meeting. And one of the things <clears throat> that was listed as uh, substantial evidence was that it did not, this proposal, which hasn't changed, but for 10,000 square feet of OPI, which is stacked, so it's 5,000 square feet on the surface of that 11 acres, is, quote, the intensity of the proposed use is not harmonious with the character of other uses in the neighborhood. Intensity. I don't know how you guys grasp that word, but not changing the proposal other than sliding material to, you know, a side and squeezing in something, does that reduce or does it increase the intensity of what we're looking at, what we're considering? I think we'd all be in agreement. That intensifies it, does it not? So I challenge you guys to take a look at the reason for uh, denial from January 10th. On top of that, uh, let me get the right spot here. Um, there was a limitation that was put on it. <clears throat> and uh, the limitation says basically that uh, you can't reapply for 12 months. Well, it's been less than 12 months, and we're here because it's been given not only an except, they're, they're not only looking for an exception, but they got a waiver on the time requirements. To me, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm reading what was written by the city attorney that went out as to what occurred, why it was, why it was denied January 10th. And I'm looking to see what has changed. Conditions have not improved. They've gotten worse on this proposal. <coughs> We've talked about OPI. How many properties 
in the city of Northport are classified as OPI? Do you guys know? Four, right now, at least as of the planning and zoning board meeting. So, something we all have to deal with. If I have $4 in my pocket, am I going to protect it a little bit more than if I have $100? I say yes. I say you have a duty and an obligation to protect that $4. I line that up with a shortage of commercial property. You hear words like, we have a need for non-residential tax revenue. I, Zia Butt, I have no problem with him as an individual. This is not a personal thing. This is what is best for the community that you are elected to represent. I guess if we want to become the affordable housing of Sarasota County and watch things just get, quote, pack banned up, then go for it. Go willy-nilly and approve all this stuff. But I think there's been some specifics mentioned and I'm kind of going at it with a little bit more abstract approach. And this is how abstract it's going to become. We all look like we've all had children. You have a son or a daughter. They know the standards. You don't leave the house unless you dress appropriately. And oh, by the way, you don't go out on a school night. Your son or daughter pops up. This is something really important. I got to go to it. Somebody's moving away, some pressing matter. I'm asking for an exception. You look at your son or your daughter. She's dressed inappropriately. He's dressed inappropriately. And you both say no. And in the past, you've had issues with arguing with your kids and them playing back and forth between mom and dad. And it was a given fact. No, you're not going to come back in five minutes and argue with us. You've got a set period of time. Because of whatever reason, you grant them grace and you say, tell you what, you go change clothes, become more appropriate, and we'll reconsider. They come back. What did they do? They got the same clothes on, but they put Sunday shoes on. And they say, I'm appropriate. That's what these guys have done. As a, as a father, I would take that as an insult from my children. It doesn't mean I don't love my children. It doesn't mean I have any problem with Jeffrey Boone or Zia Butt or anyone else associated with this. What it is is an insult, not just to you guys, but to us as a community. We have spent time <coughs> and effort coming down here and explaining to you what is appropriate in our neighborhood, how it was zoned when we bought our, our properties, and the concerns that we have. And we applaud you for making the tough choices up to now. I was there on January 10th. If you had a son or daughter that did that, would you be bending over to say, oh, by all means, I'm going to grant you, go out on a school night looking like that with your Sunday shoes on? No. I am totally convinced of that. Unfortunately, when I left the meeting on January 10th, I heard at least one commissioner mentioned that they did not stand up for what they believed was right because they were fearful of a lawsuit. Well, guess what? I was in the military. You guys are there for a reason. You don't make decisions. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of making the right decision. Why did you run if that's why you voted the way you did? I'm looking for upstanding representation, takes this stuff into consideration, understands it doesn't fit in the community. Nothing's changed here. You denied it once already. The Planning and Zoning Board has recommended denial. The last time, it was unanimously recommended for approval. What changed? They smell exactly what I've described. The kid went off and just changed a shoe looking just as they did last time. They're spitting in your face. They're spitting in our face. I'm tired of wasting my time 
fighting this when they already know we've told them no as a community. You guys have told them no. And you asked for OPI, and they gave you 0.11 of an acre. That's 5,000 square feet on an 11-acre property. I would hate to see this go through and have my name associated with approving this project for those reasons. This isn't personal. This is what's best for the community. And I'm hoping that each of you has the courage to make the right decision. Those of you who made it last time should be simple. Those of you that I would say had a questionable ruling the last time, put on your big boy pants. Make the tough decision. It's not that tough. We're the residents you represent. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, it is almost noon. I'm gonna take a break now for lunch. Uh, let's make it till 12.30, about 40 minutes. So we'll come back and resume this hearing at 12.30. Thank you. Test.
There's a little reverb in there. Okay, okay. okay. It's got a little something in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so that means it's not as loud. Oh, I can raise it. I can always raise it. Oh, it's the top time, huh? Yeah, awesome. Testing, test, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Test, test, testing. Check, check.
<laughs> check, check. You can hear that, right? Yeah. Okay. Can we get the second one for Vice, Mayor? I'll lay down and be. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, sure, no. no. Come on. Get me in trouble. They'd be like, you're fired. No, no, there's nobody here. Yeah, right? Oh, gosh. Check one, two. Microphone check, one, two, one, two. Uh-oh, watch that now. The start of the demise of my career. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get fired? Well, well, I started doing karaoke during the Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Things happen. <laughs> Does she have them up here, you think? Testing, testing. Okay. Come on, JD.
Friday, we are resuming. It is 12.30, and we are resuming the City Commission regular meeting. Before we move on to rebuttals, I need to check in with my fellow commissioners to see if you had any ex parte communications during the break. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor Wyatt? No, none. No for me? No, ma'am. And Commissioner McDowell? None. Okay. Then let's move on. Um, now we're going into the rebuttal phase. Rebutters have five minutes each, and we will go in this order. Applicant first staff and then aggrieved parties third. So applicant, if, if you would come up. I'm online at the top of the truck now. <laughs> um, mm. um, city attorney, should we wait or may I go out of order given the circumstances? <clears throat> no ma'am, we cannot go out of order without a party here to agree to a change in the quasi-judicial procedures. Okay, I suspected that was the case, but I wanted it confirmed. We'll hold on for a couple of minutes. Is someone calling them? That might be a very good idea. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh... We should dox their time. <laughs> You're harsh, ma'am. <laughs> I had just thrown it out there. <laughs> it was a joke. Mayor, since there's people that are probably listening, wondering what's going on, do we want to just take like a three minute recess? If we do that, the minute we do that, they'll come in. So, <laughs> so we'll just hang tight. Thank you, though. Let's get our Jeopardy music on. Mm. <laughs> Vice Mayor White might sing. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Give me a song. I like that oh. song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to sing another song eventually because that's already known for the garbage song. <laughs> that was a good song. Mayor, <clears throat> while yes. we're waiting, can I handle a housekeeping matter with respect to this item with the board? Absolutely. In looking at your proposed motions, I need... If we could have quiet in chambers, please. Go ahead, City Attorney. In looking at the proposed motions that have been presented to the board, I need to correct the code reference that is in each of the three potential motions. Yes. The motions refer to section 53-259, subsection 3. Yes. It should read 53-259A3. Okay. I'm making that note. And that's whether you all, you know, make a motion to approve, approve with conditions, or deny that. Right. That reference is in each of the three. So right. 53-259A3 is the correct A3. reference. A3. Thank you, ma'am. I think we've got it. Absolutely. 
I think we have an update. Okay, thank you for that, sir. We'll resume in just a minute. And you said 40 minutes, I might have heard 12, 40. <laughs> <laughs> I could have done that. Stairway to heaven here. <laughs> <clears throat> Mayor, maybe we should take that recess because this is dead air for the people that are listening that are probably thinking it's technical difficulties. For anyone listening, it is not technical difficulties. We have a tardy applicant, so um, we've been assured that they will be here any moment now. So hang in with us, please. Here they come. You have kept this body waiting, sirs, for 10 minutes. It was suggested that I dock your time. I'm very tempted to do so, but let's resume without any further delay. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. We, uh, we were out uh, creating jobs, so to speak, within <laughs> local business. <laughs> Again, so uh, Peter Van Busker, Timley Horn, I have been sworn. Uh, <clears throat> So what I'd like to do is just to discuss some of the items that were discussed by uh, our uh, previous speakers. Um, one is, first off, was we're not changing the zoning here. We're just asking for special exception that is allowed by code for use that's not specifically approved nor uh, prohibited in this uh, district. Uh, there's discussion of wells and septics. We're on water and sewer here, so that will not be an issue. Um, you know, there's <clears throat> some discussion of Grand Court and that type of apartments. These are market rate apartments. You know, these will support professionals, working class people within the city. Um, there's other discussion about job creation. And I think, <clears throat> you know, when we think about job creation, okay, there'll be jobs in the apartments, there'll be jobs in the offices, but all those people living in those apartments need services, <laughs> they, they need <clears throat> um, professionals, to do their taxes, to go get their hair done. Um, they need the retail facilities to support them. So there's more than just the jobs on that site being created. There's jobs that'll be created throughout the city to support those new residents and the people that are in that office space. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Mr. Butt talked about his work that he's done in the past and you know, he's an expert in bringing medical facilities to this area, creating those types of businesses, bringing doctors to the area. He told you how hard he's tried to get that type of use on this site for 10 years. 
and has not been able to do it. And I think there's letters that we can provide you um, that would show people did their due diligence, came to the conclusion this is not the location for us. They want to be on 41. They don't want to be on Sumter. They'll get no access on Sumter. So it's just not a suitable location for them. Um, <clears throat> you know, there was discussion about we only we thought this was always going to be a single story medical facility. Nothing in the code, nothing in any any type of restriction to this property that I know of would restrict it to a single story medical facility. OPI allows office buildings up to 70 feet in height. Um, the office numbers that were discussed about this 0.11%, I think, are grossly skewed. There's 10,000 square foot of office compared to 95,000 square foot of uh, residential. So it's not this infinitesimal amount of office. You, know, you talk about 5,000 square foot footprint over the overall property area, then yeah, the fraction is very small, but it's really not a small amount of office space for this property. Um, and one of the benefits of being multifamily with some office, we still have a lot of open space within the multifamily comp, um, campus, um, a lot of little courtyard area there. So, um, you know, we'll get that benefit of having the multifamily here. Uh, you know, they talk about the intensity and, you know, I, I, I look at the intensities and say, well, geez, you're adding 10,000 square foot of office and I don't say that that's not adding intensity. Um, but yet there's a discussion of, well, we want this to be OPI use, just OPI. Well, that could have seven story building with a high FAR on this property. And staff in their report showed that um, on average, look, taking an, an average of uses, within the uh, allowable office type of, of use, there would be twice as much traffic generated than is generated by our project. So there is would be more intensity if you went strictly with OPI. Um, the mixed use provides you know, the OPI use and the multifamily, which we need in this area. You know, there was discussion too about, well, in Welland Park, they do this and they do it well. Why don't we go to Welland Park? Well, Welland Park does have multifamily, and they do have commercial, and they work well together. But what about the core area of Northport? I mean, how about apartments here on 41 to support the businesses that are there? I think we need that interaction at this location as well. So here, let's, let's, let's help create a Welland Park in our core area downtown. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Staff? Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of Development Services. I have been sworn uh, to address some of the testimony from the aggrieved parties. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to clarify staff's role in the process. Um, this, the staff report for this particular special exception request was prepared by a planner who has 17 years of experience in the City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division. The staff report was reviewed by myself, a certified planner with over 30 years of experience, and Elena Ray, the Director of Development Services, who is also a certified planner with over 30 years of experience. Staff's role is to use their education, their knowledge, and their um, professional experience to evaluate petitions based on consistency with the city's comprehensive plan and the unified land development code. That is our role. That is our role, period. We are not an agent for the applicant or, for the applicant or the developers. Our role is to provide our professional opinion as to the status of a development petition to help the city commission make the best decisions that they can in light of the approvals being requested of them. Uh, next, I would like to talk a little bit about the commentary that these types of developments belong in Welland Park. Uh, Welland Park is a master planned community with a mix of uses and those uses uh, serve one another. 
Legacy Northport needs to provide a diversity of housing options and in compliance with the comprehensive plan, place those housing options in close proximity to transportation and employment centers. Pushing all the density to Welland Park will only exaggerate our transportation issues because those people who work in Legacy Northport will need to travel 41 or I-75 to reach their destinations. Uh, as to the commentary regarding um, OPI uses, percentage of the site, and transportation. Um, OPI, under the current regulations and the allowable floor area ratios, could result in a building of 484,169 square feet at up to 70 feet high. Uh, staff did provide a comparable evaluation of the building square footage proposed for this multifamily and office mixed use project and the transportation analysis there too, um, and found that the transportation trips associated with an OPI project of the exact same size as what's being proposed here in this mixed use would actually, would actually um, provide for a substantial increase in transportation trips on this site, notwithstanding the fact that the analysis was not completed for the maximum development potential on this site. If you look at the percentage of commercial to residential, and you look at that based on the building square footage, rather than the square footage of the non-residential component to the acreage of the site, you're looking at 4.37% of the site will be dedicated to non-residential use. Um, if, you, if you look at the calculation of the two acre set aside, for the non-residential use on the site plan. Um, that two acres is actually 17% of the site dedicated to non-residential uses. Uh, as to the references to the Heron Creek apartments, there are two projects in Heron Creek um, next to Walmart. One is a traditional multi-story, multi-family project and one is a horizontal multifamily project. The number of units associated with these two projects is 580. 580 units is less than 1% of the city's 70,000 single family detached lots. So without even taking into consideration all of the single family homes in the Heron Creek DRI, the Panacea DRI, and the Welland Park DRI, we are at less than 1% with the units that are being built in Heron Creek right now. Um, your, your time is up, ma'am. Thank you. OK, now we have our aggrieved parties. You will each have five minutes. Mr. Murphy. I know that uh, I've heard the planning and zoning. If, if you could repeat oh, yes. your name, My name and you've James been sworn. And I have been sworn in. Thank you. And try to speak up okay. so folks can hear you. Thanks. Um, I know that there's been a lot of numbers that have been just been given here about the square footage, um, the acreage. Um, in the new OPI that they're proposing here on this site, if I was, I was, I was in belief that it would they would encompass two acres of that uh, 11 acre site, 11 acre plus site. It seems that they've integrated not only the uh, that building, that 5,000 square uh, footprint building, but they've also integrated the um, retention ponds and everything else that are going there on that piece of property. Uh, so that's not really. Uh, the full two acres that they're talking about. Um, also, too, uh, we listened this morning with some of the fifth graders here that were telling about what they would like to do in the town. 
And there were two or three of these speakers that talked about jobs and getting small businesses here. Here's 11 year old children telling us what they believe that they need here. These are the future citizens here of Northport, and they're, you know, somewhat on the ball with what's going on. They all talked about the same, I mean, they all talked the same thing about four or five different types of topics, but they get what's going on here. And, you know, we're bantering all this thing. We've got the special exemption. We've got the, um, not the special, ex exception. I mean, this is all wordplay that's going on, word salad. I mean, come on, let's get going here with this thing and put it to rest. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thalman. I just saw him a minute ago. Is he still here? <laughs> and uh, Mr. Seep, I don't see him either. Has he indeed left us? Yes, he left. He left. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I guess today is a waiting game. We're again waiting for those listening for one of our speakers to rejoin us. We'll give Mr. Thalman the grace of some additional time. Mayor. Yes, to retain due process, I suggest giving this party at least the same amount of time as we gave another party who was late. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Thal Thalman. Sorry, if you can repeat runner. your name and you've been sworn and you'll have yes, five Yes, my name minutes. is Gary Thalman. I have been sworn and I am the homeowner president of Sumter Green, <clears throat> uh, which is located directly west of where the supposed apartment is proposed to be built. Uh, I'm not going to argue with planning and zoning or Peter Ben, bus cook or whatever. We've heard this spiel five times about how this thing meets the comprehensive plan, the ULDC is compatible for the neighborhood. And twice, uh, the commissioners on January 10th, 2023, and the planning and zoning board on October 5th, both denied this special exemption because it does not meet the ULDC, the comprehensive plan, and it's not compatible with the existing neighborhood. So we ask the commission to please deny the exemption again today because none of that evidence has changed. Everything's the same except they added 10,000 square feet, which is a very small amount of OPI. We listened to what the people said, the mayor and W. McDowell on January the 10th. We want some OPI in here. It's 11.7 acres. We want two acres, possibly three acres of OPI. In my opinion, the developer, they didn't listen to come back with a quarter of an acre. That's a slap in your face. That's laughable. Don't let them get away with it. Vote to deny this special exemption today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. City Clerk, do we have any online public comment for this topic? Maybe not. How about in the room? Yes. Joe Watkowski? You have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Joe Wachtowski, Northport. <clears throat> um, I'd like to start out with a little thing. Too much, too soon, too far. And by that I mean that- Joe, uh, can you play state that you were sworn? Would I what? That you were sworn? Oh yes, I was sworn in, yes. Thank you. Um, I gave some, you know, I pa had passed out uh, some, some flyers earlier. Uh, that's from the Sun newspaper a few days ago. And it's about the election down in Punta Gorda. And it's interesting. What does that have to do with us? It has a lot to do with us. 
because the, the person who lost his job on the commission was all gung-ho, you know, let's develop everything everywhere. And uh, the lady who won was, wait a minute, let's pull back. Let's take a look at the community and see what the community needs first. Well, they didn't expect her to win because the other guy had been there a while. She did win. She won by over 71% of the vote, which is an overwhelming amount because she listened to the people. She listened to the voters. She was human, and she knew what human beings needed. We don't need this, this apartment of complex. We don't need it at all, and why? As I estimated, there are over 6,000, maybe as much as 6,500 empty apartments here in Northport now, right now. And believe it or not, uh, despite what you've heard about Florida in the last few years, people piling in, some people are beginning to go back now. Uh, they don't like crowded roads, which, you know, look at Sumter out here. I had a lot of problems uh, getting here uh, for 12.30 again. Um, people have become very disenchanted with Florida in many ways, and so people who don't like that are going back. With 6,500 apartments, are we, do we really think we're not going to fill those up? No, we may or we may not. I just think that with, you know, if we're going to fill up as much as, as you think we might with these new apartments and everything, we're going to be adding a lot of crime to the area, a lot of crowded roads to the area. It's going to be straining our electrical grid. It's going to be straining our water systems, which are strained now. There's plenty of water. It's just not drinkable. It's going to be straining our sewage systems. It's going to be straining a lot of systems. And we're going to be growing anyway, because going forward, as I understand it, it's a second fastest growing community in the country. That's great for right now, but will that always exist? What happens if this, this return of people who've come here, if they start going back? We'll be left with a lot of empty houses and a lot of empty apartments. Um, I'm just saying that we should be very cautious, and the people on the commission should pay attention to the voters the people who actually live here, not potential people who might come with these apartments. Sir, so your, your time is up. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir. Deanna Lamoureux, followed by Mark Lamoureux. Deanna Lamoureux, followed by Mark Lamoureux. Deanna Lamoureux, followed by Mark Lamoureux. My name is Deanna Lamoureux, and I have been sworn in. I am a resident of Country Club Ridge. I moved here in 2011. There was a statement made recently during this meeting that they were not asking for a rezoning. My question is, since they are asking for a special exception, what is that except for a limited rezoning? They want to change. They want something different than what is there. And they're talking about, oh, we could build up to 70 feet. My suggestion, and I believe that everyone in the room probably has done this, travel Sumter between 41 and 75 and look at what's on either side of the road. It's all short buildings. It's all small businesses, and right here, and I get turned around, right here by the little Walmart, how many apartments are being built? Someone said 580, okay. We need 175 more, and it must be on that little strip of land. Why has no one mentioned that piece of land that's already cleared? that has a building on it that could be rehabbed or torn down, but already hits on 41, right there by Wendy's. Yes. Right there by Wendy's. What's wrong with that location? Why do they need this little strip and that little strip? I live in Country Club Ridge. I will say I could be off on my numbers by a little bit, but I'm not trying to deceive anyone or mislead anyone, and I don't have to use fancy languages, guidelines, and suggestions, and rules to get my point across. We all have a brain. 
I would like us all to use our brain in Country Club Ridge, which was Lake Country Club, shortly a year ago, thanks to Ian, there was four feet of water in the street where I live. My house was underwater, okay? That's life, okay? But there were 137 houses, my understanding, in Country Club Ridge, 137. Now, we have a lake and roads and yards and places to park cars, but we have 137 houses on what is probably two or 300 acres. And now they want to put 175 apartments in less than 10 acres, and they, someone, some, it was said, there will be no or minimal impact on the egress and ingress onto Sumter. Wrong. A hundred. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Mark Lamerell, and I live in Country Club Ridge. And I have been sworn. And I have been sworn. Thank you, sir. The, um, the thing that just perplexes me, all my life I've been politically active and, and uh, tried to you know, benefit our, our communities and, and, and our country. And one of the things I don't ever understand is government waste. Why are we here? You commission people, disallowed this for very good reason on January 10th. And then for some other reason, you let them re reapply. And they actually slapped you in the face. The reason they didn't put a more OPI in is because unless they have 175 units to rent, it's not economically feasible for them. So in that case, it's not economically feasible for them, and it's not economically feasible for us who live around it. But I don't know who in the, in the planning board or whatever, but whoever does the traffic surveys, but they need to try to get out of McKibben and go uh, uh, towards 41 uh, uh, some morning. Just try it because it's worth your life. You, you wait and you wait and you wait and you finally got a break and then you stop in the center and you look this way and you try to get a break and, and go out worth your life. What's 175 more apartments going to do? M Mr. Butt has, a, has a, a right to sell his land and I, he should sell the land to a developer who wants to develop something that's going to benefit our community and not screw it up. You disallow it one time. The planning board on October 5th, they voted it down. Please vote it down again and get rid of these apartments and let's have something there that's going to benefit us and help our community. Because everything that we own, my wife and I, everything that we own, we're just regular people. I work for, my, for myself all my life. The only thing that we had for assets besides our social security check, was that little house and what was in it. And it was three feet of, four feet of water in the street and a foot and a half of water in our house. And we still haven't recovered. We don't need any more aggravation. Please disallow this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ann Jordan, followed by Ken Miller, and then Carolyn Price. Do you mind if we come up together? You can always take one of us. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. I'm Ann Jordan, and I'm a resident of Northport for seven years. My husband and I retired here because uh, we love Northport. Have you been Ann, sworn? Can you say that you've been sworn, please? I'm sorry. Have you been sworn? Uh, yes, on the card. Yes. yes. I'd like to just speak on behalf of Choice for Talks. Uh, Ken Miller also is here. He is our uh, Marine mm -hmm. in charge for this program. And I wanted to just thank uh, Mr. Butts and Christian Dando for their generosity. They have three out of four years in Northport have donated their use of their space, uh, never, never charging us for anything. 
Uh, we certainly appreciate it. We service over 5,000 kids throughout the Northport community every year with gifts for Christmas. They have been an outstanding partner for us, and we're very, very grateful. Ken? My name is Ken Miller. Um, I've lived in the city of Northport for 25 years. I've been active with, per se, Toys for Tots, a good majority of that. Um, I don't know if anybody in the city remembers uh, Zuma Solero from Northport Social Services. Sure. Yes, we do. Back in those sir, days, it was sir, called. Have, have you been sworn? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. If you yeah. would just repeat it into the mic so we have it for the record. Correct. Yes, I have been sworn. In. Great. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, um, way back when Zuma Solero was uh, with the Northport Social Services, we used to do the Northport Toy Chest. And that's how far back I've been in, involved with the Northport to, uh, Toys for Tots and the Toy Chest. And as Ann mentioned, uh, Mr. Butt, um, over the years, um, because of the, the increase in population in Northport, um, Toys for Tots has more people coming to us for help. And uh, as Ann said, we helped, we helped uh, over 5,000 children last year, over 600 families. And um, it's all because of Mr. Butt. Because if we didn't have a place this year, we wouldn't have been, we, Northport probably wouldn't have had a Toys for Tots this year if it wasn't for him letting us into his place and giving us free space. And like Ian said, he's done it for the last, in the last four years, he's done it three out of the four years. So we just, we're just here for goodwill. We're not taking sides. He does good for the people in Northport. Thank you. Ken Miller? That's me. Okay. Carolyn Price? I wanted to speak on the general no's on showing up to the city, not on this particular matter. Delane Ellison? The city clerk, will you please state into the record that the public commenter you called has declined comment? Carolyn Price has declined comment on this item. Hello, my name is Delane Ellison. Uh, I have been sworn. I live in, uh, on Pocatello, actually. Uh, Pocatello and Kayla. Uh, the road and water people don't seem to be doing their jobs. I wonder how much they get paid. Uh, this area that they're talking about uh, is a really nice area, and it's our trees. You have cut down a billion trees in the last 10 years, and I just saw another billion over by the Walmart. Uh, it, my heart breaks because I can't breathe, and a lot of people are not going to be able to breathe if we keep cutting down our trees. I love the reinforced bike thing that the kids brought up. That was awesome. Um, I'd like to see on paper how many... Uh, ground owls or gopher total turtles, uh, scrub jays that have been displaced because of all of this growth that we seem to be having. I would like to see you get complicated. Let's uh, incorporate the thousands of acres that have been cleared uh, in Port Charlotte on Toledo Blade. That, they built roads. They put roads there. There's nothing there. You want to build something, build it over there. This would be a really nice place for a Frisbee golf park. I think we should stop cutting down all our trees. Thank you. Bruce Farrell, followed by Kathy Del Sosta and Pam Tokars. My name is Bruce Farrell, and I've been sworn for all the same reasons that everybody's talked about. I just don't think this project fits the neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood. We've been here for 10, 11 years. There's nothing this tall anywhere. Um, it just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> it doesn't make sense in my mind. Aside from the traffic issues and everything everybody else has stated, I respectfully ask you to 
deny this permit. Thank you. I'm Kathy Del Sesto, and I've been sworn. And I reiterate what everyone else has said. I think the project is inappropriate for the area. Um, I know we've always talked about the flooding in the past. The flooding is a huge issue. And it's not just when we have a hurricane. It's all of the time. And I understand they're going to modify for a 100-year storm. However, I still don't think that's sufficient, given the fact that even when it just rains, the area floods. Taking away permeable area and replacing it with concrete and or asphalt is not going to be helpful to the neighborhood. And so I urge you to deny the existence of this building or these buildings. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pam Brokars, and I have been sworn. Uh, I know you guys know me from other projects in the area. The, the central theme about this one is Northport needs more jobs. This is your opportunity to bring more jobs to Northport. And I know the owner, Mr. Butts, has worked with some healthcare uh, businesses to try and get them to come in and has not success. Uh, the issue with that that I have is those are mostly commercial and those need exposure. So they are going to want to be on 41. But there's plenty of other office jobs that don't need that exposure. And I'm going to use my engineering firms, accounting firms, technical firms, plenty of other high paying jobs. And that's what Northport needs. When I first came to Northport, I didn't, I couldn't work in a retail job. I've worked in retail, nothing wrong with retail. I've done it for 17 years. But I'm older now. I can't stand for eight hours a day. So I need an office job. I had to go to Sarasota to work. So now I'm one of those people that has to transport out of town. This is another opportunity to be able to bring more jobs into Northport. The apartments that he's building, every time you turn around, it seems like there's another development coming in front of you guys for more multifamily homes. I know we need more multifamily homes, and that's the goal of the ULDC rewrite, is to stop with the single family, increase the commercial and the other um, affordable housing units. But I found an old ordinance that was that started that stated back in 1997 that the city, city has recognized the need to increase the commercial. So this has been going on for 26 years. So it's time for us to start with more office jobs, keep this commercial. And you've got plenty of other multifamily homes. You've got the Star Farms coming and that whole corridor up in Toledo Blades. There, I think there was another project that just was uh, approved off of Panacea with uh, more multifamily homes that are being brought in. And then so, but these people here, when they bought their homes, they expected it to be developed as an office, not an apartment building. So with that being said, you've got the elementary school kids that stood in front of you today with a proposal. This is going to be one step in you guys helping them meet their proposal with bringing more jobs. Thank you. Anna Klofthammer, okay. followed by Kurt Loomis and Linda Grother. Anna Klofthammer, I have been sworn, and I am a 27-year resident of uh, Country Club Ridge. Um, contrary to my neighbors, I believe that this residential housing um, proposal is congruent with Country Club Ridge. Subdivision, Freedom Bible Church, and Northport Pines as neighbors. The OPI with its allowance of seven story buildings that according to state regulations, the city of Northport cannot uh, require that they aesthetically fit into our neighborhood anymore. Um, once again, re reiterates the fact that a residential subdivision here is fitting with us. Um, in regards to our needing more commercial, Quite frankly, you all had that opportunity with the subdivision out east of Toledo Blade where you could have gotten 75,000 acres and you didn't do it. You blew it. So, um, but that doesn't mean that, this, that I want this development to go ahead 
as proposed. Um, yes, I love the fact that they're proposing open green space and that they're um, preserving established trees. However, I do believe it should be returned to the development and planning department because for one thing, the developer told me a year ago that the staff instructed them to design the property with the driveway on the McKibben, um, which is the south side of the property, in alignment with Freedom Bible Church's driveway. Well, adjacent to Freedom Bible Church's driveway is Peace River Road. Peace River Road, as you all know, because you were there for the um, grand opening, is an OPI already, and it has the, I think it's a Child Protective Services in there. Eventually, that property will be finished being developed. So you're creating a logistical traffic nightmare, because now you have, you have Freedom Bible Church driveway right across from this new subdivision if it goes through, and then you're going to have Peace River. The flow of traffic is really going to be messed up. In my opinion, you should close down the Freedom Bible Church's driveway, line up this subdivision's driveway with Peace River Road, and then you have a legitimate four-way in intersection. Another concern that I discussed with the developer last year was I believe that a fence should be placed along the east side of the property that runs along the drainage ditch. I don't know how many of you people remember about 15 years ago when a North Fork Pines resident wandered off, fell into the drainage ditch, and subsequently died. And I would hate to see that happen with young children in this. My last concern is the elevation. Um, Heron Creek apartments were elevated so high, I really pray that you guys are not going to allow this subdivision to be raised to that same level because then you're putting us in a bowl. That drainage ditch will not be able to handle the excess water, and the Public Works Department does not maintain the drainage ditch or our canals well enough to get the water away from us. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, ma'am. Kurt Loomis does not wish to speak, but he does oppose this agenda item. Linda Grother, followed by Omar Butt, and Chris Demna. I am Linda Grother, and I have not been sworn. Can you raise your right hand? Okay. You swear or affirm that you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Well, I don't know. I think this is my third or fourth time here and hoping that this project does not go ahead. I had to drive to Venice yesterday and I came down 41 and wondered if I did the right thing because of through Welling, pa Welling Park. There is only one lane half the time, but I did it. And it went really smoothly. And then I came to our loads. <coughs> And I was in the left-hand lane because I was going to turn left at Sumter. And I only got through the intersection when traffic stopped. And it took three lights down at Sumter for me to be able to get down to the turning lane to turn left. So that 175 apartments is going to be a lot of cars. And contrary to being told that OPI would be far more, but they wouldn't come and go all at the same time. And that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. 175 apartments, you're going to have 300 cars. And 300 cars are going to leave in the morning when everybody leaves to go to work. And they're going to come home in the evening when everybody comes home. And it's going to make our situation really worse. And we were there first, guys. <laughs> we don't deserve this. And I know I had another thought, but after listening to so many things here today, I've sort of lost them. But I do want to mention that watching the birds behind my house, because I face the defunct golf course, I feel so sorry for them. I see the sandhill cranes. They seem lost. But every time, we're watching the trees being torn down. That's, that's our entertainment at night now. We get to watch all those trees on the golf course just be plowed down so quick. You wouldn't believe it. And the birds and the animals. They're just more victims, but I hope we have some compassion for them. And then seeing what's going on out by price, Lordy, we have way too many. And I hope we don't have an economy crash like we did in 2008 and 9 when you couldn't rent anything because we're going to have a lot of things that aren't going to be rented. Thank you.
Hi, good afternoon, Omar Ba, and I have been sworn. Um, you can probably hear I'm an adopted son of this city, having been coming here for about 34 and a half years. I'm 35 years old now, so you can see how young I was when I first started coming to Northport and to Pocatello Avenue in general. Most of my childhood photos are in the area and very few in London where I, where I did partly grow up. And it's lovely to hear the impassion and, and passion from the local residents. Um, but what I was very disturbed, what I have been very disturbed to hear is some of the, um, you know, incorrect or made up facts, some of the accusations against um, the commission and the staff, which I find quite disturbing in this wonderful democracy of ours, because this commission is so transparent compared to some I've been used to in my life of asking people and talking <coughs> and having facts from the city staff, pure, cold, hard facts. And to wave newspapers around accusing them of corruption, I think is is, is rather uncalled for actually in this whole context. And we should stick to facts and we should stick to, I agree, job creation. Um, I am a, I am a, I'm a businessman by background. I'm a banker. I work with some of the most successful people in Florida, uh, thankfully, people who employ hundreds of thousands of people in this state. And I can tell you the one thing they look at when they first ask um, to move businesses or people to a town, they say, what's the housing situation like? Can I move young professionals into this city to have them work in the offices we then later build. So when you hear from the city staff that really it's only 1% of Northport that has been uh, multifamily and that is going up as multifamily, the cold hard fact, not the impassioned, in, incorrect facts that have been, that have been bandied around, then, then you see the problem immediately in creating jobs, jobs, jobs. My, my clients will say, what is the housing? Do we have multifamily? high-end multifamily for my people to move into? And I would say, no. Unfortunately, in Northport right now, we don't have that. And they'd say, OK, well, well, we'll find somewhere else to put our offices. So I think it's very important, and I'm glad you're all thinking about jobs, because jobs in, in, in this state, in this country, in this world, are not going to be created um, necessarily by physical locations anymore. They're going to be created in people's homes, working remotely, working for technology businesses. When the doctors and nurses of Sarasota Memorial move in and live in this area, they will be living in their apartments and creating biotech ventures and home health services. And they will run it from their homes and from the office, the substantial 17% you heard as a fact, office space in this area. And that's where jobs will be created. And I know change is difficult. We all see it. I see it. But as somebody who has chosen this city because of the way it's been run over, since 1959 and will continue to be run, hopefully, for the next 100 years, you know, I think we should all thank the staff of the city. We should thank the developers who are creating these, these housing in the city for jobs to come and really not make baseless accusation and waving newspapers around because we know journalists are not always correct. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Shh, we could be quiet, please. Hello, my name is Chris Dunda and I've been sworn. I moved to Country Club Ridge 34 years ago with my mom. My mom still lives on Hartsick Lane in Country Club Ridge. And to what Omar said, I've seen a lot of change and a lot of growth in the city in the years that I've worked and lived here. Good morning, distinguished board members, citizens, and staff. I work for Northport Retirement Center is located at 4950 Pocatello Avenue. I'm here today to talk about the proposed granting of the special exception of the property located at McKibben and Pocatello and Sumter Corridor. We understand that the development of the parcel can have lasting benefits for our entire community. Multifamily development with a mixed use is needed on the Sumter Corridor with the growing demands of professionals moving to the city. Sumter Boulevard is an arterial road that many utilize in the city. With the approved Sarasota Memorial Hospital in the near future, the Northport campus that we constructed on the corner of I-75 in Sumter, there's a growing need for housing and options for housing for the citizens of Northport. The new hospital will be a training hospital. High impact jobs such as doctors, Nurses, radiologists, and support staff will be employed at the hospital. They're going to need a place to live that is in close proximity to their work. It will be a benefit for the city of Northport 
and the community with the additional citizens that will be living in the city, participating in shopping, dining, and many of the other business services offered. The additional tax revenue will benefit the citizens and will help with the cost of future services such as water, sanitation, building roads, refurbishing our bridges, and maintaining our park systems. Furthermore, approving the resolution granting a special exception to allow multifamily with a mixed use on this property is more in line with the zoning of nearby properties and is in consistent with the neighborhoods developed in the area. Northport Retirement supports the application to approve the special exception for the parcel of property located at Pocatello and Sumter Boulevard. I urge you to approve the proposed special exception. And from recent meetings and discussions with my neighbors, I know their opinions are shared by many who have not managed to attend meetings or write letters or emails. Thank you for your time, consideration, and approval. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, city clerk. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. <clears throat> Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, Mayor. I'll just um, say we'll, we'll do 10 minutes each. I suspect there might be a lot of yeah, questions and comments. I'll probably have to have a we'll couple of rounds. Staff asked, answered a lot of my questions. Um, during the presentation, I'm not sure, I think staff and the applicant brought up about the ad valorem taxes that would be generated as it remains as a vacant property. I think it was like $2,000. And then if it was as presented, the ad valorem would be about $150,000. But nobody mentioned what the ad valorem would be if it stayed OPI even at maximum or at half maximum. What would be the OPI return for ad valorem taxes? Staff, does anyone want to take a crack at that? Just an estimate, obviously. Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of Development Services. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, we would um, need to be provided with a building square footage and an OPI use in order to prepare that calculation of what the non ad valorem tax revenue would be post development because it would be based on the use and the building square footage. But it should be noted that um, a number of the uses in OPI could be nonprofits. Uh, child services, for example, is nonprofit. They pay no ad valorem taxes. Churches are permitted in OPI, they would pay zero uh, taxes. Um, the the um, the OPI properties in the area, there is a nursing home and a private school that have contributed, but without having um, all of the parameters in which to plug into the formula, we are unable to provide that, that figure for you. That's fair, thank you. Um, go ahead if you'd like to try yes. and take a crack uh, well, at it. <laughs> uh, two things, I think uh, Lori made a good point, I was gonna point out that you know, the Child Could Protection you Center, name, sir? Uh, that's adjacent to this property in Freedom Bible Church. I'm sorry, can you state your name for the record? Peter Van Busker, and that you've, Family Warren Association, yeah. City uh, Attorney was trying. <laughs> yeah, so um, the Child Protection Center pays $500 a year in tax. The Freedom Bible Church pays $600 of tax. Both of those properties are commercially zoned. So Lori made a good point. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Butt told me that um, based on his experience with all those properties, uh, he had 240,000 square foot of just commercial you'd probably be somewhere in the forty to $50,000 range. Correct. And with the potential rezone that is on the ULDC, and I know that's not part of this discussion, I am fully aware of that, but it, the potential is MX2 for this same property. It would not anymore be OPI. It would open it up for MX2 um, land uses. So I just want to throw that out if that rezoning does go through, not only for you guys, but for... Um, the residents. Um, one of my questions has to do with the acreage of the OPI site. I know that's kind of part of this special exception. 
um, for the development? What is that acreage? So what we've done, Peter Van Busker again, I've been sworn. Um, what we showed on the site plan was the area associated with the commercial. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about, well, the commercial building is only 5,000 square foot footprint, which is this you know, small fraction of the land area, which is correct, but we have two stories. We have to have the parking to support it. We have to have open space, buffers. We have to have stormwater management. We have to have an entryway into the facility. So we captured a portion of all those things and associated that with the commercial property. So you can't just look at the commercial pieces, just the building. It has all the support elements that go along. If it was a standalone two acre piece of property, we'd still have to have the parking, the stormwater, the buffering, and the open space. I understand. I'm, I'm asking what is the acreage of that OPI property oh, two area? Acres. I'm sorry. Two acres. Yes. And that two acres include, does it include like the fitness center, the leasing office space? Does it include the pool area, the, the uh, other amenities? No, that's in addition to. Okay. That's all associated with the multifamily. Okay, so the stormwater, let's talk about that stormwater. Because in January when you were here, and I understand, totally different application, um, the dry detention was part of the apartments and you have the exact approximately same size of stormwater area for office but that stormwater was needed for the apartments so yes. to, to claim that all of that stormwater for the dry detention area is all because of the office is is disingenuous <laughs> so let me get to the site plan here. And so you, are, you can see there's a very small portion of the lake mm -hmm. that is being associated with the mm -hmm. um, commercial, correct? A much larger portion would be associated with multifamily. We could draw this line down here, giving some of the dry to multifamily and a little bit more of the wet to the commercial, but it's, it's, it's all relative. Um, it just, this is where we drew the line. We, we put this associated with the uh, commercial because it's right there. The dry part of the retention basically is uh, referred to as more overflow. It's for attenuation. So as the pond is filling up, it can overflow back into that dry area and give us a little bit more storage area. So whether I take it from this larger lake area and associate it with the commercial or I take it, you know, all from here and associate it with the commercial, it's all part of the same system all tied together. Right. So the wet detention pond has an outflow into the canal that's adjacent. Correct. I thought our code required no impediment. I don't know what other word to use. Off site. And if, if, if this site is, has a detention pond and then there's an outflow in case that floods over, it goes into the canal. I thought that wasn't allowed by our code. Um, no, it is. We're, our design criteria is to have our pre-development off-site flow rate matched post-development. We can't exceed pre-development. So the idea is whatever the systems around us are receiving today, we can't give it anymore. So we have to have an outfall from our pond, but we, we, we have a, a weir system that restricts the amount of flow that can come out so that it mimics pre-development conditions. And our, our dry retention area is connected to the wet. So, and you know, one of the benefits of having the dry is like there, the commercial parking lot flows into the dry. There can be some percolation first, but then it goes into the wet and then out to the <coughs> ditch, but all again, based on pre-development conditions. Okay. Um, and I think this might be for staff. In the backup material, there's an exhibit E and Exhibit E is talking about the development master plan. It's also mentioned in the staff report, but I don't see us approving a development master plan. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the backup materials. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. The special exception application requires the applicant to provide a development master plan or a concept plan as part of their special <coughs> exception application. If the special <coughs> exception is approved, the next step in the process will be a formal development master plan petition. If the commission approves the special exception today, it is approving the multifamily use, not the specific development master plan site plan that's provided as part of the packet. A future development petition for DMP would come back before the city commission, wherein additional conversations about um, site design could be brought into the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, it was mentioned by a public commenter about the roadway reconfiguration. Um, if you look at the McKibben entrance, it does go into the church's alignment of the church parking lot. And I'm curious, why would that ever be acceptable when you have Peace River as a road that should probably align it? Um, I, I don't know if it's too late or what, and maybe this is something if this gets approved, it goes to DMP and would be looked at more closely, but it just doesn't make logical sense to have the road configuring with the church's parking lot. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was brought up. Mayor, I believe I am very close to my 10 minute mark, so I'll yield. You are very close. I was going to give you one more, but that's okay. I'll, I'll come back I'll to need you. need a second round. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor White. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question about, I guess this is maybe for staff, um, one of their answers, staff finding. It was mention of um, that the comprehensive plan does not define or specify the applicability of the term maximized economic benefit. So um, I just want to be sure that that means we don't really have a formula for that, like you just can't plug in some numbers and say, okay, this is going to give us maximum economic benefit. This is not going to give us maximum economic benefit. Um, yes, Vice Mayor White. The comp plan nor the ULDC defines maximized economic benefit. So it begs the question, is that maximizing economic benefit to the city of Northport as a municipal corporation in the way of taxes and fees? Does it mean maximize economic benefit to the developer or the property owner? Does it mean maximize economic benefit to the community as a whole um, in providing places for them to live, work, and play? Um, so without a definition, it's difficult to hone in on what maximizing economic benefit looks like. What, is, what does it really mean? Right. mean? right, and there's there's other um, you know there's other qualifying terms in that goal that can be evaluated, but they're not given weight. Um, the future land use policy doesn't indicate that um, you know providing for natural enjoyment is more important than maximizing economic benefit. And it also comes back to, as an OPI use, this site could very easily be developed for a nonprofit business, community, um, social services type use and be exempt or partially exempt from ad valorem taxes. Okay. And then uh, while we're on the OPI thing, um, this, you, we could have 70 foot buildings um, on this property with how it's zoned now. Yes, ma'am. And is it standard that there's usually 5,000 square feet per story? Is that how? Am I right with that, or is that, does that just depend on? It depends on the parking requirements, the open space requirements, the buffering requirements, the area required for surface water management. Um, you can, you know, 
throw out there as a, you know, a general rule, you're looking at probably 30% of your site dedicated to those uses. But when you're looking at a 70-story building, you might need a lot more than 30% for your service parking, unless you were to put it in the bottom floors of the building itself. Um, so the engineer might be able to give you a little bit, you know, more information, but they're not limited to a 500 5,000 square foot footprint for the building on this site. That is simply what the applicant envisions working well in this particular mixed use development. Okay, and then did we talk about how many of these buildings could be put on the site? That the site could accommodate how many of those 70 foot buildings? Is it just one? Oh, no, ma'am. It could accommodate multiple, 480, over 485,000 square feet of OPI uses could be permissible on the site. And it could be in multiple buildings, 70-foot um, buildings or varying building heights on the site. Okay. And then is it in the code that our, if, this is, if this is developed as per the OPI current zoning um, that it does not have to be harmonious with the surrounding neighborhoods? There are no specific criteria that are called out per se as an evaluation criteria, but there are setback requirements, there are buffering requirements, there are open space requirements, and all of those within the code are designed to provide for compatibility between land uses. Okay, but I was looking specifically at that word harmonious. Is that only because this is a special exception that that word is in there? Yes, ma'am. So otherwise, it's not really a factor. I mean, it's not in it's not in the language. It's not in anything else. Is that Correct. Right? It's a the the harmonious terminology is specific to the um, required findings for a special <coughs> exception, not for a regular site plan review. Okay. Um, hold on. Would, and I was curious about the, um, I don't know if anybody can answer this, about the PZAP. Um, because this, when this came before us before, it was um, not, a, I this right? not approved by them. Do I have that correct? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I'm hesitant oh, to speak of the prior thing? petition because it is not what's before you today. Right. Um, and as a matter of fact, testimony related to that really shouldn't be considered. This is a new application. Right. Um, I can tell you that the vote at PZAB was four to two to recommend the city commission deny. And uh, one of the speakers uh, referred to Nita Hester, the chair of PZAB, who lives in the neighborhood. And I can share with you that Nita Hester um, did not vote with the majority of the board, and she found that the evidence supported um, this request meeting the comprehensive plan, um, as well as, um, I apologize, I can't remember which board member voted with um, Mrs. Hester. Um, at the PZAB meeting, there was a lot of emotion um, being communicated from the citizenry as far as the change that any development um, would result into their neighborhood, um, much like the testimony you heard today about, um, you know, being concerned about development in general and how that's changing our city. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm sorry for bringing that up, but that that was not, I just was curious why it was yes and then, and then no, but that's okay. Um, okay, answered that. Sorry. Um, sorry, Commissioner Emmerich, I can, I can feel your vibes coming this way. <laughs> Do you want me to come back to you? No, I think, I think I'm okay. Oh, I just wanted to, uh, to point out again, it's not really a question, but I appreciate the, um, us knowing the history of the other OPI parcels, because I really didn't know how many we had in the city. To me, that seems like a really strange zoning designation? I don't know, maybe it's not, but um, but we have eight, four have been developed, and it was interesting to see how they've been developed thus far, and that we still have four, including this one, that nothing's happened, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's it for now, Mayor, thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Stokes. 
<clears throat> Ms. Lawrence, uh, could you tell me or could tell us um, with the ULDC rewrite, uh, with our planned ULDC rewrite, what would this property's designation be? Will it stay OPI? Will it become mixed use one, mixed use two? Okay. Um, OPI is a zoning classification that is being proposed for phasing out and the new zoning map. Now, cu the current draft, which um, has not yet been approved by the city commission, the current draft does propose this property as MX2, I believe, which would allow a mixture of non-residential uses and residential uses per the current draft at a maximum of 65% residential. Could, could. Now, all of that would be subject to finalization of comp plan amendments, approval of those, mm -hmm. approval of the rezone, right. and the rewrite. Right. Could you cite a number of MX2 uses that potentially might end up on this property if nothing were developed now and the rezoning was to actually take place and be approved and this was to become an MX2 piece of property. Uh, yes, sir, I can, but I'll need you to bear with me for a moment. Sure, I don't I, trust I my memory. Our use table does in, include over 50 different types of uses or somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so I'm not going to list through all of them, but um, assisted living facilities would be permitted, multifamily, um, animal boarding, uh, animal daycare. Bars or nightclubs, banks, auto repair shops. Any kind of industrial, light industrial? Um, commercial and some, you know, light manufacturing type uses as well as residential. Um, you know, it would include uh, auto dealerships. It would include um, hotels. It would include... Uh, some light industrial that would be anything that doesn't have any effects outside of the building in which the use is conducted. So I hope Thank that Thank you, Miss Laurie. That, that sort of sends the message. Um, next question. Um, it's been stated a couple times, but let's restate it once again. Is the ask here for a zoning redesignation? No. This okay. The special exception is available to any property in OPI. Um, they have a right under our code to request any use that's not specifically prohibited in that district. And am I correct? This application is for a special exception. It is not an approval or an application to approve a master development plan in any way, shape, or form. That's yet to be put together and brought before this commission to look at and decide whether or not it makes sense, it doesn't, to make recommendations back to the developer on. This is exclusively an application for a special exception, which staff, in its professional opinion, has indicated is compliant with the comprehensive plan in the ULDC. Is that a fair statement? That is correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Commissioner Emrich. Martin. 
The song? Yeah. All right. Uh, there now we go. it is. He muted me. Question I have is if it were to be switched over to MX2 with the rewrite and everything like that, would this project then be acceptable under those guidelines? Would is this just inevitable by doing it earlier rather than later? Would this still be able to come with the 65% residential? It would be able to come with 65% residential if the rezone to MX2 were approved. Um, under the proposed regulations, um, we do have a maximum cap on the 65% for residential, and there is yet to be incorporated some kind of minimum non-residential percentage based on some um, legal review and legal advice that staff is awaiting. Um, but a project similar to what's being presented to you today could be approved under the new rewrite, and it may actually be more intense than what is being proposed today. Right. No, I understand that. And I just wanted to get that out there since you brought it up, since Commissioner Stokes had brought that up. And I know we had another project before that was denied, and now they're sort of going through another process because they didn't want to get what they wanted to get after that fact. So um, I'm just saying we have to look at this on the warrants and merits that it is and what could possibly come. So that's all I had. Thank you. I guess um, I'll go. I have a couple of questions. Um, I know we haven't completed our housing needs assessment yet for the city, but if I could ask you to take out your crystal ball, knowing what kind of development is planned for the city over the next few years, do we have enough higher density housing or we 25% there, 50%, just a rough swag. We do not currently have enough multifamily housing at varying levels of affordability um, to provide for the city at build out. Uh, we do not currently have um, vacant multifamily units or a substantial number of vacant multifamily units awaiting tenancy. We have affordable housing developments where people are on waiting lists to enter those. Um, if I had to, if I had to guess, I would say that we're probably not at not at 25% of our multifamily housing product needs right now, based on where the city will be at build out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one other question, in the ULDC rewrite, a lot of work has gone into um, revising the lighting requirements and really creating a much stricter standard for lighting requirements, as I recall, much more focused and not spilling into the surrounding area. I know we're not at the master plan point yet, but again, in your professional opinion, would we be going for the rewrite standards um, by the time this project comes back? I think it's very possible that this project, if it's approved for special exception today, will apply for development master plan approval prior to the ULDC adoption. Mm -hmm. um, however, I can inform you that uh, staff has adopted an administrative policy regarding lighting standards that default to the Florida Department of Transportation Green Book standards because the foot candle lighting levels and the Florida Green Book standard are lower than what our ULDC currently mandates. Um, so that option would be available to the developer and they may um, be willing to um, agree to additional considerations as far as uh, lighting levels and uh, foot candle levels at the property line to help minimize any concerns that the neighbors might have about light spillage, but that would be a conversation at the development master plan phase. 
Right, because that was one of the concerns brought up today um, among the community members here, and so I think it would be a great accommodation. Um, I would be very supportive of implementing a higher standard lighting plan for this project. Uh, that's it for me for now, Commissioner McDowell. Will the OPI be built at the same time as the residential? Built, not just the slab, but built vertically. Um, I would default to the applicant, but um, as you are well aware, our development orders are are valid for a period of two years, and a project that is approved as a mixed-use development would have two years to build um, unless that development order was extended. Um, and I hope Mr. Van Buskirk can speak a little bit more to their plans. I think uh, Peter Van Buskirk again, um, Kimberly Horn, Evans Horn. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's going to depend, depend on a user we might get for that OPI I'm building. Sorry. It would depend on the user and their timing for the OPI building. The, the site would be developed in its entirety. So basically, there would be a pad created there so that the development could come in and basically get a building permit to go up. They wouldn't have to go through any additional uh, approval processes. You know, should it go beyond the two years, as Lori said, we would ask for an extension of the um, uh, development order in order to keep the ability to build the OPI. Um, and if, as the special exceptions approved with OPI, we could not do anything else <laughs> there. So, uh, but the intent would be to develop the entire site with the OPI ready to go. Can we, and this might be a city attorney question, can we make it contingent if we were to approve the special exception? Can we make it contingent to require the OPI be built vertically, not just a pad? at the same time as the residential. That way then our tax base, it, it's there. Commissioner, my recommendation. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, city attorney. My recommendation is that you not add any requirements to a special exception approval that are not uh, identified in the code. That's Peter Van Buster again. I might add to that, um, not knowing the end user, we don't know the format of that building. If it's a, if it's a medical office building, it's going to have a certain format. Uh, we might have a portico sheriff or an entryway so people can be dropped off that might need assistance getting into the building. If it's a bank, it's going to need a drive through. I mean, there's so many different things that that building could become. It would be difficult to put up a vertical structure and then go out and find the user because it might not fit them. Interesting. Um, policy 1.1, um, it's stated multiple times in the staff report that it's a guideline that the residential use should not exceed 50% of the floor area ratio. Um, it also states that the floor area ratio is what, again, for this property as being presented? Uh, the floor area ratio maximum is mm -hmm. 0 0.95. The proposed is well below the maximum at 44.8%, so 0.44. 0.44 percent? 0.44 FAR. Thank you. All right. What? And, and uh, my apologies, ma'am. And as to the guideline, if the comprehensive plan language and policy 1.1 utilize the word required, utilize the word shall not ex exceed, um, then that would be enforceable. Unfortunately, the, the use of the word guideline lends to best, best practices rather than regulations that we can enforce hard and fast on a property owner. Um, I can rest assured that when we bring the uh, future land use um, element amendments back to the commission, there will be no use of the word guideline anywhere in those documents. 
And, and I appreciate that, but the, the entire purpose of a comp plan is to kind of provide a roadmap or a vision of the city's future. And it's full of guidelines and recommendations and uh, objectives and goals. It's very subjective because this is the vision of the future that we are hoping to get. So guideline to me is kind of harmonious with goals and objectives that are used throughout the entire um, comp plan. Um, I am, what is being presented today is so minusculely changed from what was being presented in January. They basically took the dog park in January and turned it into an office. So it's it's a two-story basic Dollar General property on an 11-acre site. And for that to be the only office space that is being given as a as a olive branch, I guess, to allow 175 luxury apartments to be built goes against what the Kamoin study has. And in the Kamoin study, and it's funny that it's tied at the same meeting, I'm going to read something that's in the Kamoin study. And it says, some types of higher value developments, such as a mixed use downtown or class A office space may not yet be viable in the market as a private venture. However, as Northport becomes increasingly attractive as a place to invest, the city should take steps to ensure that well-situated plots of land remain available to accommodate investments when the market is ready. And to turn over 10-ish acres for residential and remove it from the tax base potential for development to me, it, it, it goes right back to what we said in January. There, this is office. There is a potential for development to increase our tax base. And this is not fitting with what the Kamoin study says. This is not fitting with our entire rezone of the city that has been presented multiple times in the past few months. Um, this proposal, if it had higher OPI or space, I could absolutely agree with. But keeping it 175 apartments and a postage stamp on a 10 acre or 11 acre parcel, it, it, it defies what we are ultimately trying to do to increase our tax base and maximize our economic benefit. Commissioner Stokes. I don't know who this question might be best directed to, but um, the issue of concurrent building of the office space and the residential space, is that something that were this application for the special exception to be met and a master development plan to be presented to the commission? Does the commission have the ability to require, if it so chooses, as a body, require concurrent development of residential and the non-residential office building at the same time, or roughly the same time, so that we don't have a situation where, very simply, the residential gets built, a slab goes down, and for God knows how many years, mm -hmm. it just sits there waiting for someone to wander in and decide to put up an office building. That Could we force that to be done? Is that within the commission's auspices or authority? The commission can condition development master plan approvals. Um, the and any conditions that the commission imposes on a development master plan um, in a situation in which the applicant is not agreeable to the condition um, could, could potentially result in a challenge. Um, as to you know, the question of law, can you require that condition? I would have to defer to the 
city attorney. And again, we do have pending legal requests regarding percentage of um, non-residential development and mandates there too, as well as timing. Um, I think that if a, con if a development order is issued for a mixed use development, it's in effect for two years. It can be extended um, either due to state of emergency and tolling of time um, or at an applicant's request based on um, you know, a justifiable reason. So within now, a two-year period. Right. So if the development started. was not completed and the development order expired and they were not compliant with their development order, then that would be actionable um, through code enforcement for noncompliance with a development order. Um, I would also like to state that, you know, I think that, that once a development is actually um, entitled on the property, then that would give the property owner an opportunity to market that as a slab ready development. The only thing the end user would need to do is apply for a building permit. And when there's no uncertainty in the development process, i.e. public hearings before um, appointed boards and elected officials, that makes for a more desirable location for a lot of businesses that are ready to go, but not ready to go through the months long process and uncertainty of um, the development approval process. Thank you, Ms. Burns. The only other question, um, and this is for city attorney, um, am I correct in that this commission is prohibited from considering in any way, shape or form the earlier application that was submitted before this commission by the staff? <coughs> Yes, sir, that is correct. Thank you. No, no other questions. Okay, I think I, I'll take a shot. Um, this is a really tough one for me. I've been extremely vocal and supportive of increasing our commercial <coughs> footprint and bringing jobs to the city. It's why I ran for this position. But everything is a balance. And as I look at this situation, I, I have serious concerns about the OPI designation on both sides of that fence. First, what I've heard from the dissenters and the public commenters today, that most of the concern seems to be more around quality of life. Um, in having the development being not congruous with the development around, it being an eyesore, it being too bright, it impacting traffic. And yet, listening to today, today's conversation, let's say we could wave a magic wand and bring in a totally office project. You know, we've learned today that, that those buildings, and there could be multiple buildings, and they could be 70 feet high, currently allowed in an OPI designation, I think that would have a much more serious quality of life impact on the surrounding communities than the proposal here today. On the other side of the fence, um, having just that little bit of commercial as part of the project I, I like where the city is trying to go in its ULDC rewrite. And if we had 35% commercial on this site, it would be a very easy decision for me to make. But my other concern, third concern with the OPI designation, and it was mentioned earlier in the proceedings, we could have a government use come in, we could have an organizational use come in, both of which would not pay any taxes at all. So on the city's side, there's risk <laughs> to not moving forward. You know, the exposure, um, if, if a totally um, office application came in, the impact on the surrounding communities, the risk to the city of, of losing that property totally from property tax, um, this, this is really a conundrum. And balancing present and 
present concerns and, and what might happen in the future is causing me to go against my initial reaction, which is commercial, 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 and say that maybe what we have in front of us today is pretty OK in terms of what might be able to happen in the future, both in terms of impact on the community and both in terms of potential revenue loss for the city. But this is really a tough one. Um, and and a, in thinking about it, depending on the hour, back and forth, <laughs> back and forth, um, but really a lot of the information shared today has sort of helped me make that decision. And sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Um, anyway, so, so that's really all my comment. Uh, Vice Mayor, you're up next, and then Commissioner McDowell will come back to you. Thank you. Yes, um, I really am impressed with how many of you came out and that you're still here. You're still here <laughs> for all this time. Yes, but still. And I know what that's like because I've been in, in your seat. I've lived here for 32 years, and there's not a project that, that has come into the city that I was not vocal about. Um, every single development project. When I first moved here, the strip malls were the only thing along 41. Sumter and, and Southford didn't even go, didn't even cross 41. They were T intersections. So I was that vocal person that opposed a lot of the development <laughs> just for the sake of opposing development. Um, but I realized early on that wasn't logical and you had to determine what it was that you really didn't like and try to work towards getting that, what really bothered you about a project to make it more um, palatable for you. Um, for example, I remember when Sumter Green came into town, um, and that was not um, embraced by everybody. Um, but it came along, and here it's, you are today. And, um, and I also remember when there was a bank building that was proposed to be across the street from Sumter Green. I don't know if any of you lived here when that was happening uh, on the other side of Greenwood. There was a bank that was proposed to be there, and there was a lot of outcry from Sumter Green. Didn't want to have a drive through bank across the street. There's no bank there today. There's nothing there today. It's still undeveloped property. Um, so uh, echoing what the mayor said, um, you know, sometimes you have to kind of pick your poison or see what, what is uh, the best use of, of property. And again, I appreciate the fact that staff brought out that out of the eight OPI designations we have, only four have been developed. And some of them weren't even producing any, any taxes for us, if that's what we're saying. And they're certainly not producing a vast amount of jobs either. So, um, and this definitely will provide some diverse housing opportunities for people. Yes, that hospital is coming. I already know young people that work for Sarasota Memorial Hospital at Laurel Road, and um, they, are, they live elsewhere in the apartments because we don't have what they're looking for here. And I, I hate to see my neighbors go, my young neighbors, but that's where they're going mm -hmm. and because they don't want a single family house. And this is what's going to give it to them. So um, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm going to give Commissioner Emrich his second round, and then Commissioner McDowell will be back. Phil had two. Yeah, Phil's had two. We'll have Commissioner McDowell for her third, and then anyone else who needs to continue. Sure. Okay. Have at it. The one thing that I was listening to all the public speakers and, and the one lady got up there and she was talking about if it was just going to be OPI and then we've discovered that it could be multiple buildings, you know, 70 foot tall. And the statement that she had made was these people would be coming and going in various hours. To me, if you're in an office building, it's normally nine to five, eight to four you would have congestion of traffic at those two main comings and goings, in my opinion. 
and to find out that you could have multiple buildings, that could be a great big cluster in that area. And I have to agree with, with uh, the vice mayor on if we're looking at this area down the road, if there's traffic problems, the city's going to address those traffic problems. At this problem, at this point right now, we're not seeing any. But then the rezoning, like I asked that question was, we can be sitting here now saying no, but six months from now, it's gonna be a given and it could be worse than what we're getting right now. So it, it is a very tough decision. I sat out front earlier and I'm, I can feel everybody here as the community. I've been in this area 30 years. I know Country Club Bridge. And it's, it's very tough to have to make this decision, but you have to go with the evidence and you have to go through what everything's been presented and hope that you make the right decision. So that's all I got to add. Okay, thank you. You've had two. Commissioner McDowell, your third round. Thank you, Mayor. And whenever you're ready, I'll be happy to attempt a motion if nobody else beats me to it. Does anyone else have comments? I, I do have a comment, though. Okay, we'll go ahead and then Commissioner okay. Stokes. Um, the developer is asking the commission to approve a special exception. As long as we have reasons given by the outline in the ULDC, as to why we should not be approving a special exception. The testimony that I've heard today, there are reasons to not approve this. Um, they're asking for something that gives us no obligation to approve it, as long as we do have those reasons of denial. We as a city cannot continue to give away land designated for office or commercial or industrial for this residential type of development. And this is a luxury apartment um, development. There, there's very minimal affordability to a luxury apartment, just given the name. Luxury apartment does not scream affordable for the people that are going to be working at a training hospital. Um, I cannot approve this because it's giving away, yes, it's a small amount, 10 acres of land, but it is land that is extremely valuable for the future of our city. There are other locations that a, a multifamily can be built on, probably not owned by the applicant, I'll give him that. He owns this property, he's requesting to put apartments on it. This commission is under no obligation to give him that approval. There are reasons to deny this. And, and the whole purpose of the citywide rezoning is to create a more affordable tax base and, and create jobs and to give more opportunities for commercial property. But here, we're giving 10 acres for a residential that we keep saying we don't really need, even though it's single family, multi, single family residential. This, this is important to keep for when the right developer comes along or the right applicant that wants to buy his property to develop something there. I don't have a crystal ball and no, nobody on this dais does. What's before us is 175, um, apartments with a little postage stamp of 5,000 square feet, two-story building for our office. I can't approve it in good conscience. That's what's before us today. Okay, Commissioner Stokes, when you're done with your comments, we're going to go back to closing arguments before we entertain any motions. So if you could keep it brief, I sir, that would be great. I can keep it brief. I have no speeches to make. Um, this application is for a special exception. Were it to be approved, a master development plan would come before this commission. Would this commission have the right to condition the amount of office space? At present, it's 10,000 square feet, 5,000 footprint with 5,000 above it. If this commission were to say double it, 
or we're not approving the master development plan. Do we have the right to do that? Do we have the right to do that? If that? it comes back before us, I don't know whether it's Lori or mm -hmm. city attorney. Um, so in OPI, the minimum lot requirement is two acres. They have provided the two acres. And back to my previous response, um, at a development master plan stage, the commission can certainly impose conditions on an applicant. If an applicant is not in agreement to those conditions, they could be their um, they, they could be the applicant's basis for a challenge when there's nothing to tie that requirement or that condition the commission is imposing in our unified land development code. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're all set with this phase. Let's um, move on to closing arguments. Each party will have five minutes. The order is aggrieved parties first, then staff, then the applicant. So how many of our aggrieved parties are left? Still two? Okay. If you gentlemen would come down and give your five minute closing argument. My name is Gary Thalman and I have been sworn. You know, when you're asking about to Mr. McDowell, the two acres. It's a January meeting, although it has no relevance to this meeting as far as what happened there. But you did ask for two acres. If you look at the print that was up on the board a few minutes ago that shows the retention ponds and the building and so on, you know, uh, take a close look at that print because there's two acres. They have two acres designated. But seven eighths of that is a wet and dry retention pond and then some facilities for parking for the garage and, and the maintenance building or whatever they're going to call it. So actually what you have is less than a quarter acre of the 11.7 acres of ground. And you, you ask them politely to come back with a better proposal. And now you're talking like you're going to accept a less than quarter acre proposal when they didn't really do what you asked them to do. So I don't see anything that's changed from the previous meeting except the addition of this less than one quarter acre. So how does all the logic about the jobs change? You know, Mayor, I've been a big advocate for this city for a long time. And jobs, jobs, jobs is what we need. I watch this every morning. And you're foregoing the opportunity here of two or 300 jobs on 11.7 acres of ground that's badly needed. And you know, the prior meeting doesn't have any example to it, but even in the staff reports here, it says we only have 41 point something acres left of this. It's OPI zone. It's not being used. And some people can call that inconsequential, but that's a big slice. Okay, that's a 30 plus percent. If you want to give that away, that's your decision. But that's a 100% reversal from the decision you made before. And I don't think the facts that we've heard today warrant that. Please vote to deny this petition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Murphy. <clears throat> My name is Murphy and I've been sworn. I mean, we've listened to a lot of discussions here, not <clears throat> only today, but for the last almost year <clears throat> about the same thing. We're bantering back and forth between all of this wording um, about just what the request is, and it just doesn't seem to be doing anything. All we seem to be doing is just kicking the can down the road. And when are we ever going to come to some type of a decision, not only here with this thing, but with everything else that's going to ha happen, and or will it, will it happen? I mean... With the projections that have been made, and I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something. My father was here in the early 90s, and he told me that in the year 2020, Northport was going to have 250,000 people here. Well, you know what? We're only one third of the way there. And why is that? That's what I'd really like to know. We just, we just don't follow any type of a plan. We have these 
We spent all sorts of money to consulting agencies, everything else. And you know what? We're still at the same position. We haven't found anywhere near anything. And now you're talking about changing the UDC, UDLC and everything else. I mean, what's the outcome of that going to be? We're still going to be in the same position. They're talking about the projection for 2040. I mean, I just don't understand. I think a lot of people here just are wondering what's really happening here. That's all. Thank I you, appreciate sir. Appreciate that you turn us down. Staff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of Development Services. I have been sworn. I wanted to um, close with a little bit of conversation about the comprehensive plan provisions that incorporate the 50% guideline. The issue is your comprehensive plan is your 30,000 foot view. Your unified land development code are your regulations on the ground floor that regulate and control development in the city. There are no implementing unified land development code provisions regarding the 50% guideline in the comprehensive plan. So that being said, staff has found that this application and this development petition is consistent with the comprehensive plan, including the future land use policy 1.1, the transportation element policy 4.4, the housing element policies 1.3, 1.7, 1.9, 6.1, Objective 7 and 7.1, and the Economic Development Policy 5.1.2, 5.1.3, and 5.1.5. Um, the competent substantial evidence providing in your staff report that analyzed all 16 required findings of the special exception show that um, this proposed project does meet the required findings for a special exception. And finally, um, we appreciate the commission's consideration of staff's recommendation for approval and feel that the competent substantial evidence supports that recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Applicant. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, again, I do apologize for the delay coming back from lunch. We decided next time we're going to Taco Bell, so we can get more quick. <laughs> Good plan. Uh, and Peter Van Busker had been sworn. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to say is I think Mr. Butt would like you all to know that we've, we've appreciated the staff working with us. Um, you know, they treat us like any other applicant, okay? We don't get any special favors. Um, they work with us like they work with everybody else, uh, and then they provide the recommendations to you like they do anybody else. Um, there's a couple things on the plan itself, lighting, We'd be more than happy to agree to the future lighting criteria. On traffic, quick one. Excuse um, me, sir. I'm hearing some rumbling in the office, and I'm very concerned about the people who are watching remotely to be able to hear. So if we could just be quiet. I'm sorry. If you can the, give him another 30 uh, seconds. Great. Thank when you. When we get to the development master plan stage, um, we can make that commitment. One other thing, um, you know, traffic's been discussed a lot. McKibben is set up where we have the divided um, median. We're willing to stripe the um, westbound road portion of McKibben so that there would be a left turn and a right turn. That will distribute the traffic and allow right turn movements to get out quicker, and so we will reduce the amount of, of, of um, time for uh, getting out onto, onto Sumter. So those are some of the things we'll come back to you with in the development master plan, but I did want to let you know we're absolutely considerate of that, and we would do that, and I'd like to let... Philip, come up and close. Thank you, Peter. Once again, Philip DiMaria, a certified planner with Kimley Horn. Um, thank you for all of your time today um, in hearing this petition as well as all of the testimony. Um, to begin, I'd just like to state, and I know this is, you all are very well acquainted with the idea that, um, you know, to, to create a successful city, you need a, a mutually reinforcing mix of land uses. And that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, residential uses create rooftops, which result in opportunities for retail, which 
result in opportunities for office, which result in opportunities for institutional developments. And we think this is very critical. This is an efficient use of the land. We're not talking about single family homes um, that would use this critical area and the critical acreage that exists on corridors uh, unefic inefficiently, um, but, but very efficiently. Um, we think it's also very important to note that the majority of land in the city is zoned for single family residential. And so these corridors like Sumter, it's, it's optimal um, to utilize higher densities, and higher intensities <clears throat> on those corridors to ensure that transitions are made um, and to once again uh, uh, result in just a better built environment and more opportunities for a mix of uses that reinforce each other. Um, last but not least, there was some discussion about um, you know, how this was a little <coughs> half-baked or perhaps we came back to the commission with a slightly tweaked plan. Um, to, to use the same analogy, uh, there's a 16-point special exception criteria that we had to meet, meaning we didn't just come back with our shoes tied, wearing our dress shoes, right? We, we washed our hair, we combed it, we flossed our teeth, we brushed our teeth, we put on our best Sunday attire, and we're here before you today with a plan that we think is uh, would, would be uh, in line with the city's uh, long-term plan for growth and consistent with the ULDC. Thank you very much for your time, um, and we respectfully request your approval. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, at this point, I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll try a motion, Mayor. I'm sure I'm not going to get support, but I'll have it on the record that I did try. I make a motion to deny resolution number 2023R52 and find that based on the competent substantial evidence granting the special exception will adversely affect the public interest, health and safety and general welfare. All of the 16 standards listed in section 53259A3 of the Unified Land Development Code have not been met. Item A, the proposed use is not consistent with the goals, objectives, policies, and programs of the comprehensive plan and the intent of the zoning district as defined in the ULDC for the area in which the property is located. B, the density and intensity of the proposed use is not consistent with the intended future land use of the designated land area in which the property is located in accordance with the future land use map contained in the comprehensive plan. If, if I can just ask C. you to take a breath there for a minute, I need some clarification from either city clerk, because you're listing all of these, correct? I am not listing all of them, ma'am. Oh, I thought you had your opening statement was that all of them. All of the 16 standards listed in 53259A3 of the Unified Land De Development Code have not been met. And I am listing the ones that have not been met. Okay, thank you. Continue then. I thought you were going to list them all. And my question was going to be, do we have to read them all into the record or could we reference the, the uh, comprehensive plan of the, of the current ULDC? Thank you, Mayor. Our recommendation is to follow the motion sheet, even though it does get long. Okay, go ahead. Continue, Commissioner. So I so far read A, mm -hmm. and I so far read B. C, the proposed use singular, singularly or in combination with the other proposed approved special exceptions, which isn't even applicable, is detrimental to the health, safety, welfare, morals, order, comfort, convenience, appearance, or prosperity of the neighborhood or adjacent uses and will not be an economic benefit to the city of North Fork. K, the ingress and egress to the subject parcel and any structure involved adversely affects the traffic flow and safety or control. M, the proposed use adversely affects the traffic flow, safety, and control of the surrounding roadway system. Do I hear a second? The motion fails for lack of a second. Is anyone else so moved to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I make a motion to approve. I move to approve resolution number 2023R52. 
and find that based on a competent, substantial evidence, proper notice was provided, granted, granting the special exception will not adversely affect the public interest, health, safety, and general welfare, the specific requirements and the schedule of district re regulations governing the individual special exception have been met, and the 16 standards listed in section 53-259A3 of the Unified Land Development Code have been met. Do I hear a second? Sorry. We have a motion on the floor made by Vice Mayor White, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich, to approve resolution number 2023-R-52 and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, proper notice was provided, granted, granting the special ex, uh, exception will not adversely affect the public interest, health, safety, and general welfare. The specific requirements in the schedule of district regulations governing the individual special exception have been met, and that the 16 standards listed in section 53-259A3 of the Unified Land Development Code have been met. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote please. And that motion passes four to one with Commissioner McDowell dissenting. Reasons stated, Commissioner? I am mostly dissenting for the fact that we are giving away our precious land for economic development to build more residential housing. It's not, it's not acceptable. Thank you for that, Commissioner. It is now 2.36. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break and come back at 2.46.
Six, and we are resuming the City of Northport Commission meeting. Um, quiet in the back, please. Uh, moving on to resolution number 2023-R-81. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, would you read the res resolution by title only and swear those in who wish to give testimony? 
Resolution number 2023-R-81, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, vacating a portion of the rear ease maintenance easement of Lot 43, Block 645, 14th edition to Port Charlotte subdivision, providing for findings, providing for recording, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God? Thank you. I'm looking for ex parte disclosures. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am, I have none. Vice Mayor White? No, nothing. Uh, myself, none. I have nothing. Commissioner Stoke, Commissioner McDowell? Nothing. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties in this matter? We do not. Okay, then let's move on to presentations. Uh, we'll start with the applicant, 20 minutes. Good afternoon. I am the owner of the property and I have been sworn. In the effort of time, I do not have a presentation. I, I do not have a presentation. Um, I will tell you that I did go before the Planning and Zoning Board of Appeals uh, the 2nd of November. Um, I answered their questions. From uh, that meeting, I can tell you that we do have a, an area in the back of the property that has been developed by Public Works. Uh, they are able to move their vehicles along that and take care of the canal that's behind them, the property. We've not had any issues with it. And uh, like I said, for, for, for me personally, it's just a, it's an improvement on the property. It's not anything that's out of character for the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, staff. <clears throat> Good morning, David Brown, Planner One, Planning and Zoning. I have been sworn. Today we're gonna to talk about 6383 Ohio Road, partial vacation of the platted rear easement with resolution 2023-R-81. This is being done through petition number VAC-23-148. <clears throat> the applicant is under confidential ownership by Florida State Statute 119. Point zero seven one. Uh, the property owner is also under confidential ownership, uh, Florida Statute 119.071. The request is to vacate a portion of the platted 20 foot rear drainage maintenance easement in order to construct a pool and screen enclosure. The location is 6383 Ohio Road, Lot 43, Block 645, <clears throat> the 14th edition of Port Charlotte Subdivision with a parcel ID of 0970 06. Dash four five four three. Property size is approximately 0.23 acres or 10,000 square feet. <clears throat> the requesting to vacate a portion of the Platte River 20 foot drainage maintenance easement to allow for the construction of a swimming pool and screen enclosure. Based on the vacation of easement survey dated March 15, 2023, the, the portion of the easement being petitioned for vacation measures 10 feet in depth and 68 feet in width, resulting in a total area of 680 square feet. On November 2nd, 2023, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board voted unanimously to approve the partial vacation of easement. The following agencies have reviewed the request to vacate the portion of the Platte 20 foot rear drainage maintenance easement and through written response have granted their approval. No issues or concerns were raised regarding this request. And as a side note, underneath <coughs> the um, all the agencies, there is a comment that says that no response is received within 10 days. It is assumed there is no issue with the vacation of easement. This has been reviewed in compliance with Florida statutes and ULDC chapter 53 zoning regulations. The vacation of easement was received and approved by staff for conformance with Florida statutes chapter 177. The vacation of easement was, re was reviewed and approved by staff in conformance with ULDC chapter 53 zoning regulations. The staff recommends approval of petition number VAC-23-148 via resolution 2023-R-81. If you have any questions, I'll be here to answer them. We'll get to that presently. Um, any rebuttal, applicant? No, ma'am. Staff? No, ma'am. Uh, city clerk, do we have any online public comment on this matter? No, we do not. Any in-house? We do not. Okay, I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Not seeing any, we'll move on to closing arguments. Uh, staff, you're up first. Uh, we have no closing arguments, ma'am. Applicant? We have nothing to add. Okay, then I am closing <laughs> this public hearing and requesting a motion. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. If I can. If I can. <laughs> Press and hold. Oh, there we go. Press and hold. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I move to adopt resolution 
number 2023-R-81 as presented. Second. I have a motion on the floor made by Vice Mayor White, seconded by <coughs> Commissioner Stokes to adopt resolution number 2023-R-81 as presented. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote please. And that motion passes five to zero. <coughs> Moving right along to ordinance number 2023-29. Uh, City Clerk, would you read this item by title only? Oh, I'm gonna need a motion for that. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner McDowell. Second. We have a motion on the floor to direct City Clerk to read this item by title only. Our motion maker is Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Let's vote. It's thinking. Now, Commissioner Stokes, are you going to change your vote, or is that the vote you yeah, <laughs> really it. want? Oh, there we go. I thought I had. Thank there you. There we go. Got to put those glasses back on. <laughs> and that motion passes five to zero. Okay, City Clerk, let's hit it. Ordinance number 2023-28, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, establishing a schedule and location of City Commission regular meetings and workshops for the 2024 calendar year, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, ma'am. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions or comments. Not seeing any. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not. Then I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make it. Go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. I move to continue ordinance. 2023-29 to second reading. Second. Uh, do you want to include a date on that? Yes, please. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, on November 28th, 2023. Seconding. Uh, second, second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to continue ordinance number 2023-29 to second reading on November 28th, 2023. Our motion maker is Commissioner Stokes, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Commissioner Stokes, we still need you. Jesus. <laughs> You're having trouble Getting with out that here. today. Sorry, folks. Is it that fun? And that motion <laughs> passes five to zero. It just might be. Yeah. Moving right along to ordinance number 2023-30. I need a motion to direct city clerk to read by title only. So moved. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to direct city clerk to read this item by title only. Our motion maker is Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Let's vote, please. That motion passes five to zero. Go ahead, city clerk. Ordinance number 2023-30, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, authorizing a reasonable return on equity from the ownership and operation of the city's utility system, amending the code of the city of Northport, Florida, section 78-22, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you, city clerk, city manager. This is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, back in the workshop. In June 14th of 2023, um, the pilot on water revenues was presented and utility staff was tasked with performing research in conjunction with the city attorney's office to find out what would be required for implementation. The city attorney's direction was to add clarity to the city code to show that any just and equitable rate of return after operation and maintenance costs, principal and interest on bond payments and renewable and replacement costs can be utilized for any lawful purpose. We ask that you continue this item to second reading we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Not, oh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, it, if I may comment, or is it only questions, ma'am? Oh, I'm not seeing a lot of lights on, so whatever you'd like to do. Okay. Um, by adding this um, line 63, may include a reasonable return on equity that can be used for any lawful <coughs> city purpose. These are customer utility customers that pay for the city water and city sewer. 
um, they also pay um, property taxes to the city. The, the people that are on well and septic don't pay into this at all. But we have many non-residents of the city of Northport that would be paying this tax to the city. And they don't even live here. Um, I, I, I have serious concerns about that and reservations. Um, our utilities customers are not a golden goose for the city and what the city needs. The utilities is a enterprise fund and they're supposed to be self-sufficient. They are not supposed to be supplying any revenues outside of the legal services and HR and all the other things that they use city services for to supplement the budget in additional ways, especially these non-residents of our city. Um, it, it's just not right, and I can't approve it. Commissioner Stokes. Um, yeah, this is a question really for legal. Is um, I'm sure legal's reviewed this. Uh, I would assume it is, and correct me if I'm wrong, legal to have a reasonable rate of return and legal to charge people who don't live in our city but who maybe utilize our utilities? Are they both legal? Thank you, Commissioner Stokes. Yes, we have reviewed this language and worked with special counsel on this language before the language is legal and <coughs> makes our code clarify that we can utilize these monies as the law appropriately allows. Um, the actual language itself is restrained to legal purposes as it states that it can be used for any lawful city purpose. Good, because I certainly wouldn't want to try to make a decision regarding this in any way, shape, or form that disagreed with city council. So thank you very much. Um, I have one. So for clarification, this would give the city the ability to add a fee, commensurate it with ROI. It just clarifies that the city can utilize its fees as allowed by other laws so that there is no perceived conflict between the language of our code that is narrower than what general law allows us. Okay. I, I don't know if my next question is for city attorney or a city manager. Um, I'm assuming then that this decision, should we decide to utilize this, would come back to the commission as any fee would. Um, at that time, would it be required, city attorney, or requested that city manager um, describe what purpose the money would be used for? So if we decided to, I'm making up numbers, I don't want to panic anyone, but if we decided to apply a 5% investment fee to our utility bills that would have to come back here for approval. At that time, would city manager be required to share how that money would be used? It's a little bit of a tricky hypothetical, Mayor, because it depends mm. on the program that comes before you. There may be an actual program for use. Um, there could be an amount. I can say that Offhand, I don't know the answer fully to your question, but that you know whatever is going to be proposed that requires city commission approval would go through legal review, and so we would research the requirements of that and make sure that any approval had all of the required components. I would just say for me, at that point in time, I'd like to know how the money was going to be used. It would be a big part of my decision. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, um, I sat in on a webinar through Florida League of Cities, and I just wanted to let you know that what I learned in that webinar is the state of Florida is revisiting this. I think it's the third or fourth year in a row um, trying to hamstring cities from doing exactly what we're doing. Um, and each time they get a little bit closer to making it um, challenging for the cities. Um, so I have a feeling, and, and Florida League of Cities also has a feeling it's coming back again, and that this might be the year that they get the win, and they're going to be um, 
hamstringing us on this ability. So I just thought I would throw it out there for clarity. I still am not supporting this for the reasons I stated. Uh, thank you for that, Commissioner McDowell. I'm not seeing any other lights on. So City Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? Then I'm closing this hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, I move to continue ordinance number 2023-30 to second reading on November 28, 2023. Second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor to continue ordinance number 2023-30 to second reading on November 28th. Our motion maker was Vice Mayor White, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Let's vote, please. And that motion passes four to one with Commissioner McDowell dissenting. Reason stated, Commissioner? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's move on to ordinance number 2023-33. Again, I'm looking for a motion to direct city clerk to read so by moved. title only. Second. Second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes to direct city clerk to read the ordinance by title only. Let's vote. Commissioner McDowell, you might try again. I don't think it took. All right. And that motion passes five to zero. City Clerk. Ordinance number 2023-33, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, prohibiting smoking at public parks, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida to create a new section 46-64, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you for that, City Manager. This is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, back on July 11th of 2023, the Commission voted four to one to direct the attorney to draft an ordinance prohibiting smoking and bathing in city parks and including designated areas, as well as direct the staff to report back on the cost of these smoking areas. The ordinance specifically identifies the existing and planned city-owned public park locations where smoking is prohibited, and it also lists a cost of signage and receptacles to identify designated smoking areas at an estimated cost of $4,000, which will be paid from parks and recs. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions you may have in order to make your decision, ma'am. Thank you, City Manager. I'm opening up the floor to uh, Commissioner Questions. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, when you look at line 62, it outlines like 20 different parks. And I'm wondering why can't we just say city owned property? That way, then we don't have to amend this each time we get a new park or a new city property that we own. Um, because there are quite a few that I, uh, there's a few that I found that are also missing from this list. Because commissioner, the statute that gives us the authority to ban the smoking relates to public parks, not to public property. So we can only institute this authority on in public parks. And in working with the parks and recreation department, we learned that we do not have a, a master adopted defined list that we can point to that identifies all of the city parks. So in order to make sure that we had, we have an enforceable local law, it's important that we identify those parks in this ordinance. Okay. So if we ever want to add or remove parks, it will require a code amendment. I just thought it'd be easier so that way we didn't have to do the amendments, but I, I was unaware of the state statute. Thank you for that. Um, Butler Park. Um, Butler Park has it, always been like the athletic field, and then there's the Morgan Center and the Aquatic Center. Um, wondering about the park that is the playground area over at between the Aquatic and Morgan Center, if that's on this list, it doesn't really have a name. <laughs> Sandy Funheller, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, Butler Park is the entire property. Okay. Uh, the Morgan Family Community Center, the Aquatic Center, the fields, those are all amenities on that property. So we don't have to list the playground separately? No. Um, what about City Center Green and that little playground that's right here next to the Mullen Center? 
So um, in speaking to um, city attorney's office, I believe that the um, city center campus was left off of this list. Um, we had looked at the front green, but I think we were talking about the entire city center campus. Well, if we can't have city halls, not a park, but we have the circle of honor on here. I understand. Okay. I guess I'm not understanding your answer. Are you waiting for city attorney to fill in the gap? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I had spoken to um, City Attorney Golan, he had indicated that the um, city center campus was left off in error, um, and we had talked about whether it would be the front green only or the city center campus as a whole. Because there's multiple amenities here, um, and my understanding that that was going to be um, added on before the next reading. So whatever the commission would like to do, as long as those areas are a public park. So if the entire you know, zone is a public park, then we can include that. If the lawn only is a public park, then we need to designate that. So help me out, what are we, what is designated as a park for the, what I classify as the city center green and then that playground and the Mullen Center? So they, they are not designated parks. That's, that is why you have this list in front of you, is so that through this ordinance, they can be referred to and designated as parks. So we use the front green. We use the green space on each side of the front green. Um, we use, um, there's the athletic fields um, behind the Mullen Center. Um, so by and then there will be the circle of honor here. That'll be the Veterans Memorial. Okay. By not having the tennis and fields, this playground, city center green, that is now going to allow parking, um, parking, smoking on those facilities. We are not, not allowing smoking there because it's not on the list. That is correct. Okay. We are, we are looking for direction on how you would like us to um, state that here in the ordinance. What is the name of the playground over there? The Mullen Center Playground. And is the football field still considered the Tennyson, Larry Tennyson, LT, I think is what it's called? Yeah, both fields are. And this front area is at City Center Green? The City Center Green is the area in between the, the two roads, but then there's also the, the um, open space area on each side of it that is not considered the front green. That is why the thought was it would be the city center campus. The city center campus that's including buildings and that's not a park. That's what that's where I'm going there's, there's with There's no this. smoking in the buildings anyways. Um, if you go to line 89, it says a person issued a violation shall have 30 days. Who issues the violation? Um, that would be through um, the police department. So police department goes before, so if they want to appeal, so the police department issues a citation. And then if I want to appeal that, I have to go before a hearing officer? That's correct. Police department goes before hearing officers? Uh, Garrison Chief of Police, that's correct. It's uh, similar to like a parking citation. Okay. Um, penalties on line 95. It says $25 for the first violation, 50 for the second. What are the consequences for non-payment? What happens? So if someone doesn't pay, then we can send that account to collections. I don't know. That's why I'm asking, Commissioner. Just like if they don't pay a parking ticket. Um, do we have to add this first and second and third violation to the fee schedule? There's other offenses that are listed in the fee schedule. Would we need to add this to the fee schedule? 
no ma'am, this is not a fee, this is a penalty. And this is uh, in line with how other penalties of this type are already addressed in the code. It's consistently presented like, like other like penalties in the code. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Vice Mayor White. Yes. Uh, I had a question. Well, just a clarification, because I'm sorry, it's been a while since we had this. It says except in designated smoking areas. We decided to have designated smoking areas, correct? We don't have to have designated. That's not part of the state statute to have. That's correct. That's okay. what we were asked to bring back. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just putting it out there that the Sarasota County, um, you know, as we know, in October went no smoking, and they don't have designated smoking areas, and neither does Charlotte County, neither does well, the city of Sarasota does, um, but Venice doesn't. But okay. But this is what we want to do. Um, and you clarified the city center green complex, the, that Larry, I'm sorry, Tennyson, is that what it's called? The fields and the Mullen Center playground would have to be added into this if we wanted to, to consider those to be parks. So that would be like an amendment to this or just come back for the second reading with those inclusions. If you would, you can either call them out each separately or my understanding is we could just refer to the city center campus. Oh, and that would include the, the football fields and the Mullen playground. Okay, okay. But that still would have to be included in, with an amendment for the That's second. Okay. And, I, and then Maya Hatchie Creek Linear Park, does that include the new Greenway Trail? Yes, it, yes, it does. So that is part of that. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. Um, all right, so yes, I'd be in favor of adding center, center, city center green complex onto this so that we can clarify that it's officially a park as far as this ordinance goes. Well, for this ordinance. Am I making sense? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Right. So, but I'll wait because we have to go to people here. Okay. Commissioner Emmerich. <laughs> Now we're talking city center complex. Is that right outside of city hall's front door? All the way to the parking lots, all the way to here, there, and everywhere. So you're going to outlaw smoking on all city property, basically. It would be um, open in designated areas, which are any paved parking lots or um, shell parking lots. That's the way it's written. So anybody coming to City Hall, we better have a, a big patrol out there because we're going to have violator after violator after violator coming and going. I just think it's ridiculous. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I asked earlier about the parks and I named off a few different parks and I was told that there's no official list of parks. I'm sorry, I'm on the city's website, and there is a list of official parks. Why are we just not using that list? I, I'm, because, I'm Commissioner, <laughs> that list has not been officially adopted. We can update our website you know, at any time. But legally, when we take this forward to the hearing officer, the city bears the burden of proof. And gotcha. we need to be very clear about where this applies so that we can show that we've met that burden. I appreciate that. Thank you for that clarity. Um, the... Boundless Playground is a separate park, separate from the no, Garden of Five Senses. I know that the no, Garden it's of... A, it's a playground at the Garden of Five Senses. Thank you. Are you done, Commissioner? Yep. Commissioner Stokes. Um, Question, Commissioner Emmerich made a comment about, you know, city green, I mean, like in front of our building right here. But would there not be a designated smoking area since it is a, flat, a concreted area? I mean, so it's not like you're not going to be able to smoke there as long as you're in the designated area. The, the way the ordinance is written, the designated areas are parking lots or paved um, parking areas. And they would have to be signed and have a receptacle. So you could have a receptacle right on the circle as you come right in front of the building, not necessarily where the benches sit now, 
but right there if we so chose, right? Theoretically, okay. yes, you could. So, so it wouldn't require anyone to be forced out into the parking lot to have to go smoke next to their truck. Or motorcycle. Or motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Thank are you, you. Are you done, Commissioner? Yes. Vice Mayor Wyatt. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Stokes, for clarifying all of that. Um, yeah, because we're going to be putting up signage, and that in itself, when you go to places and it says no smoking, people know that. It's okay. It's no smoking. So I don't think we should be concerned about, you know, having people standing there as the police, having a police officer stand there and writing out citations for people. But most people, when they see it's no smoking, they're they're going to comply, but they want to know where can I go to smoke. So this is very clear, and we talked about this at parking lots would be the the um, the smoking areas. That's kind of how it's always been. I know as a, as a teacher that used to be that the teachers would go out in the parking lots to smoke, but then they they outlawed that for those poor. Well, made them break the habit too. Um, so um, I'm good with this, uh, the city center complex, because the parking lot is, is right there. So they can just go and uh, smoke there. And most people, if they're coming in with their cigarette and we have a receptacle there and it says no smoking, they'll just take their last few drags and put it out and come into the city hall. I, I really don't see a problem with that. Okay, I'm not seeing any other Actually, lights on. Actually, yeah, my light is on. Oh, is it? Oh, you are. The last minute. Go ahead, Commissioner. Right. Just to put all this in perspective, I mean, every city, every county and its surrounding areas have, have enacted ordinances to prohibit smoking. Granted, most of them are, you know, beach related, but they're park related as well. Thousands of people die of secondhand smoke. It is not healthy. It is messy. It is dirty. We're not looking to create cigarette police out there where we're going to take away from, you know, the, the normal runnings of our city. But it will be a deterrent. It will be something that people can say, gee, when you're sitting out there listening to a concert on the city green and somebody's puffing away sitting next to you, you can say, gee, do you know, like, this is kind of against the law and could you be courteous? And, you know, nine out of 10 people will say, oh, excuse me, sorry. The one that doesn't may be an issue. And that's what this is all about. Um, you know, I, I get that. In this world, everybody would like to see government less interfering in people's lives. Well, you know, like there's plenty of interference, everything from what to do with a woman's body to you name it. So this is health related. It's a good thing. Everybody else is doing it. We shouldn't be Johnny come lately to it. We should be right in there with everybody else who's concerned about our neighbor's health. That's what we are, a community and unity, unity who care about each other. So. I'm off my soapbox. Thank you. Thankfully. Thankfully. Well, I was brief. <laughs> he was good. Uh, city Clerk, do we have any online or in-house public comment? Maybe not. Okay, then let's move right along. I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Try this. I move to continue ordinance number 2023-33 to second reading on November 28th, 2023. Um, with the inclusion of city center green complex in the list of park locations. Got a second from me. Okay, I have a motion on the floor made by Vice Mayor White, seconded by Commissioner Stokes to continue ordinance number 2023-33 to second reading on November 28th, 2023, adding city center green complex uh, to the list of parks. There's nothing more to that. Let's vote. I'm Johnny come lately. And that motion passes three to two with commissioners McDowell and Emmerich dissenting. Commissioner Emmerich, do you want to share your dissension? Well, I just want to forewarn the new mayor that breaks are going to have to be 15 minutes if I got to walk all the way out to the truck and walk all the way back in. So I'm just so, giving due notice. So noted. <laughs> Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, you know, I, I was on the fence uh, until I heard the conversation, and I'm back to what I originally was saying. This is an unenforceable, ridiculous law that does nothing but give a false notion to combat smoking and control a phantom problem in Northport. 
Northport PD and our hearing officer have far better things to do and far better, bigger issues to have to deal with. Moving on to general business, item 23-122, oops, city manager. Um, excuse me, Madam Mayor, do you mind if we move up item 23-1540 in front of this item? It's, there's a consultant attached to it, and they're going to be offline at 5 o'clock, and we don't want to make sure we shortchange that item. What item? Do we need a motion for that, 40. city clerk? The, you can just uh, get a consensus. Okay. How do you feel about that, Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, that's fine. Vice Mayor? I'm good. I'm good. Me too. Stokes? I'm fine yep. with that. Okay. Done, done. So. 23-1540. C. No, C. C. C is a cash. 23 150 I had it right. I'm stunned. Yeah. Okay, so we're what's up is 23-1540. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item is the discussion of possible action regarding economic development market, market feasibility study appendix seven, including property in the Northport Garden development of regional impact, Star Farm Village, formerly Toledo Village, Toledo Blade 320 project, and the proposed MX2 zone land on the northwest side of the Toledo Blade and I-75 interchange. And we do have our marketing director, Ms. Vinnie Mascarena is here to introduce the item. Happy birthday, Vinnie. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, <laughs> commissioners. Uh, <clears throat> Vinnie Mascarena is manager of economic development. Uh, we are going to be joined today by Alex Tranmer, director of strategic planning, and Tom Dworsky, director of research at Kamoyne Associates. Um, they should be logging in. They've been waiting online. I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. cool, right? Yes. Appreciate the accommodation. Their work day ends. Hi. Hi. This is Alex Alex Schremer. Schremer. Yes. Yes. I'll take that as a good sign. So on April 13th, 2021, the commission accepted the economic development market feasibility study. And in August of 2022, the economic development division requested Kamoyne Associates conduct an updated ROI analysis, return on investment analysis on four development areas on Toledo Blade Boulevard. Those appendix seven study areas include Northport Gardens, just under 500 acres, Toledo Village, which is now Star Farms Village at Northport, Toledo Blade 320, 320 acres, and a proposed MX2, uh, 15 acres, and MX2, 20 acres with the potential to become tax exempt. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex and Tom with Kamoyne Associates to run through uh, and give you an overview of what was uh, uncovered on the updated um, ROI. Hi there. Can everyone? I'm on the I can hear you. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Alex, I'll just uh, I'll just start. start. There's a back. I'll just do a bit here. Okay. okay. So, so here we've got the of the study area for the, the innovation, innovation district. district. So, um, as you we'll recall, from the original, the original study, uh, the purpose of the new turn on investment analysis was to project levels of new asset value and the new limit that is expected in the city as a result of uh, water and water. Sir, water. excuse me, you're breaking up a little bit or you're not close enough to the mic. I'm not sure which. Um, okay. okay, I'll try to go closer. Is that, is that any better? better? That sounds better. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll speak, speak up as best I can. Um, again, again, the, the, the purpose of original return on investment analysis was to project the levels of new asset value and new I'm employment. I'm having a real hard. Excuse me, sir. We're kind of we're getting a tunnel effect as you're talking. Oof. I think IT is maybe checking. It's, it's like feeding or bouncing off each mm. other or something. Mm. 
I'll try, I'll try to, to turn, turn my. Down. Is, is that, that any better? better? Yeah, it's just once you get started, get started again, and let's see. Okay, okay this, this is, is a test. I'm talking. I'm talking. talking. Does, Does that sound better, better at all? No. No. Okay. okay. Uh, That's what it is. There's somebody sitting next to you, Tom. Could they mute themselves? No, there's, there's no, no one next to me. It's very, very quiet, quiet in my room here. here. As soon as they said Carphone and Admiral, yeah, mm. that's exactly what it is. Could you, if it's on speaker, could you take it off? Yeah, yeah I, get, I, get. I can turn, turn off the speaker, speaker then I won't be able, able to hear. hear. Let, Let me see. Is that, is that any better? better? It's it sounds very, very low, low right, right now. now. Is that any better? Yeah, well, let's we'll start again and let's see. Can you, can you hear me now? now? Is that any better? Yes. Is it going on? If you can hear, hear me, me there's not hearing, hearing the speakers. I'm going to turn them back up now and see if you can, you can hear me any better. Is that, is that any better? better? Yeah, yes. just start talking and. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm going to turn down my speaker so we will just, just have questions, questions at the end then. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon everyone. I'm um, sorry for that uh, bit of trouble right there. there. Um, again, again, I'm Tom Ritz, Director of Research at Moynihan Associates. We were the firm that did the market study, um, you know, several years ago at this point. Part of that study was the return on investment analysis, which projected the level of new assets value and new employment that is expected in the city as a result of water and wastewater infrastructure extensions um, into the innovation corridor. That, that will unlock and develop the potential business of I-75. So, so this map is showing kind of, kind of that, that area. area. And since that, that study, study was conducted, we've been, been directed to kind of take, take a broader, broader look, look at the innovation corridor, non kind of the activity, activity center, center area that was previous focus to include the other um, development areas in that, that general vicinity that would also be unlocked uh, for development potential as a result of that infrastructure extension. And so, and so the map right here that you're, here that you're seeing is the area, area that, that we're looking at now as part of the new uh, the updated, the updated analysis. analysis. So we're including um, the, the site, site of the North Fork Gardens, Gardens development, Toledo Village development, Toledo Village and then and the and MX2 um, um, potential redevelopment uh, area <laughs> on the west side of Toledo Village Boulevard there. Next, Next slide, please. please. And, and so, so this, this updated analysis, analysis is the same methodology as the 2021 study, uh, just to have a little bit at a high, high level. level. So it's already allocated, allocated the anticipated build out by use type, type so that's commercial versus industrial, industrial versus, versus residential, uh, based, uh, based on the land use requirements of the study area. area. Then, then we projected the assessed value and calculated annual property tax revenue to the city at full build out. And, and use that, that build out to also estimate what impact fees that would be generated would, would be. And then, and then finally, we project the new job creation as, as a result of the new non residential development, so commercial and industrial development in the study area. Right, right. So, so that's, that's kind of the same, the same in, uh, uh, the general methodology, the same exact methodology for the update. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. <laughs> So, so overall, in the updated analysis, we show an increase in value and revenue that is driven by two, two um, drivers. First, First higher, higher development density in prior, prior scenarios um, in, in certain parts, parts of the study, study area, and then, and then secondly, additional, additional parcels being added to the study area. area. So, so as a result of those two things, we see increase in the potential value that we generated, the assessed value, value, and then um, by, by extension, the property, property tax revenue that, that would be generated as a result of expanding um, that, that study area and affecting the development, development density assumptions. assumptions. And so, and so this, this table um, summarizes the result of the analysis. So the first line compares what the 2021 accepted study found and then compares it to two scenarios under the updated analysis. So to, so to summarize, summarize 
2021 expenses that we calculated up to uh, $290 in this set value, um, or in other words, return on investment for each dollar invested in utility extensions. If, if I could hold you there for in a the moment, we will look at two uh, scenarios. Um, under, under the status quo scenario, which reflects current zoning in the study, study area, we, we can expect up to $383 return on investment. Um, which, is which is obviously increased over the 2021 exception study. The last, the last line there is the second scenario of the updated analysis where the west side of Toledo Bay Boulevard is known as MX2, um, as shown on the map previously. And that, and that bumps, bumps up the ROI to $430 for every dollar invested in utility and extension. Um, um, however, in both areas of the new analysis, analysis we see that the job, job count is considerably lower than what was projected as the high end of the original study. And so, and so that's because, because there is much more residential development as a share of total development in this updated, updated analysis. analysis. So, so while, while the value of the revenue did, did go up because there was more total, total development, development being captured, the job, job counts went down because less of the development it is non-residential as originally assumed in the 2021 study. Next, Next slide, slide, please. So, so what are the implications of this analysis? Uh, we we want, want to continue driving home and move this takeaway from the original 2021 study, which is that intentional land use regulations are necessary to encourage non-residential development. Uh, if, if land, land is not explicitly zoned for commercial activity, developers are likely to pursue residential development because that's where the market demand and the financial return are strongest uh, relative to commercial. Um, and, and so finally, so this updated analysis, analysis compares the ROI to differ from the status quo zoning and, and the rezone of a portion of the study area to MX2. Under, Under current, current zoning, where limited, limited development in this area is a low density residential, uh, this parcel is a mixed opportunity, uh, a missed opportunity for non residential development. Right, right. And again, that's referring to that parcel on the west side of the legal estate. Rezoning is an activity where it stands to increase the potential for commercial and industrial development from potentially zero under current zoning. Um, so, so this is. That part is a key area and a fine way to the right off I-75 is beginning to go economic development. There's a significant opportunity for a new value range and new job growth for North Fork. So those are kind of the takeaways from this updated analysis. Let me turn my speakers back on now and open the questions. Ms. Vinnie, I'm wondering if we might ask Tom to send in his notes or his script and we might upload that along with these slides for the people who are trying to hear online. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. sure. Yeah, happy, happy to do that. Okay, I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Commissioner McDowell. Um, on page nine of the Kamoin study, it talks about the MX2 area. Um, and there's two areas of this MX2 area. There's there's one that's like a hashtag that's on the northern side, and then there's another one on the southern side. So which is the MX2, all of it, or the hashtag or the southern part? It's my understanding that MX2 is broken into two portions. The the bottom part that is the solid color is is 15 acres. It's current. It's currently zoned as general commercial, and 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 looking to rezone it as MX2. The hashed portion is 20 acres. That I believe is the police department's uh, future um, future headquarters. <coughs> and so uh, yes. Okay. So when this study was done. And it says that rezoning to MX2 is it incorporating both sections or is it just the bottom section? I I think the oh. sorry. 
Director. Lori Barnes, Assistant Director, Development Services. The proposed zoning map at the time that the Kamoin study was updated to expand the study area incorporated proposed MX2 on, on both areas of property, parcel A and parcels B, C, D, and E. I believe it goes all the way up to E or H, all the way up to H. Now, when this study was prepared, uh, planning staff was not aware of the police department's intent to purchase that property for their new police headquarters. So the study before you does give consideration to MX2 zoning for the property that is now owned by the city of Northport and slated for the police headquarters. Our current draft of the zoning map does change the police headquarters property to government use versus MX2. Okay. That explains a lot in this study because throughout this study, it's saying by adding commercial development to MX2, now I understand <coughs> they were looking at both areas because the southern area is already commercial. Is there a way to update this to reflect the new government properties? and update these numbers to give us a little bit better of an idea. I know it's a small portion. I don't know if it's worth the time and energy. Maybe it's something simple, easy peasy staff can do without having the consultant, but there's already commercial development. It's already zoned commercial on that Southern part. So that answered that big question and thank you. Um, that answered that question. How is job creation determined in the study, which is on page 11? How, how did you guys arrive at how you created over 5,000 jobs? And that would have to be updated too because now there's government or would they be including the police station jobs and the fire station jobs, even though the majority of police is already existing jobs? not creating new ones. Well, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about your methodology? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming, assuming um, um, so, so the way that, that the methodology treated this by, by looking at, at um, the breakdown and square footage of the different use types throughout the area um, based on the zoning, zoning allowances, and then using kind of standard assumptions around um, number of jobs generated per square foot of those different use types. So those, so those are based on kind of standard national averages um, around you know, how many um, uh, office, office workers are generated per thousand square feet of office, office space, how many retail, retail workers, workers are generated per thousand square feet of hotel space, space etc. Et and, and then that, that was all multiplied by the standard assumption. assumption. And so, and so to, to answer the question about whether uh, kind of the police uh, uh, employees were captured here, no, no this study was done um, without knowledge uh, of the PC station, and, um, um, and so, so this was just done assuming kind of the commercial. And so, and so I'm, I'm, I, I, um, and, and so, so I, I think one of those any more questions about that, that, that generally, generally how the methodology is. Um, yeah. Um, so I, 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 do you know what the job growth grant requires us to have in that general area? Yes. In 10 years, 1,947 jobs. 10 years, how many? 1,947. And is it only for Toledo? I'm sorry, is it only for Northport Gardens or is it for the corridor? It's for the entire innovation corridor, which runs from 320 Toledo Blade all the way up against the crossings Activity Center 5. And just for curiosity, did that start when we got the job growth grant in 2019? So that means we have until 2029 to get these 1900 jobs? It starts once the infrastructure is laid. And I believe that they're about to complete 
Toledo Blade water and sewer infrastructure ahead of schedule. That's good to hear. Yes, ma'am. I, I really would love to see these revised figures because, you know, and I, and I don't know if it's comment time not or not, Mayor, but um, what I have seen is very eye-opening, um, and I appreciate this return on the investment. It really showed how much single-family residential we have square footage-wise compared to how much square footage for commercial and industrial we have. And again, residential is much higher than the commercial, and it's almost three to one. And that, that to me is concerning looking at these numbers, and that's why I'm really looking forward to seeing this um, change because I have a feeling it's gonna be closer to four to one, <laughs> and that concerns me. Um, you know, according to the study, there's a total of 6,200 or more dwelling units in that corridor. That's a lot of residential. Um, and this whole area was intended to be a job creation area. It was to help diversify the tax base. And here we have, again, more residential when the intention was to have jobs. So... I, I, I really hope we're going to get updated numbers. Yes, certainly. Vice Mayor White. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just had a question for um, clarification on uh, what page I'm on. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's at the very end, right before the question panel, uh, where it says that if land is not explicitly zoned for commercial activity, developers will likely pursue residential development. So is that? <laughs> Uh, they're talking about commercial things that are actually zoned CG, commercial general. That, that's that, 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 kind of a general kind of, kind of commercial, commercial industrial, any, any uses that are not residential. Okay, because, and then just again to clarify things that are, if it is zoned commercial, the Live Local Act can apply to that. Is that, do I have that right too? Okay, I thought so. And then um, with current zoning, MX2 parcel is a mixed opportunity for substantial economic development. I'm taking that to mean we need to have more MX2. Yes, yes, okay. Commissioner, that's correct. MX2 allows for a mix of residential, commercial, and recreational spaces, um, a mix of amenities and services, uh, it's, it's stronger for economic resilience. It allows a diverse range of uses. And it's, it's, a, it's also very good for attracting investment. MX2 makes the innovation corridor more attractive to investors and developers. Um, it leads to an increased investment in our community. And it also has the potential for higher property values from, from what I've been able to see. Yes? OK, thank you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, just to kind of go by what you were saying. At our workshop, we learned that the MX1 and MX2 would have to be vertically, vertically integrated before development can happen. But we also learned at that workshop, there aren't that many developers willing to do the vertical integration. They have like one, we had talked about when we were doing the activity centers conversation. Um, but in this area, Again, we already have 6,200 uh, dwelling units already approved. And in MX2, to have even more residential, regardless if it's multifamily or paired villas and stuff, a developer can come in and say, this is what I want to do on that. Elena Wright, Development Services Director. Um, when At the workshop, when we were talking about the vertically integrated, that's specifically affordable housing developers who do nothing but affordable housing. So they're the ones who do not like to do mixed use because they have funding restrictions. Um, their financing, some of the financing that they can get at the federal level for affordable housing requires all of the affordable housing to be in one building and it's single use. So it doesn't allow for mixed uses. There are a lot of developers who do mixed-use projects outside of the affordable housing world. 
Um, we are talking with one now who has a project in before us that will be coming to the commission uh, that is interested in doing um, some very interesting uh, mixed-use projects. I have worked with many, many, many mixed-use developers, uh, but there are a lot of mixed-use developers. It's the developers who do affordable housing projects with the financing restrictions who don't like to do mixed-use. Okay. I, I must have misunderstood because I could have swore you said mixed use one and mixed use two had to be vertically integrated. They do, but we were talking about that it would reduce, what we were talking about with the vertical integration is that not a lot of affordable housing developers would be interested in doing the development in MX1 and MX2 because they would have to be vertically integrated. And not a lot of the affordable housing developers can or will do the vertically integrated uses. So the mixed use two that's in this Camoin study would have to be vertically integrated Correct. or it is not required? Correct. They would have to? Yes. And a, and a lot of the um, currently entitled dwelling units are um, single family. Uh, Panacea had a lot of previously entitled homes, single-family homes uh, that carried over. Um, so that that did, um, you know, the, the single-family does make up a lot of that number. Um, the multifamily is really where uh, most of the newer entitlements are coming in. The developers are looking for multifamily because of the, the need in this area for that. Are you set, Commissioner McDowell? I am, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Stokes. Yeah, just a question. I mean, this, this agenda item is discussion of possible action regarding economic development market feasibility study. Um, was this like the study? Okay, so the study's been presented. We've looked at it. We might want some modification for the property that's set aside for the police building. Like, what's the ask here? I mean, is this just to accept the study, or are we going to have a conversation all about, like, the rezoning and the ULDC and all this stuff? Because if we are, like, I'd like a five-minute break because, like, we could be here for about seven more hours. So I'm just kind of curious what this agenda item is all about. We're asking the commission to accept... Appendix 7, in keeping in line with how the Commission in April of 2021 accepted the Economic Development Market, market Feasibility Study. Good. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I'm not seeing any of the lights on. So, City Clerk, do we have public comment on this topic? Yes, we do. Carmine Miranda. The Kamoi Market Feasibility Study recommends bringing infrastructure to the northeast quadrant of Toledo Blade and I-75 to bring light industrial, commercial, and skilled jobs. Unfortunately, the three development projects proposed for this area will have 6,000-plus mixed-use residential units. It is unfortunate because residential units will be a burden on city taxpayers who will have to make up the delta between the cost of city services and property taxes collected. I'm in favor of the Camoin recommendations, but opposed to a business park having 600 plus residential units. In person, we have Carolyn Price, followed by Pam Tokars. Hi, Pam Tokars. I just wanted to comment about the um, a piece of property that's currently zoned commercial that's going to switch over to MX2 that's on the corner of 75 and um, Toledo. Um, don't forget that there is a, the uh, property owner has already su uh, submitted a request for the uh, low income housing for that under the Live Local Act. And I know that's kind of been put on hold, but I just want you guys to take that in consideration when you're thinking about the jobs and also that big star farms. When the more of those residentials that you do with the star farms, the Toledo, with the residential, they're not creating jobs. They're creating service jobs for the lawn care company and 
maybe some security people, but it's not creating the jobs that we wanted. And that industrial park that's going up there in 320, it's going to create a couple of management jobs because that's on my understanding, and they don't tell us who it is, one company is going into that industrial portion. And it's going to be mostly um, worker bees, as I call them. So those are going to be the lower in the $20 range of according to the Kamoin study and a couple of management positions. So those jobs generated by that are not going to be what I'm looking for if I want to make more than $50,000 a year. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn Price, I have not been sworn. Okay, thank you. Good. Even better. <laughs> okay. I'm not into the Kamoin study and UCLD and all these other terms. I'm still not up to up to snuff on them. My quandary is, and I know this is in reference to jobs. Um, I live across the street from the 320 development. And my concern is that the developer, when he had the neighborhood meeting, told us he was going to create 2,600 single mother with daycare on the property jobs. Well, recently when he came before you, all of a sudden that number changed to 600 jobs. So I'm hesitant to believe anything that comes out of the gentleman's mouth or the attorney's mouth. Because it changes develop depending on what they want to what their audience is. My concern is that building that light industrial park on that 320 piece of property, that industrial is going to be 55 acres. The entire building, because it's only one company as far as we can determine, because the developer will not give us the information that we need, citing it's a breach of confidentiality. I suspect he's not giving us that information because he knows that it's going to be so egregious that more people would be up in arms about this development. Mm -hmm. My concern is that that light industrial 55 acres in no way fits into that neighborhood and I have to take, again, exception with your staff's findings when they said that it was conducive to the surrounding area. I live across the street. That whole entire street is residential, from Tropicare down to the dead end. Across the top of this property, it backs up to the Walton Preserve. On the back of the property, there's also more wetland that's going to be um, set, that's set aside. In the property, they have a huge amount, and I couldn't give you the acreage amount, but I would say two-thirds of that piece of property are wetland that they're going to be developing in and around of. They're going to run the road from that development across the northern boundary, which is going across the reserve. That road is going to block any way for the water coming off of that ranch land and that preserve land, it's going to block it from going into those wetlands. So we will not have a wetland there. They'll dry up, and you'll lose every bit of wildlife and foliage and everything else that you need. The other point is... Your time is up, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner McDowell. I'll make a motion to instruct the city manager to work with staff and the consultant to um, reevaluate Appendix 7 of the Kamoin study and bring back to commission um, a revised copy showing the updated um, MX2 areas and the um, five, I'm sorry, 10 acres of Toledo Village. Could you repeat that, Commissioner? please to direct city manager to work with staff and the consultant to bring back a revised appendix seven showing the revised MX2 areas and 
updated the revised MX2 areas and update the Toledo Village showing the 10 acres of uh, non-residential and bring it back to commission for further review and adoption. Assistant City Clerk, do you have that? If you could read it back to us and we'll look for a second. A motion was made by Commissioner McDowell um, to instruct the city manager to work with staff and the consultant for a revi to revise the Camoin study and Appendix 7 and bring back mm -hmm. to commission the revised MX2 of the five acres of Toledo Village of non-residential for further, or what was the last part? Sorry. Bring it back to commission for further review and, ado further. and adoption. For further review and adoption. Do I hear a second? That motion fails for lack of a second. Anyone else care to take a stab? I'll give it a shot. Um, I move to adopt. I move to adopt the economic development market feasibility study subject to a modification uh, to include um, the property set aside for the police headquarters building and the uh, light industrial zoned section of Toledo 320. Just a rework. I was going to second it, but I can't now because 320 is already in this study. There's 10 acres of the Toledo Village. Is it? It's 10 acres of Toledo Village, but this study only shows five. I, I'm not seconding it. Well, if you could read back what you have, Assistant City Clerk or adopt, City Clerk. Uh, to adopt the economic <laughs> development market feasibility study subject to a modification to include the property set aside for the police headquarters building and the light industrial zone section of Toledo 320. About the additional five acres. Of Toledo. Benny, do you have a suggestion? Yes. I, I, I think I what we're looking um, for are the, the revisions. I, I defer to um, the institutional knowledge <coughs> here, but I believe instead of adoption, you want to accept. Accept. Because um, adoption is, is another level right. of, um, of action, and, and it keeps in line with, with the 2021 accepting the Camoin Feasibility Study. And, and I believe that you were referring to. On June 13th, you added 10 acres to Toledo Village. So you would want to do the uh, MX2 Northern Side government use, future government use, and the Toledo Village additional 10 acres. And, and we can run those numbers and, and we'll get them back to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, clarification, Ms. Mas Mascarenas, is it, are we adopting the whole study or just the appendix? Seven? You're accepting, so, accepting appendix seven. I'm sorry, accepting, yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so Appendix 7. You want to take another shot at it, Commissioner How about Stark? can City Clerk try to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Vinny, what did you say for the um, police headquarters and the additional 10 acres? Can you just repeat that part? Um, MX2, um, north side of MX2, a future government use, is where the future police headquarters will be. And then the additional 10 acres for Toledo Village, which is technically Star Farms now. Okay, so accept the economic development market feasibility study appendix seven with the inclusion of the north side of MX2 future government use and the additional 10 acres for Toledo Village Star Farms. Perfect. That sounds very good. Do we hear a second? Sorry. Okay, we have that motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Let's I'd like vote. to speak to the motion before we vote. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner. The problem with the motion as it's stated is that we are accepting it, but we haven't seen what those new numbers are going to look like. And how can we accept something 
when they are going to be revising it and we're not gonna see it. The whole purpose of the Camoin study is for us to be aware <coughs> of what's in it and what this return on the investment is in this area. That's why my motion was to have them bring it back so we could look at it and then discuss it and, uh, and uh, approve it and, uh, and accept it. Um, I, I Basically, you're saying the same thing my first motion had, but this motion that you made, Commissioner Stokes, is accepting it, so they're gonna revise it. We accepted it as revised without looking at it, and then they then it's out there. We don't get to see it again. We're accepting something we don't know what it's gonna look like, and that, that troubles me. Um, let me ask, I would be happy seeing those uh, revised numbers in a memo, and then um, we can always upload that memo, or if anyone here on the dais wants to bring that topic back again, we could review those numbers. Is that acceptable? Do we need a consensus on that? I'll make an amendment. Well, we've already first and seconded. That's all right, I can still make an amendment. Okay, go ahead. I'll make amendment that the city manager, once this is revised, provides the city commission with a memo and a copy of the revised Appendix 7. I'll second that. Okay, we have an amendment to the original motion to instruct city manager to send a memo with those revised numbers. And what was the rest of that? Question? Revised Appendix 7. A revised Appendix 7. Commissioner Stokes? Second it. He's the second. Let's, if there's nothing more, let's vote on that. That amendment passes 5 to 0 back to the original motion as amended. Let's vote. Commissioner Stokes, we so, still need you. Oh, good. And that original motion as amended passes unanimously 5 to 0. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, this okay. is what happens when people don't second for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's flip back to item 23-1227. Uh, this is discussion and possible direction regarding prepayment plan options for the water and wastewater expansion project. City Manager, this is your item. Can we take five or ten? Or fifteen. With the new law. Let me see. That is an Where are yeah. we at? I was thinking uh, we would go two hours to 446. Are folks struggling? I know you always are, Commissioner Emmerich. Okay, let's take a break now. Let's come back at 415. <clears throat>
And we are resuming the City Commission regular meeting. Uh, we are on item 23-1227, discussion and possible direction regarding prepayment plan options for the water and wastewater expans expansion project. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we do have a short presentation to be presented by our Assistant Utility Director, Ms. Sue Braysdale. How do I? Thank you. Hello. The utility department has been asked to come in and discuss the prepayment plan options today. Um, and it, so that we can explain it and for discussions with the, so that the commissioners can discuss it and decide how they would like to proceed. We do have four options available. If you would speak up just a little bit, I'm I want sorry. to make sure. Sorry. There are four options that we are have ready to present today. The first option is the lump sum for existing homeowners. Existing homeowners would be locked into the current rate of capacity and they would not be required to pay any line extension fee. And they would have that op the option to pay the full amount in the beginning so that they do not have to worry about any further payments after that. At the time of the in installation of the meter, they would be required to pay a me meter connection fee. The full connection would be made for the homeowner at the time of construction by the city's contractor. So they would not have to be concerned about construction on their property. The second option would allow homeowners with existing homes on the properties to pay for their payments over a, a time period. This option would also lock in the current rate of capacity and exempt the existing homeowners from line extension fees. There, there, it, there was a discussion that there should be an option for the homeowners that decide to pay over time that once the lines are installed, that they be given the option to pay off whatever's remaining to be paid. And then it would be up to, to it would be your choice to if that existing connection capacity fee would remain or if it would change for people that didn't pay it off right away. And the meter connection fee would also be paid at the time that the meter is installed. And again, since they're existing homes, all of the construction would take place at the time of construction. They would be connected to the water and or sewer system at the time without any future construction needing to take place. For vacant land, property owners would be able to pay a lump sum amount to lock in the current capacity, rate of capacity, so they would know what the payment is at that time and they wouldn't have to pay an increase in the rate of capacity when they do build their home on that property and connect. And the, the current rate of extension fee would also be locked in. The meter connection fee would be paid at the time of that meter application. For vacant properties, since there are no homes on the site, when the city's contractor <coughs> goes by the site, they will install a service line from the new pipe to the property line. And then at a future date when the homeowner builds the house, they would have to extend that pipe, their service line from the property line to their house. And the last option would be giving vacant, prop, vacant owners of vacant land the opportunity to also pay that over time. It was, this would also lock in the current rate of capacity and the current rate, current rate of line extension fees. Um, you also have the option to decide to, if, that, if those rates will stay for the full length of time that the, they decide to pay over time or if they need to pay it all at the time that the line is installed in the street. And the, at the, the vacant property owners 
would also need to pay the connection fee at the time of the meter installation, and they would be responsible for installing the, the service lines from the property line to the home, and the city's contractor would install the pipes from the new pipe to the property line. Um, this just summarizes the items um, to first put, a, put an option in place for people to pay a lump sum payment, and then what the conditions will be for if, he, if we allow monthly payments. Um, one of the things that, um, need, that we thought should be discussed is if monthly payments should be mandatory over the whole time or if there should be some kind of hardship provision that if someone had a hardship, they could temporarily stop the payments and then continue them. Um, but this is the last slide of the presentation. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes, um, on that last slide, you had like the monthly payments. Now, what would happen if they did have a hardship, but then they could not <coughs> continue to pay? Would that partial balance be transferred over to possibly, let's say, a new owner or whatever? Yes, I would think that the pay, uh, this is your decision, but I would think that the payments would go with the property and that there would be a lien placed on the property that if they sold the property, it would have to be paid for then. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that there was a contingency plan. If they started and for some unforeseen reason, they had to stop and then they completely stopped. I can understand picking it back up and continuing on. But if they stopped and it stayed with the property, at least it's still available to any new purchaser or an error, heiress that may be able to take over the property because it still is an investment into the property. So yes. that was the only thing I had, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Mayor White. Yes, um, these are prepayment plan options. So it's one or the other. We have to decide whether we want a lump sum payment or a monthly. Or, 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 you, or you could give the property owners the choice of which if they well, want to pay a lump sum or pay right. over time. Which means we, we can say we, we like both of them and that give them the option. We don't have to choose. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and the other question was regarding uh, the hardship. Is, is that been determined? What, what determines a, a hardship? Um, that could be up for discussion. I don't know if there are any legal requirements for that. Okay. But, that's what we would need to to define, right? What yes. constitutes a hardship? And did you mention something like a certain length of time that they can do that for only, and then they have to start making payments again, and then, um, or it, it just goes. What what did you yeah. say? You have to. Have um, a I get, we could we could make a a certain amount of time that they would be allowed to pause the payments for. All right, I'm thinking more about the undeveloped land that. Somebody owns a piece of property and just doesn't want to pay that. <laughs> now, what are we going? So, what, what's a hardship if you you're owning so land and it's not on the undeveloped land? It would be hard. I don't know how you would force them to pay it until they're ready to build a house. Then you could force the payment at that time. I'm not. I'm not sure legally how that works. Right, and then well, and if there's a transfer of ownership. How, how, how's that all going to work, too? Who's, in, who's going to ultimately end up paying that bill other than this, the city? I mean, that's what I'm concerned about. Well, it'll, there's a mandatory connection. So if they build a house there, whether they, the current owner builds a house or if, a, if they sell it, whoever builds a house will have to pay Okay, it. so that's only going to come into play when, once it's developed. But they have to pay for something when it goes across undeveloped land, correct, or no? I'm not sure legally if that, if that, if it can be forced to pay it at that time. Oh. I, we would have to look into that. Okay. All right, thanks. That's it. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, so 
I just want to be clear. This is if a property owner says, hey, I've got some extra money. I know city water and city sewer is going to be coming down in my area sometime in the near future. I want to lock in my payment. I want to lock in today's rates and make a prepayment. As opposed to the property owner who says, okay, I got notified that this is coming up. Um, I will make monthly payments on my bill. There, there, there's still that option available. Okay. <clears throat> Why would we offer a vacant property owner a prepayment when they don't know when they're going to start building? There may not be a development permit in process, and the cost of it is added to their construction cost and their mortgage payment. So I, I, I fail to understand why would we offer it to vacant property owners? Um, so, well, one of the things that we were thinking of is that if a property owner is wants to sell their property, once they know water and sewer is available, it'll make it easier for them to sell it. They may prepay it so that it's available for the new owner. That, why would I, if I was, why would I pay $28,000 prepaid on vacant property to sell the property to somebody else. It's, um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nancy Gallinero, utilities director. Uh, that's a great question, Commissioner. Uh, I think it's, it's more an opportunity to offer this to, uh, to somebody who has a piece of land who wants to add that to the, the value of their property when they sell it. So that's the option of saying, I have, that this is, this increases the value of the land. But I don't think that it's going to be the most popular of the selections. Yeah, if but I had $28,000 to invest in vacant property just to raise but it the value. Yeah, it, I know. It, well, if, if you get a vacant piece of land, then you know you're going to, yeah, which is about the general cost of septic and well is about $28,000. Yeah. So this just kind of, this gives the new buyer the opportunity to, to buy a piece of land that already has that secured, so. so like this never happens. We we have a project mm -hmm. and we intend to move forward and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have to either stall that project, the city stalls the project, abandons the project or whatever. And we have all of these people that have prepaid in some form or fashion, whether it's improved or not improved. What happens to that money then? Does it just sit in the utilities coffers? Well, it's capacity fees, so what they're paying for is the capacity that they now own of water for whatever they want to do with that, plus it also pays for the maintenance of the system that we have to take care of. Because there's run no lines. hookup. Hmm? There's no hookup is what I'm saying. The project stalled. The project stopped. Yeah. We're not doing but the, the project. But the lines are still there, right? The no, the line, there's nothing there nothing's at gone. all. We haven't it's done anything yet. Barren land. Uh, mm -hmm. If they buy capacity, they have capacity. Whether they can sell that back, I don't think that's a policy of the city. I think that they would own the capacity, they would sell it with the property. But what if it's an improved property? I mean, what, and I did a prepayment plan and the city says, you know what, we got to stop this. The economy tanked, we can't go forward with this project and now I've invested $5,600 and it, would there be a refundable mechanism? I would have to get back to you on that. I, I would say there's a lot of a lot of there's really, a lot of detail. Yeah, we yes. got to really, really look into this much further. And you know, the, the other thing is, is do we pay interest? The city is holding this money with the future project. Who knows? Could be five years, ten years. It could be twenty years. We don't know because neighborhood expansion. Right now, we're just doing one line. And what if somebody? wants to prepay it ahead of time and would they get interest on that? I don't know. These these are questions that I have that I hope would be included in a ordinance if an ordinance comes forward. Um, we can make sure that that's included, Commissioner. Would this be refundable? You know, let's say, let's say I want to sell my property mm -hmm. and I've already invested all of this money. I intended to stay here and for whatever reason, I have to sell my property. Yeah, it increases the value, 
Um, but is somebody going to pay me the full 28,000? I don't know. Or, right. or the full 5,600, maybe, maybe the economy's taking and the property values are taking and I have this money sitting there right. and it's like, I really could use that money. I want it back because I sell my property and I'm moving. It's a great question, Commissioner. We'll okay. make sure that we get <laughs> so, back to you. All right. Typically, if somebody buys capacity, we have reserved that capacity for them. So it would be transferable with the land and a sale would be my guess. But I will certainly make sure that we have exact numbers and, and recitals for you to okay. in an ordinance. Um, the other thing is, and I think uh, Vice Mayor mentioned it, you know, the sale of the property, yeah, it's, in, it's increasing the value. Right. But I, I, I'm seeing more trouble than it's worth for this prepayment plan. And I know the commission directed you to bring something back and some ideas, and I'm grateful for that. But looking at it a little bit more closely, it's like very labor intensive to keep track of each one of the properties. If they change property ownership, you know, who owns that capacity then? Um, I, I see a, a logistical financial finance department nightmare of trying to keep all that money straight because it's utilities money. It's not the accounting part of it, the monthly prepayments. Oh, they missed a payment there a month late. What, you know. Right. I think um, if, if I was to have a crystal ball, I think it was just, it, it's an effort to try to make this easier for our community, for our <laughs> citizens in this particular project of expansion. So, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, there's some details to work out, but we're happy to bring back what you brought to us and um, for the ordinance piece. Um, are you done, Commissioner? I, I am for now. I, I look forward to hearing what the others have to say about it. I love it. And let me tell you what I love about it. The incentive for people to pay today in today's dollars, whether it's lump sum or payment over time, uh, I think that's a great concept. Thinking back to my first year as a commissioner, there was huge negative community reaction to this program because of the cost. And I think operating or offering something like this really takes some of the wind out of those sales. I really like it. Some, some things I would caution or suggest is I would just add it to the water payment bill, not have it a separate transaction. And so that way it's automatically accounted for by account. We should think about, so as people prepay, do we use that money to help fund the early stages of neighborhood expansion? Makes me nervous. Or if someone's lump sum, I'm okay with. But if people are paying over time, I'm kind of thinking that ought to go into a fund. Uh, you know, something like that. I would be very uncomfortable expending all of this money to pay for the early stages of neighborhood expansion because you, we might get five or 10 years down the line and there's no money left. <laughs> to fund that, and then we're really in a pickle. So I think we need to really think through that. I think there should be a little bit more of a financial advantage for people who pay lump sum. So if people are going to pay over time, I think that option, once it's paid 100%, should be something larger than $5,600 because they've been given the grace of time to pay it. I don't know what that number is, but, but I think we should also think about that. I agree with, I think it was Commissioner McDowell who made the comment for vacant land, when someone buys or starts to build, then that's the cost of their water and sewer and they finance it as they would finance the rest of the business. So. So I think offering this option to vacant land kind of doesn't compute for me unless you guys see a value or an incentive. I don't see it at this point. So those are my comments. I do have a question. When you talk about locks in current rate of capacity, so 
I live alone, my city water, I'm on septic, but let's say I was on sewer, I have a certain capacity or rate of capacity. If all of a sudden six people move into that house, do the numbers change? I'm just trying to understand that. No, for a, for a for one house, it's one unit. Okay, okay. So it doesn't matter what the consumption of that no. house is. Okay, okay, good. Um, Vice Mayor White, you haven't spoken yet on this, yes, have I you? Have. Oh. Okay, d let me go to Commissioner McDowell. I, she I forgot to shut my light off. Oh, okay. Vice Mayor White. No. Uh, yeah, so this is for only those um, sites that are in the targeted area that we've identified so far. Is that correct? Correct. No, the whole no, city. It's, that's not in here. So <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think that one way to do this, and this may answer some of Commissioner McDowell's questions, is to do an agreement for this prepayment plan per neighborhood area at the time that we know that it's going to construction so that we know so you know there's always a possibility of something stalling but for 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 like we're starting the first we're in the design or starting the design phase of the first phase now right at the time that we have a time of construction we <laughs> at this point we think that the construction should be ready to start next spring or summer. So before that construction time, just those lots in that area where the pipes will be constructed soon would be part of this agreement for payment, not doing okay. the whole city where right. we have no idea when the pipes are going to be. All right, so this is just okay. for those tar the okay. targeted area that we have right now, which is one. Good question. One okay, and then this is for uh, prepayment options. So that, um, assuming that means there's another way people can pay if they don't want to prepay or no? Well, that would be the option number two where they pay over time. And the, the time is not outlined in this, in this presentation. I, I would think that maybe the city could give people an option of 10 or 20. The maximum amount allowable is 30 years. I but, but ultimately, they have to pay something. They're either going to have to pay it up front or when it's going by their house, they have to pay that or you can pay it over time. Yes. There's no, like, no option three. No. Obviously, so I'm not really even sure what we're, I guess we have just had to come back to us, but it's, we have to offer this because how else are people going to pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that's it. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. The city commission's already adopted a payment plan for city water, city sewer expansion. They can pay it over time on their water bill when construction happens. So it's like, okay, the lines are in, we're gonna do construction. Do you wanna pay, start paying it now? Or do you want to wait until construction is finished and then pay all this extra money? That's what we had <laughs> talked about. There were there's a couple of different options already on the books for paying mm -hmm. for this program. This is way ahead of construction to do prepayments. I don't want it to get confused with what we already have planned for citizens to be able to make payments interest free. I think we had it for 30 years, um, as long as they're doing it at the time of construction, so that way then the city is doing everything all at once. Or, hey, wait until you get the notice that you have a year to connect, and then you're going to pay even more money. That has already been in the books. This is a totally separate thing of, okay, I want to lock in my rate. I want to pay for it now. I've got extra money, and this is a pre make prepayment plan where they can just pay the lump sum or money over time, which I'm still kind of struggling with. Um, and uh, Mayor, when you said add it to your water bill, 
well, the existing homeowners don't have a water bill because they don't have city water. Well, they would add it to the water bill as they get it. But that's not a prepayment plan. Right? Right. I'm confused. <laughs> if, if I can ask a follow along question, is that okay, Commissioner McDowell? Sure. I didn't realize we had any payment. We discussed payment mm -hmm. options. I'm, uh, excuse me, if I What can. is on the books now? Because um, again, if we have payment options on the books, and this is a pre-payment plan, <coughs> but we restrict it to the areas that are currently under construction, I don't get it. Because what's the pre? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We you know, know, if I was service area, I think I'm here. service area, I don't know, 15. It'll be 50 years from now. But if I wanted to prepay, that would really be prepaying. Right. And it would be paid up by time of construction. And I think part of, confused. part of this whole prepayment plan was when the dollar amount was like thirty-seven or forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That's when we came up with this plan. But since that time of requesting a prepayment option, mm -hmm. we have adopted payments for the residents at the time of construction when the lines are being laid in front of their house. They can start making those payments then because it's it's a cheaper amount as opposed to waiting until everything's constructed up. and they get that notice, hey, you've got one year, now they're paying more. So I think we solved the problem of prepayment once we adopted that, I think it was a ordinance. Well, in my mind, that's not truly a prepayment. It's just offering a couple different ways to pay if, if after may, construction, please. Um, First of all, my apologies because we lost all of our staff that were here when all this happened during the course of the day. So <laughs> Sue and I, being relatively new, are going back in, in time uh, to try to answer your questions. So in December of 21, the motion was made by Commissioner McDowell, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Langdon, to direct staff to bring back options for a prepayment plan. So that's what we have attempted to do here. Mm -hmm. There are many questions, rightfully so. Okay that we need to go back and answer. Of course, if it, there's prepayment, how will that be paid if they aren't paying already, they're not already paying customers, mm -hmm. they want to mm -hmm. set up a prepayment plan, we would set it up through Paymentus in, in a way that they would pay until they were hooked up with water and then integrate that into their water plan would be my, I mean, into their water bill, as you've suggested. I think there's just a lot more detail. Mm -hmm. So in an attempt to come back with, to respond to, to this in, 19, in 2021, this is, these are some options that we're, we're putting out to the commission today to get your advice to, on what, how to proceed. Yeah, I mean, are, are you done, Commissioner? Well, the only other thing I was going to add is if we're going to only do it in the area of construction, then right now we have um, Salford North and it's a large area, mm -hmm. okay? But there's only construction is going to be a line. So are we going to offer the prepayment plan for that line or the whole area? It, the large area for prepayment, or is it just that line that we're going to be doing the construction on first? So the, this is, sounds like you guys got a little bit more homework based well, on I our questions. Jason Yarbrough, Assistant City Manager, I think we're looking for a little bit more direction from commission so that we can come back with a more holistic and well thought out approach. Are you wanting to go global or do you want to stay in specific areas? You want to time it, um, you know, so that, you know, uh, we will kind of know the progression and therefore we can go in advance of that progression and offer in advance. Um, uh, you know, say we know five years from now where we're probably going to be construction. We can go in advance of that area and offer them a prepayment plan. You know, but we kind of need a little bit We've been left to our own devices, and we've come back, and, 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 and there's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can either give us a little bit more direction, or we will wander back and come back again and, and do our best to try to anticipate what y'all are looking for. I mean, again, I think my feedback would be if we currently have two payment options, mm -hmm. then for phase one, they're covered. 
Those are their Absolutely. payment options. Absolutely. When we, I you, say you've prepayment. Capped, you've capped their, their, yeah. their cost, and yeah. we've also given them the ability to finance it. Yeah, and I was very supportive of a prepayment plan because someone who might be in service area three, mm -hmm. and we anticipate will be there in 10 years, mm -hmm. they might say, gee, by the time construction starts, mm -hmm. I almost have it paid. Um, and in other communities like ours, where there are large areas that still need water and sewer, if someone's looking to buy a home in that area and one house has paid it mm -hmm. or has even made a partial payment, mm -hmm. that's going to be a real driving factor, mm -hmm. uh, other things being equal, as, and the other house doesn't have any of that then people are going to buy the house where at least some of the cost has already been paid and it transfers with the property and the lien transfers, whatever. But I think if we truly have a prepayment plan, then I think we need to look out a little bit. Okay. Um, but I also Five think years, 10 years, 20 years? Maybe, maybe. The longer, the better. However, inflation and that kind of stuff, I'd... I'd be really afraid of offering 5,600 mm -hmm. to people who are under construction 10 years from now. Right. Yeah. There would need to be some kind of an adjustment. Mm -hmm. but, but it should be an incentive over just waiting and doing nothing okay. until construction hits your area, and then you either pay the lump sum, mm -hmm. bigger sum than these numbers, mm -hmm. or uh, you do a, pay, a, a payment plan, not a pre. Well, in the interest of, of, the, of the length of the day, um, why don't we hit a pause button on this, if it's okay with the mm -hmm. commission. You've given us a lot to think about, yep. uh, angles and avenues and, and questions. Mm -hmm. It would be great if you could help us by sending us any questions that you would like pre-answered that would kind of help us okay. uh, in, in advance, uh, maybe within the next two weeks. Um, that would be beneficial. And we will... Uh, Re recollect internally okay, and uh, and come back with some more stuff for discussion. Sounds good. <coughs> Sounds good. I see your light on, Commissioner McDowell. Do you have anything yeah, to add? The only thing I would like to add is when we have another future discussion, make sure you bring what's already been adopted because sure. we have a lot of new, new commissioners here. Absolutely. And this will and also give ones. staff... We'll give, it'll give staff a chance to yeah. really dive deep to see what's already been done. Great you suggestion. might get some mm -hmm. um, ideas on how to do this prepayment plan, Great too. Great suggestion. Thank you, ma'am. Yep. Sounds good. Especially if it's a couple you. more years. Yes. Right. It's going to be a few years. Cool. Well, actually, maybe a workshop would be a better avenue than a traditional commission mm -hmm. meeting yes. for this. Okay. That's yeah. okay. That would be yeah. good. You know, that, I, think good. I think this topic uh, mm -hmm. is a better, the workshop's a better venue. Good idea. Thank you. We like that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Glad you're thinking about this. It's great. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? We uh, I'm not sure we need a motion. I don't think we need anything. I think, I think they've pretty much... Yep. I would agree. Okay. Let's move on to B, which is 23-1520. Um this is discussion and possible action regarding the First Amendment. Boy, that sounds very... The First Amendment to the Constitution. Regarding the First Amendment to the City Manager's Employment Agreement. City Manager, this one's yours. Actually, Mayor, this one is mine, the City Attorney's. Oh, that's not what my note says. But go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, yes, pursuant to commission direction, the city attorney's office prepared a draft amendment to the city manager's contract and then worked with the city manager on the proposed language to bring back to the commission for consideration. This language was drafted pursuant to uh, the item where you all discussed the city manager's annual review and then some potential contract provisions. So it is being presented for your discussion, input, and possible approval. Thank you for that, ma'am. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Do you want to make any kind of statement, city manager? No, ma'am. No, You're set? Thank you. Okay. Questions? Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. I, I guess I need to understand why are we 
going to give a minimum 30 days um, if there's a written resignation. Um, yes, sometimes the, the, there's a resignation and I'll just pick the date of January 1st and we receive it today. The commission has the authority to either accept that January 1st or say, no, thank you very much. We're gonna accept your resignation as of today. But if this amendment goes through, then we have to allow a minimum of 30 days. I, I don't understand why. If you could explain, I would appreciate it. The point of the 30 days is to allow for a transition of the items and projects that are currently in place. What you do not want is for your leadership at the top to be gone for as long as little time as possible. So allowing for 30 days should allow for not only the offboarding of items to the other leadership, but making sure that you begin the process successfully for the successor. Okay, and I appreciate that, but I would think that you are regularly talking with your assistant city managers on a regular basis about ongoing projects and ongoing things um, on a regular, if not daily, maybe weekly basis. So I don't understand Back to not understanding the 30 days. I already answered that question, ma'am. But then what's the point of the assistant city managers if they aren't aware of the projects and offboarding? I mean, God forbid you get hit by a bus. There, there's that provision in place. That's why you have assistance. Ma'am, it's very typical for people of this position to let their supervisors know that they're going to leave their job and give them advance notice, whether it's a two-week notice in a lower job, whether it's 30 days in this job, it helps the organization transition. Um, the other thing is, is that I saw where There's a term that expires the of September 30th of 2024. Is no, the first term in the first contract it, it expired October 1st of 25. But now this amendment is going to have the term of the um, contract expire of September 30th of 24. Why did we lose a year? So the, the discussion was to make this a one-year agreement. So what we did was to say that it had expired, this would be retroactive, on October 1st, 2023, and it's renewed for one year, which would be October 1st, 2024. And at that point, the agreement automatically renews annually every October 1st, unless it's terminated. So it goes from a four-year agreement to a one-year automatically renewing term to a one-year term that automatically renews for subsequent one-year terms. Thank you. You are set, Commissioner? I am. Uh, Vice Mayor White. Yes, um, I, I get the 30 days. It's, it works both ways, just to um, offer security to the city and also to the city manager that there's 30 days uh, period to get things in order and for, for both to... I guess, for want of a better term, to move on if that if that's what it came down to. So I I, I understand the thirty day clause. I also get the thirty day clause. Um, people in leadership positions also drive their own initiatives. They're involved in boards or other kinds of responsibilities, and it can take some time to think through who you might transition those things to, may or may not be an assistant city manager. It might be a conversation to give one of those projects to another employee as part of their development plan. So um, to me, the 30 days makes a lot of sense, um, and it makes me a little more comfortable with um, thoughtful transitions. I'm not seeing any other lights on, City Clerk. Do we have any public comment for this item? Yeah. And I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay, Commissioner Stokes. 
I move to approve the amendments to the city manager's contract relating to term and notice requirements for termination and resignation. Do I have a second? We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stoke, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich to approve the amendments to the city manager's contract relating to term and notice requirements for termination and resignation. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote. And that motion passes four to one with Commissioner McDowell um, dissenting. Commissioner, do you I care dissented to comment? because I firmly believe that the city manager is keeping his assistant city managers and directors informed of things that are happening in the city on a regular basis. And they would be quite capable if there was a need to arise without that 30 days notice. Thank you. Let's move on to item 23 162. To seven. Um, City Clerk, would you introduce this item, please? Yes, this item was requested by Commissioner Stokes pursuant to our policy number, City Commission policy number 202103 for reconsideration of an item. Commission um, discussed during the regular meeting on October 24th, 2023, the topic of a temporary moratorium on affordable housing under the Live Local Act, and Commissioner Stokes would like to have that item reconsidered. Thank you for that, City Clerk. Commissioner Stokes, do you want to speak? I do. I believe this process is a two-motion two process, so before we can really discuss it, it's first to move to reconsider this item and, uh, you know, for discussion. So, with that, I mean, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider item 23-1548 regarding the discussion of possible action regarding a temporary moratorium on affordable housing under the Live Local Act discussed during the City Commission regular meeting held on October 24th, 2023. Do I hear a second? I'll second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes, seconded by Vice Mayor White to reconsider item number 23-1548 regarding the discussion and possible action uh, regarding a temporary moratorium on affordable housing under the Live Local Act discussed during the City Commission regular meeting held on October 24th, 2023. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Commissioner Stokes, do you want to share why you wanted to bring this back for reconsideration? I do. Um, you know, while I believe there was a righteousness to wanting to address the Live Local Act and its implications for our city, um, had I known then what I know now with regard to input that we receive from city staff and others regarding market conditions. Um, I may not have made the motion that I made back then. Um, you know, first and foremost, the, the ULDC, the proposed ULDC rewrite will have what I consider to be sticks and carrot features that would help really manage affordable housing under the Live Local Act. This was something that really I personally had no input on or no, no information on until uh, city staff came back within a couple of days after the 23rd. Um, secondly, I learned a little more about the market conditions out there for mixed use housing and affordable housing. And quite frankly, with interest rates, what they are, the market's very soft, which leads me to believe we're not looking at a major crisis uh, in front of us. There's been a number of interested parties, none of which have apparently gotten to the point of, of firm applications. Um, thirdly, and probably most importantly is until I think we understood, at least until I understood, the process that would be involved in instituting a moratorium. 
a, a resolution which required some due diligence, a whole lot of due diligence that would be required to put an ordinance in place. There is no way that one, we could farm this out nor find a way to do this without having significant impact on the timetable for our ULDC rewrite and the projects that would be affected by this rewrite. And frankly, we all sat here and agreed that was the most important thing before us, that nothing should stand in the way of getting this rewrite done and moving forward. So you take those three and then you add the fact that sometimes when, when, when an issue's got some righteousness to it and you react with emotion more than your head, I think sometimes you don't realize that there may be a smarter way to approach this. Live Local Act does some wonderful things, okay? It, it was clearly an attempt to help create affordable housing, which is needed all over this country, let alone here in the state of Florida. That said, one size doesn't always fit all. And as a result, there is opinion out there that this act should require some level of modification, amendment, whatever. But there are smarter ways to do it, perhaps, than you know, standing up and, and issuing a moratorium that buys a period of time to do what? Really just determine whether or not our comprehensive plan in ULDC could help control or better manage this, which I think we're seeing it will anyway. So I guess in combination with our Florida League of Cities partners and other municipalities around the state, I think that over time, there's a better and smarter way to approach trying to tweak this and work with our state representatives to make this a better act. And so for a combination of all those reasons, I. I I really do feel that it makes sense to rescind this motion. Um, I don't see it as necessary, and I truly had wished that instead of rushing it to, a, to, to an agenda item, um, I had taken the time to request that staff provide some input and we get some more information for which the commission to, to review before we jumped on this. So I guess in summation, there's like wrong decisions, there's right decisions, and there was some righteousness to this, and then there's smart decisions, and the smart decision would be to rescind <coughs> this. So, you know, in my personal opinion, when you go in a direction that you find out you don't think it's the best direction, you stop, you change directions, <coughs> and you fix it. And that's why uh, I asked that this item come back for reconsideration. Thank you, Commissioner Stokes. Commissioner McDowell? Yep. It's amazing what a difference a day makes. Yep. Because I was still very adamant about um, doing the moratorium. It would have given staff time, despite whatever happened with Doral, that was like a non-issue. Um, their, their moratorium was still in effect until yesterday when the governor signed House Bill 1C. House Bill 1C was passed unanimous, unanimously both in the House and the Senate last week. And it was approved and signed by the governor yesterday. So for those of you that are not familiar with House Bill 1C, I'm going to read some of what House Bill 1C is because it makes me take great pause on our entire ULDC rewrite. I had spoke with the city attorney last month about Senate Bill 250 and how it would affect our ULDC rewrite, but Senate Bill 250 expired October of 24. So now with this House Bill 1C, I have even greater reservations and I really hope it's going to spark a conversation not only with city attorney and city manager, but with our lobbyist because this has already been signed. It was signed yesterday by the governor. Section 14 of House Bill 1C, and I'm going to skip in unnecessary parts. Um, Section 14, due to the impacts of Hurricane Ian, 10 counties, and they listed them all, including Sarasota County, um, and any municipality located in one of those counties may not propose or adopt any moratoriums on construction, reconstruction, redevelopment, of any property damaged by Hurricane Ian. 
proposed or adopt more restrictive or burdensome amendments to its comp plan or land development regulations. This takes effect as of, I think it was September 28th of 2022 when Hurricane Ian hit, but it now expires October 1st of 2026. So Doral's moratorium from the way I'm interpreting this is already um, voided by state statute and you'd have to read the rest of it. Um, would I'm concerned about the ULDC now moving forward and um, because it is going to have some more restrictive and burdensome amendments to our comp plan and our land development code. So um, I appreciate you bringing it forward, but yesterday morning, I was all for still doing the uh, moratorium because the governor hadn't signed it yet. It had passed both the House and Senate, but once the governor signed it yesterday, it made it a moot point. So thanks for the conversation. Look forward to a bigger one regarding this ULDC and how uh, House Bill 1C is going to affect us. Vice Mayor White. Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner Stokes, for bringing this back. I think you're the one that did anyway. Um, I was not in favor of the moratorium. I'm all um, for going full ahead with our ULDC. We're making the changes that we need to make, and um, that's where our energy should be um, directed to. And um, Your mic, I don't think, is working. Yeah, I don't think Because so. you're fading. <laughs> Um, we're all. Mean, we're yeah, all I'm, I'm actually fading. Yeah, okay, so I, I guess I do have to eat the mic. I'm sorry. Um, but I want to thank Commissioner Stokes and also that uh, I didn't vote for the moratorium because I just felt that our, that our staff was doing a great job in uh, amending and, and coming up with ideas for the ULDC to pretty much accomplish the same thing that we would have in place. So um, I'm just curious how this is going to play out with the second motion that I see is on here. Oh. I'll come to you because I haven't spoken yet. So. Um, I, I was hugely supportive of the moratorium and I'm okay that we did it. It was a strong signal to the market and to ourselves and to the general community that we are serious about expanding and protecting our commercial land uses. But since then, um, after conversations with staff, I have a better appreciation for the amount of time that it really would have taken to develop um, a reasonable ordinance uh, around this and that it definitely would have distracted staff from the completion of the ULDC that I think we have all agreed is a top priority at different points in time. Um, and there are also projects waiting in the wings for that new ULDC rewrite to be approved so that they can proceed. Additionally, I'm confident that staff has um, embedded some safeguards into the ULDC rewrite that would make it less attractive for affordable housing developers to preempt our commercial land and make it more attractive for them to build those kinds of uh, structures where we more want them. Commissioner Stokes. Yeah, and, and to follow along with that, I, I take comfort that staff is going to be with this new law that was just passed and signed by the governor, uh, that staff, and, and their rewrite team and their outside consultants and helpers and lawyers and everybody else is going to take a hard look at how this new bill is going to impact that rewrite and to make sure that areas, as, as Commissioner McDowell mentioned, with regarding restrictions and burdensome uh, issues are addressed in a way that, that still, still keep the teeth in what we're trying to do here, but at the same time, don't run con in conflict with this new law. So, I mean, that's why we have our subject matter experts. We should learn from the mistake I made with the moratorium by 
giving staff the opportunity to do their due diligence and come back. And I'm sure, you know, commission will learn much about how this new bill is going to impact our rewrite. And um, I'm sure it's already on their radar. So thank you for that. Um, the only other thing I guess, and if, if Mayor, if we're ready, would be to make another motion. Well, I think Commissioner McDowell has her light oh, on. I'm to sorry. Make I'm a sorry. Final okay. Comment. That's okay. Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't um, begrudge anybody for wanting to put a moratorium in place. I, I think it was the right thing to do at the time, um, and, and I think our intentions were pure in that because we we really wanted to preserve our home rule and give staff the opportunity to work on what they needed to work on. Um, the bigger question is, is in my mind is when are the cities gonna start banding together to reclaim our home rule authority? You know, more and more this the state is taking it away. And more and more we may as well just take the ULDC and just throw it right in the trash because the state laws are, are trumping us every chance they get. And, and that concerns me deeply. So um, I look forward to your motion, Commissioner Stokes. I have a feeling it's going to be to rescind the moratorium direction we gave and uh, how bad? Let's let them do it. <laughs> One quick comment I'd like to make before I make the motion is, you know, and, and I should have said it earlier is, you know, while, while the idea of home rule is such a valuable and important thing to pony off of what Commissioner McDowell said, you know, to us at the municipal level, it is so, so important. And, and we've seen this trend over the past 50 years moving the other direction. The concept of pre state preemption it is is has some virtue in it in the fact that there are certain things that, from a state perspective, you know they can see that that would help smooth things out and standardize certain issues and areas. Unfortunately, you can always go too far or too little, and yet the reality exists that our partnerships with our county and our state are so important and we get funding, we get support at all levels and it takes a village, it takes a county, it takes a state to make things happen. And you can't cut off your nose to spite your face, yet you can't allow yourself to be blackmailed by the thought of, of you know, or held hostage to the fact that you can't stand up for, for what you really believe in because you're worried about the repercussions. But there are smart ways to do things. And bills that come forth at, at, at levels of government are not necessarily perfect. And with proper advocating, the Florida League of Cities, groups of municipalities getting together, Everybody tries to make things better than they are. And I'd like to believe that even at the state level, that's the case as well. So sometimes, you know, if you if you choose to step out and be defiant, there are unintended consequences of those actions. And it's for that reason, I think that there's smarter ways to do things. And, and I really believe when you read headlines like Tampa Live Local Act Not Working and, and you see what happens in Doral and other areas around the state, there's a general understanding that, that this bill needs some tweaking. And while it may not be on everybody's radar yet, hopefully it can be. So with all that said, I would like to make a motion. Yeah, I do see Commissioner McDowell's no, I, light it was, on. It's for some reason not going off. Okay, because I was going to put out a caution, but I don't need to. So I go ahead, move to Stokes. rescind the city commission direction given on October 24th, 2023, relating to directing the city manager to move forward with putting a process in place for a moratorium on affordable housing under the Live Local Act. So I hear a second. Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich to rescind the city commission direction given on October 24th, 2023, relating to directing the city manager to move forward, putting a process in place for a moratorium on affordable housing under the Live Local Act. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote, please.
And that motion passes five to zero. Moving on, the highlight of the day, item 23-1533, the election of a mayor and a vice mayor. So I am calling for nominations for, we'll start with mayor. I don't have to pass gavels. Yes, you absolutely do it's have to pass motion. that gavel. <laughs> Can I have uh, some direction on a nomination? Must I pass the gavel? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you do. I will do it. I'm passing the gavel to Vice Mayor. I would like to nominate Vice Mayor Alice White to serve as our mayor for the upcoming year. Does it, does it require a second? I don't think so. It's no, it doesn't. It's not a motion. Yeah, now, who does it? I don't have my gavel. <laughs> so. okay. Okay. Are there any other nominations? So, well, it says here we received the motion, but we're not doing that. Yeah, clarification, city clerk. With no additional nominations, Vice Mayor will close the nominations and request a motion. To accept. Okay. Okay. So I'll close uh, the nominations and uh, ask. Do we vote on this? Is that what you're saying? Ask for a motion. Okay. Ed, I'll ask for a motion. I'll make a motion. I uh, make a motion that we elect Vice Mayor Alice White to be our mayor for the upcoming year. Second. Wait, okay. Uh, Wait. City Clerk, do you want? Point of clarity, the motion was to elect her to be the mayor. We do not elect That's a mayor. We appoint. appoint. Oh. You, I'm sure you've updated that already, City Clerk. Okay. Okay. We have a second? Yes. yes. That, okay, great. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm having a hard You're time giving up my gavel. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing more to that, let's vote. And I do vote, correct? Yes, you do vote. Better vote for yourself. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that passes five to zero. And the gavel is yours, ma'am, for the rest of the meeting. Oh, okay. All right, next, let's move on to for nominations for vice mayor. I'll make a nomination if I can. Go ahead. The nomination to nominate um, Commissioner Stokes to be Vice Mayor. Second. Oh. There's no second for the nomination. No second for that. I know it slipped out. All right. Any discussion about that? Any other nominations? No. Okay. So I will. Yeah, request a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. I'll make a motion to um, appoint uh, Commissioner Phil Stokes as our Vice Mayor. Second. All right, so we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell. I need, I need my screen clear. cleared. I think we all do. Yeah, we need a clear. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we had a motion for Commissioner Stokes as Vice Mayor, and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. So if there's no further discussion, let's vote. vote. We should have checked for public comment. Oh, yes. And uh, I don't have it on my script. Yeah. We do have public comment, but it was we're going to do it now since okay. they wanted to wait until. All right, that passes. Yeah, I know, and that that passes five to zero. <laughs> First. And now is there public comment? Yeah. Bill Luke. Oh God, in heaven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I want to give thanks, and I'm going to start with Miss former Mayor Langdon. Two notes. 
you made a statement in a mutual meeting that we were recently in and you had stated when you first came into office or as a candidate you thought you were going to be able to come in and do and work and change and when once you got in office you found out it's not a single individual it's five that work as one commission i want to thank you for learning that accepting that and complying to that you have fulfilled the role as commissioner and as mayor so eloquently There's a person who's not with us, that's looking down from heaven, smiling with so much pride in what you have done and accomplished this year. Honor to Pop to Tom. Madam Mayor, <laughs> <laughs> Mayor White, I'm thankful that it's you. I'm looking so forward to a positive year this year, and you're going to be able to fill the shoes that are needed because you have been an ambassador for this city all along since you came here. You've done things before ever getting into the seat as a commissioner. So I look forward to the history that you have through the city. Look forward to what you have done for the city. Look forward. I've seen the growth in you while you've sat there. I've seen your ability as a teacher and being able to learn and to study, to grow. So I'm really looking forward to a tremendous year. Vice Mayor Stokes, how about <laughs> that one? <laughs> it just sounds too weird. Learn all that you can. I know you'll do well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Could Thank you, you Jill. Thank you for those comments. And yes, I do have some big shoes to fill. <laughs> yes. But uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Langdon, I have to get used to saying that now. Um, you were a great teacher, mm -hmm. so I took lots and lots of notes. All right, um, are we done with that? Yes. All right. So now we're on to discussion uh, F sixteen twenty eight. Do I have that right, City Clerk? Discussion and possible actions regarding the City Commission Board and Committee assignments for the fiscal year twenty twenty three to twenty four. City Clerk. Yes, each year commission reviews their current um, board and committee assignments and determines if they wanted to make any changes to those. I, they were attached, the current ones were attached to the backup for the agenda item. All right. Any commissioner questions on that? All right. Commissioner Langdon. I have to get used to that. I know. I keep wanting to run the show. Um, oh, and I forgot to ask you this. Does this do I have to manually take you off the screen? No, no. City clerk will take care of that. Um, I've reviewed that list. I, I really enjoy and feel I add value to the assignments I currently have. And so I would very much like to keep them and stay as second to folks who have other assignments. I'm done. All right, thank you. Commissioner Stoke, uh, Vice Mayor Stoke. Oh, thank you. It's gonna take, I have to get a little bit of adjustment. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, you know, reviewing this, I think everybody gets comfortable with their committee assignments and it's nice because you build your relationships and you're able to work forward. I would just ask Mayor if there are any committees that she might feel she might want to give up only because she's picking up an additional couple as mayor and um you know just so as not to be overburdened if i mean i think the rest of us probably are in pretty good shape but um 
Yeah, I, I love being on the coastal and heartland uh, part that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and also there's one other, well, the, that's the far away city. Uh, King Court Ford, possibly, if anyone that happens to be, they had their board meeting, I think it was today, anyway, couldn't make it. Um, but that would be the only one that if somebody else would like to take that, otherwise I'll continue to patrol that. Mayor? Also, just to let you know, you will be taking over the Council of Governments and the National League of Cities voting delegate, yeah. but that is a mayor and vice mayor position. Okay. Yeah. Mayor, if I may. Yes. Oh, I see other people want to speak, but I would be, since I'm your second on teen court, I would be oh. willing to take that over if you want to give it up. Okay, sure. Sure. So do we have to vote on that or is that just going to be noted? You can, do, you can do either do a consensus. Okay. To change that, and we'll also need to change the backup unless you're going to be the backup as well. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll have a consensus for um, Commissioner Langdon to take over the team court board position, and I will be the, the alternate. Okay. All right. Do we have a consensus on that? Commissioner Roll McDowell? Up. Yes. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. Sure, yes. Okay, and I'm a yes as well. Thanks for bringing that up. I forgot all about those other duties. That's all. Conveniently, no. Okay. All right, Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, and I have stated, I can't remember who I was talking to, but I made a mistake apparently last year when we brought up these assignments. I had thought that I put up the chat assignment for somebody else to take over, and I thought somebody did. But apparently, I was the key person on it, and I know, and I know that Commissioner Luke, or former Commissioner Luke, used to attend them as well. And I'm just not a health savvy type individual, so it, I don't think there's anything that I can give to them on the board or interact with that. So I wanted to try and put that up there. Maybe Mr. Health and Welfare with his smoking ordinance over there might want to, <laughs> might want to take another one. And which which one is that? Chat. Community Health Action Team. Sure. All right. <laughs> All right. So Way to we... get me back. All right. So we'll have a consensus for that for Vice Mayor um, Stokes to take over the chat. And I'll do alternate if you need to. I mean, that's not a problem, but that's good. And that is the Community Health Action Team. Is what that is. Work with the police. I like that. Stands for Commissioner McDowell. You okay with that? What is the full consensus, Mayor? For uh, Vice Mayor Stokes to um, be the representative for the CHAT, Community Health Action Team, and instead of Commissioner Emmer. Okay, but what about the alternate? Are we going to take a consensus and combine it? You were the alternate, I believe. I was, but you volunteered. I'll do it. That's no problem. <laughs> well, that I'll, I'll still make them. Okay, Commissioner Emmerich would be the alternate. He's agreed to do that. So that so the consensus is for Vice Mayor Stokes to be the, the main person, Commissioner Serving, and for Commissioner um, Emmerich to be the alternate. Yes. I'm a yes. 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 Thank you, yes. Okay. Other than that, I'm good on my committees. All right. Are there any other ones we need to look at? Do we have any public comment? Excuse me, my light's on. Uh, no. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to stay on the committees that I have. I've been on them for a long time. I've got one year left, and I'd like to stay on them. Um, the only other thing I'd like to bring up is obviously Mayor Langdon. Former Mayor Langdon is not going to the National League of Cities that starts tomorrow. I am going to be going, and I would like permission if I could be the voting delegate while I'm there for this um, National League of Cities meeting. Okay, so we But can it's only for this one. It's only for this one. I leave tomorrow. All right, so we can do a consensus for that as well. 
So a consensus for Commissioner McDowell to be the voting delegate for the FLC. No. Nope. I'm sorry. National League. What is that? National League. Oh, the National League of Cities voting delegate. For 2023. For 2023. A consensus for that, Mr. McDowell? Yes. Tell me yes. Yes. Tell me yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now I can do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. My screen is blank. So, uh, any public comment? Yes, All right. So, are we done? I said a motion, but we're done. Can I make a motion? Go ahead. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the committee assignments um, as stated through consensus um, at today's meeting. Second. All right. We have a motion on the floor to adopt the committee assignments as stated. That was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Langdon. Any other discussion? All right. Let's, let's vote. And that passes five to zero. All right, moving on to number seven, which is recognition 231656 to recognize Commissioner Langdon for her service as mayor from November 2022 through November 2023. All right, let's all step down from the dais. It doesn't come off, so she can't. That's right, just for old time's sake. Uh, here is a, this is a really beautiful plaque here. Presented to Barbara Langdon in recognition of your exceptional leadership and dedicated service as mayor, city of Northport, 2022 to 2023. Yes. Well, wow, it has really been an honor to be your mayor for the year, and I really appreciate everyone's patience as I sometimes stumbled and bumbled through the agenda, um, and my sometimes overzealous way of enforcing decorum, <laughs> both on the dais um, and in chambers. So thank you to everyone for your support, for cutting me a little slack as I kind of figured out what the role was and what kind of mayor I was going to be. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. <laughs> right, would, anybody, would anybody like to say anything? Say anything else? Yeah. Like <laughs> I would just like to say Commissioner Langdon, that after this past year, I can assure you that the current mayor and the vice mayor will never forget to ask if there's public comments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the heavy lifting because it is a lot of work and you were, you were truly a great mayor for us, so we appreciate it. Good job, ma'am. You served the city well. Welcome back to commissioner status. I know, I know. You betcha. Yes. Yes. You, you did a great job. So thank you very much for your service. Yes, as I said before, I have some big shoes to fill, but you were a great, great teacher, and I have learned from you. 
yes, what to do and what not to do, but believe me, I'm gonna have my whole list, my own list of what not to do, I'm sure. We That's all, we all do, yeah. Do. <laughs> all right, but thank you so much for a great year. on the new mare since she got a raise. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you forgot to type I have to that. move my seat, right? <laughs> now? Yeah, you can play it. musical chairs if you want. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's remove my cushion. What is that? It's my chair. We do that now. No, we do with me. Okay. okay. No, I'm taking my chair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right? No, no, no. I just got like I wore grooves in it. Right. <laughs> yes, City Clerk. Is there any no. other public comment? No, there is none. Okay, then we have uh, Commissioner Communications. I will start with Commissioner McDowell. Uh, just a few. I know it's a late hour. Um, Halloween trick or treat event. Always, always a wonderful time. Oh my gosh, staff did a great job. Not only putting the event together, but each department and their little booths that they did. Oh my gosh, it, it was really magical. And the, the, the kids of all ages enjoyed the event. Um, for, for I think it was the first year people actually knew what my character was. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. Um, attended the Peace River Barbecue. Always a really fun event um, and took the tour. And I, I, I enjoy that tour, even though I've done it every single year I've gone to the barbecue. Um, I still learn a little bit more each time. The Veterans Employee Recognition, um, shout out to HR and, and our Honor Guard and everybody who participated in that event. Um, it really touches my heart. And that missing man's table, ooh, gets me every single time. So thank you for doing that. Um, I also went to the Minnesota League of Cities meeting um, last week where they had a huge presentation on the commission's requirement now to file the Form 6. Um, they had a presenter from the Florida Commission on Ethics who answered a lot of the questions, gave a great presentation. I believe the city clerk or maybe it was the city attorneys already forwarded that PowerPoint presentation to each of you. Um, I really strongly suggest you start kind of getting an understanding of it because it's it's a big one and you have to do it online and there's a lot more requirements and the Commission on Ethics will definitely be there to help you um, to fill in the blanks or answer any of your questions. One thing that we talked about during that meeting and it was uh, really hit home. Um, with all the bills that pass, not get filed, but all the bills that pass at the state level. In the past, I think it's two years, maybe three, I don't remember how long, 81 bills that were passed affect us and our home rule authority. That is huge. And some of it is very minor, very minuscule, kind of more like, um, day-to-day -day operational kind of stuff, but some of them were huge from impact fees to the Live Local Act, um, just really big, heavy hits on cities. 81 in that short amount of time, Ooh. and there's more to come this year. And the, the bills are already starting to be filed and Florida League of Cities is already really looking at it and going, oh my gosh, more? So um, I just wanted to put that out there and you know keep it in mind because this is our authority to run our city. It's not something the state gave us. It's something the citizens gave us. So that's a huge distinction. So thank you. That's all I've got. All right, Vice Mayor Stove, anything? Uh, yeah, attended a Newcomer's Day with, uh, with Commissioner Langdon. We had 
there was really a lot of action. I have to say it was busier than the previous quarter. A lot of new people, a lot of people coming through. So um, Newcomer's Day really is a great way to introduce people and be out there. Uh, attended the Peace River Barbecue along with my fellow commissioners. That was the first time I'd been out there. Really was a great day, a chance really to like, you know, network a little with, with you know, the, the, the municipal and county officials and, and to get a real feel for what goes on out there. Uh, also, the Veterans Day service we attended um, is always a special day. And um, I also attended the Do the Right Thing uh, recognition uh, here in City Chambers. Uh, and um, that's always a special thing. It's great to see our youth helping each other and looking out for each other. Um, and that is it. I'll keep mine brief since I have many of the same events. Peace for a barbecue was my first. I won't miss them in the future. The food was really great. Learned a lot also. Um, I worked with uh, Vice Mayor Stokes for Newcomers Day and um, Commissioner McDowell, if you ever want to give up the setup and the do up for that event, I would happily take that over. It's really oh, well I'm worth eager it. Eager to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely am going to need assistance. We'll so, all work it together. Know, we'll work it all together. That's what it's intended well, to be. Well, the bucket's in my car, so you might want to follow me back and grab it. I still have it, Becky. Um, I was honored to attend three veterans event the one here in the city where we recognized employees, veteran employees, touching really a wonderful event. Kudos to staff. Um, I also attended the community event and read the proclamation, one of the duties that our new vice mayor will take over um, at Veterans Park. And I also had the honor to attend a veteran celebration at Heron Creek is it middle school or grade school? Middle school. Boy, what they did such, such a good event. And I also did uh, attend the Do the Right Thing. It's one of my very favorite um, events. And I'll be very glad when price is widened because I was five minutes late because I was 20 minutes on price to get here. 15 minutes late. No, I was <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me, Mayor. All right. I was, uh, yes, Veterans Day uh, here at the city and also at um, Veterans Park, still Veterans Park by the library. And that was, it was neat because it was on 11 11 at 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, uh, it was really nice to be there. And maybe in a couple of years, we can be at our new Circle of Honor. Yeah. I think that's what nice. the goal is. Uh, I was, was at the Sarasota year. County yeah. Legislative Delegation. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. That was really interesting. It was neat to hear from the other municipalities what their what they said in three minutes and what their concerns were and what they were looking for. That's when when you ask for appropriations or and and of course ours was about our water structures um, and how we could really use some help in getting those replaced. So that was our focus for that one. Um, other than that, I think uh, I'm good. Commissioner Emmerich. Good. He's good. Okay. All right. City manager, anything to report? Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to thank the former mayor uh, for her year of service in the chair. Uh, it was greatly appreciated. Uh, thank her for all the easy conversations that we wanted to have and then the hard ones that we didn't want to have but had anyway. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for everything. I know we all keep getting some things done. Um, Vice Mayor, congratulations. Um, looking forward to working with you in your new role. It'll be, it'll be good, I'm sure. Um, Madam Mayor. Um, I ha and I have to say, <laughs> I have to say, City Manager, that he has gotten me prepped for this, because every time we would have our one-on-one, -on -one, that's what he would say, Madam Mayor. Mayor. And, and I would just let it go over my head. And he'd say, did you hear what I said? I said, yes, I did, and I'm just ignoring you. <laughs> so if you mess up, we blame him. Right. There you go. And get used to ignoring me. It's going to happen some more. But um, 
you know, it's going to be fun. I can promise you we'll laugh a lot, but we might cry a little. But we will en we'll enjoy the journey for sure. But oh, yeah. congratulations. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor White. I have no report, but I do want to say thank you to Mayor Langdon for a wonderful year. You know, our mayor is a ceremonial position, but that doesn't mean it is without any kind of work. Uh, it's a lot of work to chair these meetings and keep them organized while still participating in them. And then to represent the city, you know, out, out of the public and out and about in the city's interest. So thank you for your work in doing that. And Mayor White, look very forward to this year under your mayorship. And also look forward to working with new Vice Mayor Stokes and his new role. Congratulations to you all. Thank you. City Clerk. Same as everybody else. Congratulations. And said. thank you so much, Mayor Langdon. And I look forward to working with you, Mayor White, and having a good time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's it, right? So I will, yep, adjourn the meeting. 545. Oh, sorry. Thank you. 5.45. This meeting is adjourned.